desire by doing IVF. They are not deceased. They are pretty healthy people. So we need to also discuss what are the other options of treatment if they don't desire to go for IVF. We should not be very pushy about the concept of IVF to them. But they should have the other options. And it is a shared decision making between the couple and you that you come to arrive at a conclusion whether you take a non-IVF treatment and then take IVF. And many times I'm surprised that even when the semen analysis in the counts are low, like seven and eight million, when I discuss about these various options, though they have a less pregnancy rate, and then they say, well, doctor, we don't mind, go ahead, let's do two attempts. And then if, if we fail, we'll go ahead with the IVF. The problem starts now. Problem starts about how personalized and how beautiful is your care for those two cycles. That is going to tell the client that in spite of this failure, he's going to come back to you. And if your care suffers, or your personalization of the care suffers from those two months, believe me, this client is going to leave you and go to some other center. So it put those, the couple's, this, these decision making of non-selecting an IVF protocol makes you perform better for, and keep performing you better when it comes to a doctor-patient relationship. Uh, then obviously you will do a complete procedural counseling, how the procedure of IVF is going to be from start to end, whether you're going to go for pre-solve, fresh transfers, pros and cons, and et cetera. And you would explain the whole timeline. The couple is a working couple. They need to know when they have to take leaves. Uh, because all over India, they are under the impression they need to take bed rest. In Chennai, I've seen with Dr. Suresh's clinic, patients for NT scan also come on stretcher. So, so the, the bed rest is somewhere Im impregnated and the, a working lady feels, I'm not going to take so much of bed rest in my life. So you need to be very clear about that. So a correct timeline has to be put forth to them. So they, they are very well aware and they're informed about the whole timeline. And why a particular chosen protocol? Uh, can I have the lights on, please, behind? Let's, let's have the lights on. Excuse me. Let's have the lights on. Yeah. And why a chosen protocol and why not other? Because they're going to do some internet searches and they're going to ask you. And they're going to phone up friends and they'll say, I went with this drug, I went with that drug. You know, doctor at midway went my these changes. So you have you better calculate and put it forth very properly. You must con confess the realistic success rate. You can't be generalistic. My success rate is 40%. No, the lady or the couple in front of you is 37 year old. You better tell them your success rate with your own eggs is going to be 10 to 15%. That transparency is very, very important because you will make them spend two lakh of rupees. And at the end of failure, you tell, well, the success or she finds out from Google that the success rate is 15% at my age and my AMH. And then you opt for an egg donation program and they make a fool out of you. They will say, why you didn't opt, opt for this before? Why you made me spend two lakh of rupees? So it's better you discuss. In my clinic, I put the options one after the other, one, two, three, four, the cost, one, two, three, four, the success, one, two, three, four, and the troubles you will go through. Like with egg donation, you don't have to take injections with those, you, and then we go through. But at the end of the day, they're going to ask you, what's your call, doctor? So my call is always either the cheapest call for one or two attempts. Let's say she wants to go for egg donation. The AMH is pretty, pretty low. And she says, can I do two months of uh, natural cycle or two months of simple stimulation? We all learned that even if the AMH is low, the spontaneous pregnancy rate is there. It's not nil, it's not zero. So you can put them up, but take that period to your advantage. Go what, whatever adjuvants you want to give, whatever lifestyle measures you want to put in, whatever yoga and th therapies you want to go in, take, make it used to maximum that when they go for actual therapy, it benefits you. Uh, most important is explain all the reasons of failure in this particular couple. What are the reasons in failure in general and explain to the couples and add-ons, what add-on treatments you think of. Most important, the reasons of explain the reasons of failure in the given couple. Always must perform a mock embryo transfer and impress upon the patient the importance of ease of transfer. And that this is like a prelim exam before you take any final exam. So it is better to make them go through it. And then at the end of mock embryo transfer, do tell her, Ki, ma'am, you really cooperated very well. And next time also, when I'm going to do an embryo transfer, please cooperate like this and it will be fantastic. And you have spent all that money. The embryos are in my hand. If anything goes wrong, that can spoil our results. So, Madam, be, please be very cooperative to our procedure. This is the way we're going to do it. And that will make her strong and that will keep her morale boosted to act very well at the time of the true embryo transfer. You must explain them the cost, the timeline, and the hidden cost, like hormonal tests and other add-ons which you are attempting. And what is a post-ET prescription? I've seen post-ET prescription going to 20,000 rupees with every immunomodulator being added to that. Only husband doesn't get any treatment. 
Okay, and that is sheer stupidity. Uh, we will discuss this again in the luteal support. And do either you yourself or somebody in your clinic must ask them, how are you arranging money? I've had the best of the IT couples, double earners, going for a loan proposal when I tell them if there is a loan proposal available in a hospital. And we assume that they are not going to go for loan. They could be having money in the pocket. There are people who have money in the pocket, but still buy an Apple phone on EMIs in India. So they would, may have the same attitude with us. So have many more proposals ready and do discuss. At least somebody in the clinic discusses these things very transparently to them. Body mass index. The BMI is not to be controlled till you embark on the ovulation stimulation. The body mass index has to be controlled at, till the time you do an embryo transfer. Because if you go for the, this study, which has been done by Tremel and et al., and the BM, low BMI had the least miscarriage rate and high BMI. So many miscarriages in IVF practice is also because of the BMI. And you better control it, keep controlling it till the time you do an embryo transfer. Are you going to do a cleavage stage transfer or a blastocyst transfer? How many times you have been able to reach blastocyst in your clinic? Suppose you don't reach a blastocyst, who is to be blamed? Discuss all these things in detail before you go on with this. So I put it very frankly to them. Suppose I get just two cleavage stage embryos. There's a possibility you may not reach blastocyst in maybe 60 or 70% of the time. And I may just treat in 30, 40% of the time, I may have a blastocyst. So are you okay me declaring that blastocyst is not available and we are not going to go with an embryo transfer? Obviously, that's a failure. We need to prepare again. And uh, uh, the reasons, the common reasons, uh, could be one, two, three, but it's a randomized thing. We, we, your past history and past things may not have to do much about the blastocyst formation. And obviously, we are not going to tell that could be a lab error. That never comes out from our mouth or my embryologist technique. That never comes out of mouth. But at least I'm not telling you to do that, but uh, you need to be very realistic. And will you do a cleavage to the blastocyst? There'll be some couples who will insist on blastocyst, come what may. And there'll be some couples who'll say, well, doctor, you take a right call for us. You know the best. Right? But most of the couples will end up telling you, you take the right call and you know the best. So I draw a diagram to them, like what I get on the first day, I'll get three types of eggs. I'll get a GV, I'll get an M1, I'll get an M2. I really don't know how many M2s you're going to get. And then I draw a sperm and I tell, this will go in. And the two day, 24 hours later, 48 hours later, what are the kinds of embryos? And then they, they get educated a bit more about it. So somebody in the clinic has to do all that job because sometimes the embryologists, when they communicate, they don't have great experience of communicating the, to the patients in a very passionate manner or a compassionate manner. And they land up telling very technical. They will say two embryos, cleavage stage, eight cellar, grade two, and Mrs. Smith. And they will just hand it over. And I think that's very dry. So it's better we uh, put it up very properly and then go ahead. Now, this is a nice paper, actually. I would like all of you to go through this paper. I'm not covering the whole of it. It is a German guideline published in 2019 about uh, diagnosis and therapy before assisted reproductive treatment. This is a freely available on internet. Please go through that. And I'm just taking one or two things out of it. They said that polyps, hydrosalpings, correcting septum, all that you will do. Uh, they, have, they are advocating clindamycin and metronidazole for chlamydial infections, BMI control, of obviously smoking and alcohol. And I was interested in reading this paper uh, on how much alcohol is allowed to the husbands uh, before IVF. A very interesting paper. Believe me, 15 mugs, they said 15 mugs of beer doesn't make any difference. I said, thumbs up. <laughs> okay. And I guess they, they have said the hormonal issues which could be there and what would the symptom and what diagnostic lab work they do. I'm not going to go through details of this. Uh, this is just to tell you what the information this paper is giving. So do, do go through it. It's a very informative paper on this regard. Uh, please, uh, I don't do APLA syndrome testing before I embark into IVF. Even this paper says that because the incidence of APLA is very, very low. Even if you have to apply support criteria and applying support criteria in a whole year, if you see one lakh patient, five new patients will be diagnosed. So the incidence at any time in your clinic, if you're seeing one lakh patients a year, it will be just 20 to 30 patients. So don't put a huge task of putting whole applying thrombophilia profile being done for your women with, who are just yet to embark the IVF protocol. I think this is the most important part which you counsel to your client. And we discuss a lot about the FSH dosing, the LH to be added, everything. But what determines the probability of live birth? That FSH dose is a small contributor to it. It is the age of the lady, the quality of the oocytes, other unknown factors, 
and the number of antral and FSH dose that will be going ahead and that will have a live birth, etc. So we really need to be very transparent and uh, in detail, we need to counsel. Uh, let me give an analogy. In Ayurvedic treatments, have you, you must have taken some Ayurvedic or homeopathic treatments in your life. And when they go, they give, they give you some tablets and they say, well, you don't have coffee, don't have chocolate. You must get up in early in the morning, high fire namaskaras. They put so many restrictions. At the end of the day, the drug doesn't work. They'll say, well, you had coffee? That's it. That's why it didn't work. They have learned the technique of pushing the burden to the couple. We need to not find a guilt in yourself. You need to push a part of the burden to the couple. So that you do before embarking onto an IVF protocol. This is another thing which we must know. Endometrium has receptivity and selectivity. Certain endometrium would be highly receptive. That means what? They will receive whichever embryo without screening the embryo, they'll accept it. But the, as the embryo grows, the endometrium realizes, well, this is an aneuploid embryo, I better abort it. And they, these women will face repeated miscarriages. On the other hand, there could be an endometrium is highly, highly selective and less receptive. So it's very choosy about picking up the endometri uh, embryos. So even few mosaic embryos will be rejected. And that will be patients who are coming to you with repeated implantation failure. So those women could be uh, clients of uh, unexplained infertility as well. And we really don't know what determines today who is highly receptive and who is highly selective. We, that's a huge lack of knowledge in the science. And you better explain this to the patient. I explained one more thing to the client. That as humans, we are very, very civilized. We are intelligent. We are communicative, unlike animals. But animal kingdom, but for humans, the God has given them a chance of having a pregnancy once in a year, for one month, with least aneuploidy. Aneuploidy in the animal kingdom is least, with highly euploid embryos, and pregnancy rate, the fecundity rate is near 80%. But humans can have sex for pleasure. They can have sex for progeny. They can have it through the year, but our fecundity rates are just 15 to 20%, and aneuploidy is worst in humans. So that's the burden of civilization, or the price of civilization, which we are paying to the Almighty. And it, it is something which has to be accepted by the client and has to be accepted by us before you embark into an IVF treatment. And this particular thing that whenever we do IVF, we are going to have a lot of conception failures, pre-implantation failures will be there, even post-implantation failures will be there. And you better, so I think we are going, it's a very uh, delicate task that we are telling so many negatives to the couple. At the same time, we are here to boost their morale to go through the treatment and try for a pregnancy. It's a very delicate task. I'm sure a lot of experience will come. As you go on, you will develop that experience. Now I'm going to tell Sharyu to cover up hysteroscopy and the role of hysteroscopy to us in, before embarking into an IVF uh, stimulation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a routine story that right? we are doing pre-IVF hysteroscopy in our practice very routinely. It's in India, it's a consensus consensus based practice for doing going ahead with uh, pre ivf hysteroscopy so what evidence tells us the evidence does tell with the trophy study need of hysteroscopy like it's failed to demonstrate benefit when it comes to pre ivf hysteroscopy so can we establish the normalcy of uterus without doing hysteroscopy because once we have uh, we have ruled out there is a normalcy of uterus then proactively doing hysteroscopy in such situations any additional benefits we are going to pick up through the hysteroscopy. So hysteroscopy is really not needed in a couple who is undergoing IVF for male factor and where there is a young woman without any obvious uterine pathology. And when, when there is normal 3D scan, which is giving impression of normal uterine cavity, there is really not need for going under undergoing pre-IVF hysteroscopy. Many of us are practicing saline hysteroscopy uh, quite oftenly and even in abroad it's the same practice because it's given quite good information and in those patients if it, everything is normal hysteroscopy is actually not needed then in which conditions we may miss on few points on 3d ultrasound which we can pick up on pre-ivf hysteroscopy so the conditions like chronic endometritis where there is stromal edema micro polyps strawberry blood uh, strawberry pattern in the blood vessels that will be more picked up on the hysteroscopy compared to 3D ultrasound. And in these patients, if we take histopathology for the endometrial sample and subjecting it for CD138 cell, that is giving us an idea whether the patient is having chronic endometritis or not. 
then we are coming across with the two situations when it comes to mock embryo transfer one situation where there is a difficult negotiation in uh, negotiation in the cervical canal it could be because of intra uh, the adhesions at the cervical canal level and the other situation where on the ultrasound it's picked up that there are many nebothian cysts and which is make, making that distortion of cervical canal so in these two situations the hysteroscopy could be beneficial the hysteroscopic have is, uh, in uh, regards to the intrauterine adhesions intrauterine adhesions 33% more sensitive in hysteroscopy compared to 3d usc which may missed on 3d ultrasound the patients we are having persistent ecogenic endometrium those patients to uh, evaluate and to go till the root cause it's better we can subject those patient for pre iv hysteroscopy and we can always take a biopsy to know the diagnosis and to uh, treat further so as i mentioned that it's a consensus based uh, decision in india so will no hysteroscopy be taken as negligence is any patient who is coming to you and like you know she has failed with her ivf cycle and patient retrospectively analyze herself like uh, because she is well read and she is asking a question whether doctor we had not undergone with the hysteroscopy and whether that is the reason reason uh, whether i have failed so Uh, that is why like you know in india we are more uh, like frequently subjecting our patients to pre iv hysteroscopy when there is actually no need so what are the different images which will be seeing on hysteroscopy so uh, on the hysteroscopy the first image the pointer you can get so with this there are there are micro polyps which will be picked up on hysteroscopy and they are nothing but giving an idea about chronic endometriosis which i earlier mentioned there is there could be a mucosal indentation in the endometrium could be a part of chronic endometritis in such patients we would like to go undergo a histopathology of the endometrial sample and the conditions where the patient is having adenomyosis when the junctional zone impairment is not there where the agonist will work but when there is a junctional zone impairments with endometrial defect this endometrial defects could be punch out lesions in the endometrium or it could be just a mucosal elevation with the endometriotic spot so in these patients like we'll have to go ahead with another therapy to uh, like you know go ahead with the further treatment and this is where like hysteroscopy come an importance now let's address the second issue t shaped uterus in india it's like you're over diagnosing t shaped uterus and over correcting it the the etiology of t shaped uterus are repeated dnc's adhesions adenomyosis and there is unknown etiology behind t shaped uterus too so we need objective assessment when it comes to diagnosis of t shaped uterus but we are doing it subjectively everybody is having different criteria their own criteria for diagnosing t shaped uterus and that is why we are over correct over diagnosing and over correcting it so in ashray guidelines gives a specific criteria for diagnosing t shaped uterus on 3d ultrasound so when we have this t angle from where the horizontal line goes from one cornu to the other cornu and it will go to the lateral indentation when the angle is less than 40 degree that is a t angle and from where if we draw line from corneal angle till the isthmus and the distance between uh the lateral indentation and this line if it is more than or equal to 7 mm and the lateral indentation angle is less than or equal to 130 degree so these are the specific criteria given by ashray to diagnose a t shaped uterus but we are not applying and that is why we are over diagnosing it so a patients with t shaped uterus can have scanty menses or they may have normal flow so those patients who are having scanty menses with t shaped uterus your correction go is going to be beneficial and well if it is normal flow then your correction with t shaped uterus is not going to be beneficial so prevalence of this t shaped uterus is 0.2 to 10% and as i mentioned the previous miscarriage has highest incidence followed by recurrent implantation failure and few patient in past may have ectopic pregnancy and that is why the reason is that infertility alone whether it's an indication to go ahead and diagnose the t shaped uterus common indication in india for over correction we are using this t shaped uterus and how we are correcting it that is with lateral metroplasty 
but believe me we are not having that knowledge that what are the ideal current settings when it comes to uh, like you know current settings in using electrocautery during metroplasty and uh, we are also having less knowledge about how much depth we should indent when we are going for correction of uh, with the lateral metroplasty so there are various studies been done on T-shaped uterus, but these are all observational studies. And what lacks in this study is the control group. So it's very difficult to conclude, like, you know, how to diagnose it and correct it and whether the ART success, we are actually going to improve with the correction. So are we correcting, are we overcorrecting metroplasty? In India, we are coming across with very, it's a very routine practice to like, you know, advise left and right about the lateral metroplasty. So this, if it is not indicated what harm it will cause, it is in this, uh, it causes uh, fibrosis and which can lead to diffractory thin endometrium. So we are uh, doing more harm rather than increasing her ART success. Sir, we'll take you to a further topic. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think I think uh, overcorrection and doing lateral metroplasty has become so common. I see uh, histo hysteroscopy reports of so many IVF laboratories, and every patient who crosses over has undergone a lateral metroplasty. Uh, you know they have undergone corrections like yahan pe bhi faro kiya, yahan pe bhi faro kiya, or funders ko bhi faro kiya. I really don't see why. What is the reason behind it? And I think. Uh, uh, without having a knowledge about the 3D ultrasound picture, putting the correct diagnosis, just on hysteroscopy, you feel that the uterus is narrow and you're doing this furrowing. I feel it's like ovary looks polycystic, let's drill it. You know, I, 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 I see we are really overcorrecting it or overusing our techniques. And when we really don't know how harmful it is. And I, we have had patients with refractory thin endometrium doing what we want to do, but it's not getting corrected only because previously they have undergone unnecessary lateral metroplasty surgeries. So be very, very careful before we advent into these surgeries. When Dr. Sharyu told that we really don't know about the current, we know everybody uses 30, 40 watts of current and they would do two furrows. First is three millimeter drip, another dip will go to five to six millimeter. But what harm will it do or what good will it do? Vertically, we don't know. Sadly, no criticism again on the endoscopic surgeon, Rishikesh is sitting here. Problem is the endoscopic surgeons see a horizontal patient. They go from clinic to clinic and they do endoscopic surgeries and come out. So they really don't know vertically what happens to that patient, whether it has made a difference to them in the long run. And they all hesitate to put up their own hospitals and clinics and they keep doing because that gets the fantastic money and free atmosphere. I'm not criticizing them. Or you can say I'm criticizing them, no problem. But that's a fact. But in the experience of a doctor comes only when the doctor sees the patient vertically and over 10 years, you will gather. For 10 years, if you see everybody horizontally and you say 1000 myomectomies, 2000 endometrium, you don't know the vertical knowledge, whether you're done good or bad. And nowadays the YouTubers say peritonealectomy, okay? And then uh, everybody ureter dikha, are kya, jaruri hai kya? And then ultimately, bapas diagnosis pe do do sal dalte patient. So I think we need a vertical assessment of this client properly so that we can put it across to uh, transparently what exactly is needed for this particular patient. So this is a nice paper we got, and I think I would again recommend all of you to read this paper up. Well, this is about review of factors influencing the implantation of euploid blastosis. So the first criteria of selecting all the papers in this, when they transferred euploid blastosis. So euploid blastosis, what stimulation protocol? Euploid blastosis with what kind of FET preparation? Euploid blastosis, what is the morphology of the blastosis? So it's a beautiful paper. Go through it, a very exhaustive paper. Again, I'm not going to discuss the whole of it. So they said three factors contribute to the embryo implantation, embryo quality, endometrial receptivity, and endometrial embryo transfer technique. And embryo quality will be affected by BMI, the general health status of the lady, the sperm quality, the paternal age, and obviously all the lifestyle issues they have. When you assess the uterine factors, I think this is, this I thought was quite nice here. This is that increasing thickness, uh, it, it's, it's always hypoechoic to start with, and it becomes hyperechoic. The hyperechoic comes because of glands and blood vessels and stroma which develops, but not necessarily it is accompanied by a high end progesterone. So if you confirm it's become a little hyperechoic or let's say isoechoic endometrium, but it is nicely thick, but your pro progesterone level is under control, you can go ahead and do embryo transfers. And that's a very vital information we get. You need not strike or cancel or keep postponing the time to pregnancy just because the endometrium looks a little bizarre. Endometritis, now very query query thing. 
uh, when it comes to implantation failures. All the papers on endometritis, which say that it's very, very important, have come from one author, Cicinelli Vettori. Okay, it's come from just one author. All other papers, all other authors are not collaborating the same thing they say. They are not in sync with it. They say it's a quite a dubious thing whether coronic endometritis should be established as a diagnosis. And then the diagnostic criteria themselves have suffered. It's a syndromic diagnosis on hysteroscopy, uh, histopathological with plasma CD138 labeled plasma cells. Again, the number of plasma cells people have said from one, some, some papers have sent five plasma cells per high power field. So it's a very different, difficult, uh, different evidence which you are subjected to. Uh, obviously, in my practice, I always have a look at the myometrial thickness. And average myometrial thickness is about 1.5 to 1, 2 centimeters. So once the myometrial thickness keeps on going beyond 2 centimeters, that's the way you diagnose adenomyosis. But if there is no junctional zone impairment, number one, and the patient is asymptomatic, having myohyperplasia, that's myohyperplasia, then I don't label it as adenomyosis. In such a scenario, even a fresh embryo transfer will do well. But if you have a junctional zone impairment or some ecogenic changes in the myometrium and the patient is symptomatic about adenomyosis, well, then you will need some long protocols, etc. So the, having euploid blastosis and getting it converted into a baby, a live birth, will be depending on all these factors, the embryo morphology, the blastosis expansion stage, paternal age, sperm quality, uterine factors, FET protocols, everything. And this paper really analyzes the papers published of the euploid blastosis transferred onto the other side. And these are the different possible factors which you go through before embarking on the IVF. So have you ruled out fibroids, adenomyosis, uh, endometriosis, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, like, especially Mullerian abnormalities. So, and it's better to have a discussion with the client. Like sit in front of them and say, well, there are some general condition which can make you fail, like anemia, thyroid, et cetera. We have corrected that. BMI, I told you to correct, but you did not correct it. If you want to increase your success rate, you better correct it. You have to tell it very specifically. Then come to pelvis. In pelvis, you don't have any other problem. The adnexa appears normal. In uterus, you don't have fibroid, you don't have adenomyosis, you, your junctional zone appears to be very good. Let's talk of endometrium. I've seen your endometrium three, four times. Every time the endometrium is in phase, or if you're not seeing it, take one month. Tell her, I would like to see you on day three, day 13, day 23, and evaluate her endometrium. After collecting two lakh rupees and embryos in the freezer, don't say you have thin endometrium. Don't fall on face like that. It's better to spend some time, get that information first, and then declare the therapies what you want to give to these patients. A true recurrent implantation failure will not get will not be there. If the true case is that she will never get pregnant. And all the studies are saying the clinical pregnancy rate will decrease with every attempt of IVF, but the cumulative live birth rate keeps on increasing with every attempt of live birth rate. So we are really not looking at a true case of implantation failure. There can't be a true implantation failure in our practice. So what is the way ahead? There's going to be a lot of evidence-based practice. And next lecture, Mohan will be telling us the true evidence onto this implantation failure cases. The second is a value-based practice. You're, you're, you're telling them that PGTA may not work or ERA is useless, but then the patient says, well, doctor, there's nothing wrong attempting it. Let me just go through it. I, I want to take the best chance for what I want to have. And it's a value-based decision-making. So it's a very shared decision-making where you really spend time with the couple explaining those things. And it's a shared decision-making which is done between the couple and you. What is your protocol? And that's where I feel ISAR and IFS and all of Foxy societies have to come forth and tell us, well, these are the minimum things you do before you embark on stimulation. And that will help us telling that this doctor is negligent. He didn't do that. We all just follow one protocol and that will uniformly standardize us and our patient-doctor relationship will get better and stronger. What about endometrial receptivity assay? I'm just quoting one paper. I'm sure Mohan will be also telling the same thing here. And this is by the verdict by the inventors of ERA themselves, wherein they did a multicentral randomized control trial in IVF and personalized blastos transfer versus frozen or fresh transfers only on the morphological assessment and not doing any uh, on the, uh, on the uh, endometrial studies. And look at the, uh, look at the study. Well, there is no statistically significant difference anywhere, but in clinical miscarriages where it is, uh, mm, yeah, it, even that is crossing the line of unity. So not statistically significant difference in any of the criteria there. So recommending ERA today, I think it's a query query and Mohan will look forward to you to answer that question more. What about PGTA? I'm not going to talk anything about PGTA now. I'm taking a separate lecture on embryology for clinicians today, and that lecture will cover up 
what are the uh, PGTA, what it really informs, what it doesn't inform, and what are the lacunae of knowing PGTA further. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I request you that we will postpone our question answers after Mohan's lecture because it is he's going to enlighten us on, on the recurrent implantation failure and we go ahead with the question answer sessions. Thank you so much. Hmm? Yeah, I, I'm just getting that. This is are you in? very good morning to all my colleagues and friends. So this is a better time to talk, I guess, than last evening. So this is my favorite topic because a lot of us face this. So I believe a lot of us out here are practicing IVF. So I think it's a continuation of what uh, Dr. Sachin has mentioned. So I'll probably dwell a little more on some of these aspects. And I love doing this because I love the papers that have been published. It's so good to critique them. It's a learning exercise for my students. I use them because how big groups clever people manage to get the publication in very good journals. You know, it's an art. So I love doing all this. So uh, no clear conflict of interest to declare. So I would probably take some time for all of you to dwell on what is RIF, then possible solutions, mostly clinical, and some practice points that I have probably put in, but uh, we are. I'm happy to debate on that if you go back. So one of the things that we need to sort out in medical practice is first identify the condition. So what is RIF? If you ask yourself, that's where the problem starts. So I give this analogy like what is COVID, you know? So we have a diagnosis of COVID following, um, you know, COVID test and so on. So similarly, what is RIF? So start thinking on this, just having a couple of IVF, unsuccessful attempts, you, uh, is it a pathology? Is it a pathological diagnosis, okay? Because I might have, a patient comes to me, I have an unsuccessful attempt at our place, then patient goes to you, she has another unsuccessful attempt. Do you think it's the same as having two unsuccessful attempts in your center or any other center? Because the reasons could be very different in my center, and then she had a failure because of some other reason in her center, the other center. Um, so we need to think on this. So it is reflected in the couple of papers that I have quoted. So earlier uh, they felt that after four good embryo, uh, you know, quality, good quality embryos, you have a, a no success and you call it RIF. Then it became like two blastocyst and so on. But I must highlight here that there was a systematic review which tried capturing the RIF definition. So this is the number of papers with different definitions of RIF. So the problem here I'm trying to highlight is there is substantial heterogeneity in what we call RIF in literature itself. So if in the literature there is so much problem in identifying a disease, when you don't identify a disease, how do you come up with solutions? You know, if I had to test a drug, First, I need to figure out what the condition is. We are not even clear about the condition. And that's the problem. Because if you don't know what you're trying to correct, then how do you test any intervention? So this is a very scientific point, And this is reflecting a lot of our editorial discussion. So the maximum number of papers come from Eduardo Somigliana, who is like, who is actually the next editor-in-chief of Human Reproduction Open. So. His papers are quite an interesting study in mathematical modeling and statistics. So um, it is an overdiagnosed condition and actual prevalence after, actually the true prevalence is quoted less than 5%, okay? So his paper in RBM online is worth going through. And in fact, I think it is open access for these editorials. So the false positive rate, that means that actually there was no RIF and we kept on labeling them as RIF, is as high as 75% in three cycle failures. It comes down to 50% uh, when it is six cycles. 
So this is the problem here that we are over diagnosing something and trying to look for solutions. So it, it's, a, it's something that worth looking at. And I would share here that none of the Cochrane reviews will have a term called RIF because it is not agreed that there is a situation called RIF. We label it as two or more failures. So if you see any of the Cochrane's that we've turned out, you will not find the word RIF there. You will find two or more failures, which is a very different thing. And if you just look at it, you know, just from some plain speaking, when we start an IVF, what are the chances of success? It is 30%. 35%. The likelihood of that person not having a successful cycle is 65%. And she's simply falling in that 65% and because the odds are against them. But we want to, you know, we it's a human thing and we start looking for answers. But actually the statistics is totally stacked against them. And that's where the starting point is. You try to dive into this diagnosis before even you start looking at solutions. So I will leave you with that thought, and then I will come to some very controversial inter um, interventions, which has attracted a lot of attention in literature. And it's rightly so, because mainly it's all about a couple of failures or more failures, and we have to start looking at what we can do to make our patient's life better. So first one on the block was endometrial scratch, and it is still hovering around. I'm uh, private to the fact that there is an IPD metaanalysis which has been done and the results I am um, party to because I am on one of those papers. It still is not settled question, but it all started in 2003 when this group came up and said that they had doubling of live birth rate. You know, uh, so if you have 20% live birth, you would get 40% following endometrial scratch. And after that, everybody decided, okay, this is it. You know, there have been a lot of trials which came up subsequently, you know, and finally, as I said yesterday, there's a publication bias. You had a whole series of trials which supported it. Few were from India. Then there were some trials which started looking the other way. That is, there was no benefit of uh, endometrial scratch. But what you always have to look at when you're looking at a literature, especially for IVF, is what is the population you're talking about? So always pay attention to what they are meaning. It is unselected population or one failure or two failures and so on. People don't look at this. This is a very important, you know, entry eligibility criteria that the trials, uh, you know, kind of mention, but we kind of don't pay attention. And why that is important, I'll tell you. This was one of our trials, which was published in 2017. And we actually had to shut down this trial because we felt that it was not leading us anywhere. Uh, it was a premature stopping, which is again introduces some bias because we felt it was unethical because by that time, uh, the results were, I think the Cochrane had come out 2016, where they said that there is some benefit, okay? And that time it was difficult for us to continue randomizing. So we stopped this trial and we mentioned this in our um, discussion that there was some bias in it. But at that point, whatever 110 patients we had randomized, we didn't find any benefit. And this was a group of patients who had one or more failure. So it had a subgroup of RI, uh, two or more failures or RIF for the time being this talk I will mention. After that, Cochrane did a course correction. Okay, So 2016 said that there's a moderate quality evidence supporting endometrial scratch. But 2021, there was you know, uh, turn around because what happened over the years is people started figuring out that a lot of trials are sham trials, okay? So there's a lot of concern in the editorial group about really bad quality trials coming into the system. Many of them are from conferences like ESHRE and ASRM where the conference abstracts are picked up and they all find their way on these reviews. And that kind of really makes it very difficult to figure out what is working. So this Cochrane actually changed the findings. So you can look at the area of interest here, two or more failures. You can see here, there's no wording RAF now. They simply could not pull the trials because they were very different. And that is the right way to do it because they figured out that the trials cannot be pulled for RAF because they had very different operational definitions. So that is why I keep on stressing on this. If you don't understand this methodology, it's going to become very difficult to figure out the papers itself. 
So this is Lenson's Cochrane. Now this girl, Sarah Lenson, has actually done most of the work in endometrial scratch. So she's a good colleague of mine. Actually, I am in touch with her currently for one more paper on ERA. So all the endometrial scratch and ERA papers come from this group, uh, at least the criticism for ERA. So they, they were really worried about this endometrial scratch because they figured out that a lot of people are doing endometrial scratch even though the evidence was not there. So their group took up this very large trial, uh, which was around 1,200 plus, multinational, multi-continent, you can call it UK, New Zealand, Australia, and so on. And what did they find in endometrial scratch was, look at the live birth rate, 26.1 versus 26.1, risk ratio one. You don't get better stats than this. But again, the catch is that it's an unselected group. So the area of pop, uh, interest for us, like the subgroup of two or more failures was less number. So I will not take this fully for our population that I'm talking about, but I'm just trying to place where the endometrial scratch stands. And after this, because there are a lot of other groups which also so, uh, tried settling this question. There's a scratch group. So this was from the uh, Netherlands and they also tried doing this. And there's, look at the population now. They took patients with one failed IVF. So you keep on looking at the population which changes. What are their results? 23% after scratch, 19% control. Unfortunately, the, the confidence interval crosses unity. So it's not significant. They actually had a 12 month follow-up. So any transfers done in the 12 months, they followed up, but the difference did not disappear. So 5% difference. So you might argue that 5% is a good jump, but that's what they say. But statistically, this was not significant. Now, this group is actually embarked on something called IPD meta-analysis, where they get data from all the other trial groups, and we are about to get the results now. So probably it's under peer review consideration, and we should get some answers by next three months. So that's where the scratch is. Now, hysteroscopy, just now we had a, a talk. So I'll just cover up this talk in uh, this part in a uh, couple of slides. We need to distinguish two separate procedures. One is called a screening hysteroscopy and the other one is called an operative hysteroscopy. So as long as you have an ultrasound, you need not have a 3D ultrasound. Even if you have a 2D ultrasound, which does not show you any uh, obvious intracavitary pathology and you still choose to do a hysteroscopy, it is called a screening hysteroscopy. And if you find the abnormality and then you go ahead and do a hysteroscopy and that point you will obviously, if you have a polyp, you'll do a polypectomy, then it is called an operative hysteroscopy. So it's very important to distinguish. So we are looking at the evidence for let's say operative hysteroscopy. Frankly, there are no trials on this because if you identify a pathology, it's very unlikely that you are going to leave that. You know, So I think it will be unethical to randomize in this group. So Looking at that, there is no trials before IVF for operative hysteroscopy, but it is prudent. If you identify a pathology, you have to go and remove it prior to IVF in any case. And there is some observational data on this. Uh, that is patients who had failures, you know, two times or more, they had observational studies. Somebody figured out 36% hysteroscopic abnormality. Somebody figured out 45%. But I would say as a person who is doing this, it's all operator dependent. So if you are really skilled, you will not reach this high numbers. You know, 45% missing uh, hysteroscope uh, lesions intracavitary is a problem. So that is why these studies will definitely show improvement because they've kind of missed everything in the first place. So that's why you have to understand the clinical aspects in the studies. So I would be shocked if I start seeing one third of my patients have a hysteroscopic or intracavitary lesion worth looking at. But the second thing is also what constitutes a pathology, we really don't know. So when I put in a hysteroscope and I see a tiny bit of flimsy adhesion in the osteal region, I will say adhesions. Whether that adhesion removal is really going to help is something that is not known. But we choose to believe that that adhesion, you little bit, you dig, then you got it right, has made the difference. That's not the case. It is just called random chance. Okay, we feel great about, oh, I did a hysteroscopy and I sorted this out. But that's not the way. It's just the nature, mother nature, which is working better. That's all. 
and he just got lucky. So this is a, a Cochrane, which uh, I happened to lead, and this is on screening hysteroscopy. So we had a tough time uh, putting up the papers because there are a lot of opposing views. This is a very complicated forest plot, but I will just draw your attention to the same point, two or more failures. So first trial is only unselected population. Then there is first IVF after one IVF failure. And then this group is after two IVF failures. You can see the diamond shifting towards favoring hysteroscopy. So what we found was if you do a screening hysteroscopy in two or more failures, you will have a benefit. So before jumping to conclusions, we need to understand that this quality of evidence is more important than the significant non-significant discussion, because this was not a high quality evidence. There were no high quality evidence to show benefit. To prove this point, so actually we had a lot of discussion in editorial how to capture the conclusion for this review. What was happening was we had 10 trials in screening hysteroscopy, and if you pool all of them, they were showing benefit. But the two high quality trials did not show any benefit. The high quality trials had uh, numbers like 1000 and so on. So how do you capture this in the conclusion? Because we clinicians have a habit of only reading the abstract. We will not go into the details because the Cochrane is an 80 page paper. Okay, So it's not easy to go that we have not that much of time because unfortunately the academic and clinical practice is not you know, clearly demarcated in this part of the world. So we actually put this like this, that low quality evidence shows screening hysteroscopy may increase live birth. However, high quality trials did not show benefit. So we leave it to the judgment of the reader to decipher this. Cochrane will never recommend or oppose any intervention. All it will do is put the facts on paper and leave it to the judgment of the end user. So the trials who sh which showed benefit had a poor methodology. You understand? So this is how we word it. And we leave it to your judgment how you want to interpret. The largest trial which looked at two or more failures, which is called famously called the trophy trial, had 350 on either sides. And you can see the live birth rate, 29% versus 29 so this group, there was absolutely no difference. This kind of stats is a dream. You know, you can't get stats like this, but it's very beautiful. So this was a Lancet paper. So we know anything published in any GM Lancet has certain credibility. So that is where the screening hysteroscopy stands. Now, there are certain interventions where the evidence is quite clear. So if you have hydrosulfing detected on ultrasound, I want to stress this point. It's not those, uh, you know, vague uh, HSDs which are showing some loculation and everybody starts looking at it and starts reading it as hydrosulfings we are talking about. We are talking about ultrasound detected hydrosulfings. In those cases, you can explore salphingectomy to increase your pregnancy rates. If it's a bilateral hydrosulfings, you remove those two, you will have a doubling of pregnancy, live birth rate. It's the live birth rate. But in fact, the paper shows 3.5 percent, 3.5 fold increase in delivery rates. Because even if patients conceive, they tend to have miscarriages with, because of hydrosulfings. The problem with this evidence, it's it's further you know reiterated by the Cochrane as well that you have a significant improvement in uh, pregnancy rates. The problem is that you know sometimes this evidence is not really possible to implement. Let's say you have a patient who has got a bad genital tuberculosis with frozen pelvis and so on and so forth. And somebody has done a surgery a couple of times already. And then you have a patient with the hydrosulfings and planned for IVF. Try going in with a laparoscope inside and try clipping or doing a salphingectomy. It's not an easy task. The risk benefit ratio will change. You always have to look at the benefit, but you should also look at the risk. So I've had patients with a midline vertical scar with a couple of times laparotomy done and a hydrosulfing sitting. And I'm wondering whether it's worth the risk to actually put in a scope and try to remove that tube, you know. So there are finer details, like you might have to see whether it's a disappearing hydrosulfings or it's constantly present because some of them might not be draining inside and you might get lucky with that. So there is again a need to have a shared decision making. 
we are all here oh there's the hydrosalpins you require a laparoscopic self injectomy it is not your decision it's a shared decision mostly it's the patient's decision so if she wishes to go ahead with the hydrosalpins it is her choice you just document your the findings and your discussion and move on it is not mandatory in fact if i tell you in my practice i hardly do self injectomy because i find it very difficult to counsel a patient that your both tubes are going to be taken off you know because sometimes you'll have a unilateral hydrosalpins and you have to take a consent keeping both in mind you know you can't go inside and find out that the other tube also has got you know dilatation and you have to clip both i'm not touching too much in this simply there is no evidence but i'll just go through one of them each again gcsf we were on board on this cochrane hardly any evidence two or more failures couple of trials uh, i think if i remember correctly both were extra abstracts there's hardly anything i could figure out of the trials so we had to put it as a low quality evidence so gcsf again is an off label use it is used for hematology but we have decided that it is useful for us we picked it up and we have started using it it's now fallen back because there's a new kid on the block called prp okay but uh, frankly speaking this is not working okay. heparin lot of people even without rif go for it very very less you know these are all trials way back a decade back nothing moved forward because people realize this is not working but we continue to use it for whatever reason i in my practice have never used heparin aspirin or anything of that sort um see there is a lot of chat about this iv immunoglobulin therapy there is not a single big trial which has actually pushed this all our cohort studies and quasi experimental and cross sectional and so on somebody give somebody was destined to become pregnant and you going to give a ivi and then you figure out and then say okay everything happened because of this that is simply a biased trial or a biased study there is no high quality rct for this and i can quote this because most of them we had done a lit this is a paper we published with uh, fertility sterility on growing list of clinical adjuvants okay and i have covered this you know prp also i added because we looked at the literature there was not a single you know uh, big trial there were a couple of small trials one was supporting and these trials were like 50 women 60 women you know you can't extrapolate data from 60 and 70 women for the entire population of the world it is simply not correct so how can you start changing practice when you have such flimsy kind of evidence you know we are not into that so kind of we need to really introspect so right now we have concluded this particular review which is cited quite well as it is an experimental thing if you are using this and something goes wrong i think there was a uh, i saw something on legal terms this will be construed a negligence i would say because it's experimental and when we are putting it in a authoritative journal as experimental and people use this right and left you are taking a risk because it is not meant to be routine so i would caution so that's the favorite one era this is not patient friendly by any stretch of imagination okay and i can just shudder to see what happens when you know you call those patients repeatedly for mock transfer now we are trying to talk about era in the context of rif yeah if i believe so that people think okay couple of failures and now i need to offer era but the fact of the matter is the group which started this has chosen an unselected good prognosis patient to start looking at era you know that's the problem here so anyway there was a retrospective study in rif which found no you know this was in donor oocyte failure cycles and they did not find you know they, it was a euploid blastocyst and they looked at donor cycle they did not find but i will come to the trial which was very controversial by this group and uh, they used unselected ivf population so that's why i'm telling you you have to concentrate on the population what has been looked at so people you know unselected population they had three arms and 50% dropout you know moment you have this kind of dropout even before you start your trial that trial is junked okay because it is heavily biased you know in a scientific peer review group this will not stand moment because there is a big bias why did these people leave 
Live birth rate after first ET, there was not no significant difference. Cumulative LVR was higher. I will come to that, but it was not an RIF. So there was a group which went after this group. You know? So they had comments on the whole methodology of the trial. So they actually, there is a distinction when you present the results, there is something called intention to treat analysis and there is something called per protocol analysis. It's very important for us clinicians to understand this difference. Because if we don't understand this difference, you will erroneously conclude you know, that things are working because per protocol is not the correct way of analyzing. When you look at a paper, they have to present something called intention to treat analysis. So they made a mistake of going on per protocol analysis. Normally in your conclusions, you will not have you know, per protocol analysis results, you'll have intention to treat. And I can tell you that most of the results in this paper were not significant, okay? And they did something called post hoc analysis, which was, and they presented results in the conclusion for 35 to 40 years. So, um, and trying to say that it might benefit in that group and so on. So these are all changes that are done, which are not really correct, but you know, this is the way the editorial system works. So uh, I think it's worth going through both these papers, you know, the actual trial and the comments, both are, I think, open access. You can actually go and download the paper on the net. You don't have to subscribe to IRBM. It's good that they have done that because transparency is important. So uh, that's what they have written. Conclusion should have been based on ITT analysis and not per protocol. Uh, myomectomy, if you find an intramural fibroid, uh, there again, there is again very difficult area because for a surgeon, every myoma needs removal, but for people who um, are not very keen, it's not an easy one. So I would just caution here when you're looking at studies, there is something called association. Okay, there's a fibroid and there's slightly lower pregnancy rates, but it hasn't been proven that you go on doing, removing all these fibroids and you will have a better pregnancy rates. So the problem here is fibroids and by nature, it's very heterogeneous population. So your five centimeter fibroid intramural pushing the cavity might be very different from let's say a sub or a part intramural and so on and so forth. But when you are looking in, a study, all these become homogenous. And that's the problem. So if you're looking at a trial for myomectomy, you have to be very careful of the heterogeneity. ERA, again, um, typically thought for in RIF, but all the trials are good prognosis. So the ASRM practice re recommendations are that the value, thankfully they are more balanced because there are some sane voices still on that committee. And P value of PGTA is yet to be determined, but I'm sure it's quite well entrenched, uh, well entrenched in practice. So it's like almost 15 years now we continue to offer, whereas the ASRM practice guideline hasn't changed. So potential, it has some potential to reduce multiple pregnancy by doing an elective single embryo transfer, but there are limitations. And the catch is most of these trials are randomizing on the day of embryo transfer. Whereas ideally you are supposed to randomize before starting the cycle. So these are all very technical terms, but they are bi uh, introducing bias in those trials. Because when you are doing a randomized trial for PGTA, you are committing that the patient will have to undergo blastocyst transfer and a freeze-all cycle. Whereas in a control in real life, I will not commit for a blastocyst transfer or a freeze-all cycle. If I find the oocyte yield is less and I have two cleavage stage trans uh, embryos, I will not take that lady to blastocyst. It's a shared decision making, but at the end of the day, I'm going to tell, listen, you might have 20% chance that the embryos will not survive. But when you are committing in a randomized trial for a PGTA, you are you, in the control group, I'm not under any constraint. I will not go to blastocyst if I feel that things are not going fine. But in these trials, they end up committing. They wait very cleverly till the day of transfer or the day of five, and then they choose to randomize. Very clever. You know, people have become very clever. That's the problem nowadays, I think so. <laughs> so this is the trial, and the same issues. Um, 
The problem is, I also find that the investment in technology is so huge that any other result is not acceptable. You know, it is called cherry picking. So you can, you know, do what you want, turn around the statistics. It's very easy. You pick up what you want and put that. So that's what this, these guys did. So they had the same. There was no improvement in overall pregnancy rates. Uh, so, but they added a liner here. Huh? Sorry, I think the era, I got confused. Era, the, they didn't do this part, but these people definitely did. That 35 to 40, it helps. But actually, there was, again, no difference in ITT analysis. So I'll just go into detail of this. What they have done is, you see the results. 41 versus 43. No difference in ongoing pregnancy rates. But it was already well entrenched. So, and it was... As I said, it is supported by uh, industry. So any other results are not going to really work because it's already there. But our Chinese friends did something just to go one step further. So this is for those who still believe, okay, star trial, no, there's another trial. We can see, wait for one more trial before they you know, pull off the PGTA bandwagon. So this is a very interesting trial. So. This was a non-inferiority multicenter RCT. So essentially, I just want to take one minute here. There are two types of trials. One is superiority trial and one is non-inferiority trial. So in superiority trial, you're trying to tell that the new drug is better than the previous one. Whereas the non-inferiority trial, you are trying to tell that we have a, already a good standard of care. And the next one is not maybe not as good but it is cheaper or it is safer. So these people made PGTA as the standard. That means that PGTA is the gold standard and the conventional morphology was taken as a little down, but it is cheaper. Okay, so, and what is the margin which will be acceptable? Because it might not have the same live birth rate as PGTA, so even if you have a 7% difference, <coughs> so if you have 7% lower pregnancy or a live birth rate with conventional compared to PGTA, I will accept conventional. So that is called a non-inferiority design. And they randomized 1,212 with at least three blastocysts. And they did single embryo transfer each time. To their surprise, PGTA actually came up to 77% which they felt was actually should have been higher. And the conventional went up to 82%. So without PGTA, they had a higher cumulative live birth rate. So this is where the truth is, you know, most likely. Any guesses on why this is going down? The conclusion are very clear. Conventional morphology is non-inferent to PGTA. So the, the authors did write in the discussion what are the possible reasons for lower success? Their decision not to transfer mosaic embryos. So that was a protocol decision. And uh, most of us know that we will find it difficult to convince patients on mosaic embryos. Uh, and there is obviously a point of false positive and false negative. So mosaic embryos, uh, it's a very gray area. And I think uh, there is a team, Gleitzer and Barad, who came up they took all the mosaic embryos from all the you know ivf centers in us and because they the patients want normally they will not be allowed to go for a transfer you know with mosaic embryos in us but this center said okay we will transfer you give a consent so they went on transferring mosaic embryos because patient didn't have any other embryos and they ended up with healthy live birth babies so that time people realized Listen, from mosaic embryos also, we are getting healthy babies. Okay, so that's where. So, and the third thing, obviously, which is not very difficult biologically to think, they are actually damaging the embryos by taking a chunk of those trophoectoderms. You know, so biologically, it's clearly possible to create more damage. And you are, you know, everybody's got a learning curve. Your embryologists also have a learning curve. They'll go around doing a biopsy. It's the same way as I doing a laparoscopy first time. I'll go and create some, you know, mess. That's what is going to happen. So you will lose a lot of patients who are otherwise. This is in addition to those you will commit for a day five, you know, transfer. You know, you will lose many good quality embryos on the way. 
this is a you know i just thought i will again tell you what the problem is so this is an ashray uh, this trial got the award this time um, in the ashray which was on time lapse and they actually randomized time lapse with and without algorithm versus norm, normal you know, normal morphology thing rct single embryo transfer day 3 ongoing pregnancy rate. you can see here there is no difference so with algorithm, without algorithm, uninterrupted culture, it didn't give any benefit for the group. So this is how difficult it is to prove something. So I will stop here with all these, you know, um, you know, uh, add-ons and intervention that we are so commonly offering. And I'll just quickly run through some of the things that we do. So if you have a patient with repeated failures, I look, try to look at quality of stimulation. Now in our unit, we all go for a particular recombinant version only. IVF, we don't mix and match. So there is no urinary plus gonadotrophin and so on. So batch to batch consistency is not a problem for our unit because we have been sticking for the same group of uh, recombinant from inception in 1995. So there is no question of batch to batch consistency for us. But then if you are using gonadotrophin, that can create a problem if you're using the urinary group. If you feel that the progesterone is on the higher side, then probably that can be one of the reasons for a unsuccessful attempt. And you might have to look at these you know, checks. I also feel it's very important to document what kind of embryo trans uh, endometrial pattern you are getting. A good triple line pattern is very helpful. It kind of really helps you figure out if there's any intracavitary lesion. If you have a triple line and a clean intracavitary picture, it's very unlikely that is harboring any major anomaly, uh, abnormality, which is which requires an intervention. But when I don't see this pattern, I get a little worried because you know um, you you kind of feel if you miss something. So, but if your suspicion, clinical suspicion is high then for a couple of failures or more than that and your endometrium is not something that you are satisfied with you can argue for a hysteroscopy so this is where i am saying it's not routine it's a individualized approach and also many times there will be occult hydrothalamins which gets picked up during stimulation because of the estrogen that goes up the fluid translation happens and you can actually see these you know, hydrosalphine structures, hypoechoic area around the ovaries. And that's when you start suspecting that you probably are missed some hydrosalphines, which needs, you know, occult hydrosalphines are not an easy one to pick up. But keep that in mind. Then, of course, your lab has to give comments on anything very specific, uh, sperm or oocyte. I usually look at the whole cohort of cycles. Like if they're consistently telling everybody sperm and egg has got a problem, then there's a problem with the lab. Okay. But if uh, one odd case they are commenting and the rest of cohort is doing well in terms of embryo development and all, then the lab is fairly stable and it's more of a patient factor. So usually in a very well-established unit, the clinician is for quite experienced. The protocols are not changing. The lab guys are fairly stable. It's only the culture condition or the patient factor which can change. So that's why you have to keep a track of the whole cohort of you know, lab performance to see if there's somebody who's doing not so proper job at the gamete preparation level or let's say the culture conditions, the incubators and so on and so forth. But that's something that you can always look at. So it requires a closer look. Start looking at the lab more often in repeated failures than your stimulation if you got the decent number of oocytes i really don't find any reason to perform dna fragmentation there are people who start looking at this but with the way we are going about in ICSI, i don't see any reason even if a dna fragmentation is high it doesn't necessarily change anything there's no recommendation what to do the other thing i strongly tell my students is have a habit of documenting your embryo transfer ease Dr. Kulkarni did mention, and it's very important to look for a mock transfer. I do it for all the patients except those whom I have done an IUI or a hysteroscopy for some reason or any intrauterine manipulation. If you've done a sono recently, there's no need to do a mock transfer. But if you have not done any intrauterine manipulation, then it's better to do a mock transfer for all those who are going for an IVF as close to IVF as possible, not in the same cycle beforehand. But I sometimes... Uh, find unexpected difficulty during transfers and I very carefully document this. It is on my mind, though I don't put it like on bold font, 
but I will just put it on my mind that there is a problem I have faced. In fact, before coming here last Saturday, I got in trouble with one of the transfers where I could not simply negotiate it and became very messy. So at that point, I stopped it. I said, okay, I'll go for a hysteroscopy. So if you ask me, there is a role for hysteroscopy, but this is where it is very important. But if you ask me, sir, I don't have hysteroscopy. Can I do something else? Yes, you can do an ultrasound guided cervical dilatation. If you have that skills, you can definitely do. You don't have to go for a hysteroscopy only to create a cervical dilatation. There's one uh, philosophy, the school of thought, which is emerging is, the number of oocytes that you need to target because the answer to solution is through this strategy. So all of us know that uh, Shesh Sumkara's paper in 2011, which came up, it said that up to 15, the pregnancy rates or live birth rates go up and after that they plateau or go down. Okay. Now this is for one cycle data. That means that if you um, hit 15, that's all that you can achieve in that cycle. But I think Dr. Kulkarni did mention this yesterday. I just want to highlight this. The proportion of euplied blastocysts does not change irrespective of the numbers. So if you have a blastocyst rate of, let's say, euploidy rate of 20%, your rate will remain same. So if you want to increase the number of euploid blastocysts with you, if you increase the absolute number of eggs, you will get higher number of euploid embryos with you. All you need to do is transfer them one by one or once or twice or whatever, you will get there. So that's the very land big paper which came from Rakopoulos. This is a very highly cited paper, which looked at number of eggs and cumulative live births. And what they did was the cumulative live birth will keep on going up. It will not plateau as long as you have more and more number of eggs. So essentially, in simple words, what it has done is it has paved the way for more aggressive stimulation because then you will have a larger cohort of eggs. And because the proportion of euploid embryos will not change, if you have 10 eggs and you have 20% proportion of euploid blastocysts, you'll have two blastocysts. If you have 20 eggs, you'll have four blastocysts. That's the way it will go. And if you ask me, the other thing that is big time coming up in clinical practice is movement towards modified natural uh, FET transfers because definitely there is a strong reason for it that the displacement, so-called displacement and all that school of thought is not necessarily very common in a natural cycle. So at least we have started moving big time into modified natural protocol because that's the way forward if you really want to find a solution for patients who had multiple failures. So you have your blastocyst or even uh, cleavage stage embryos and transfer them in a more probably better uh, uterine environment, you can look at. But more importantly, these patients, once they conceive, they do much better obstetrically. First trimester bleeding is much lower. And I can tell you that there are large studies which have come out showing much better obstetric outcome in terms of lower preeclampsia and other complications. So the way forward now is no longer HRT. HRT is very convenient. Even for me in a tertiary center, it's convenient. I can tell my registrars to keep doing it. But modified natural requires a learning curve and it's not easy. So uh, last is take home, very few evidence supported measures, but the need to start the, doing these measures is something that we have to link up with the definition in the first place. There are hardly any or very few proven interventions, especially surgical or laboratory. Try to minimize the cost and inconvenience to the patient. That will be a lot more easier to handle in your counseling because you have failures, you can still, you know, show a face. You do a PGT and have a failure, you will find it that much more difficult. I think usually for in our practice, perseverance usually works. Uh, honest discussion. If you find that there is a problem in the embryos, you tell that, you know, that's the way forward. I think I just want to highlight this. This is one of our papers, which was an invited one. Reproductive medicine, still more of an art than science, you know. So we need to figure out, are we scientists or something else, you know, because it's not that art that we are talking about. It is ART. So we really need to think how we want to go about this. Thank you. On, yep. uh, Thank you, Mohan. an excellent review of uh, 
repeated uh, two or more implantation failures, I would say. Uh, I, I myself have some uh, queries to put forward to you. Uh, uh, you quoted a Sunkara paper and a couple of yes. paper later. Uh, if I remember, uh, Paul Usos et al. also published on the cumulative live birth rate uh, following more number of pool sites you obtain and more the number of pool sites, obviously the cumulative live birth rate will go up. And probably that also made us go stronger and stronger on the stimulations. Uh, so suppose what we find, and I'm sure even that's your experience, that Posidon one is pretty common in our population. Uh, because unexpected, unexpected, you yourself, you would Ramaraju have presented that paper on uh, unexpected poor response in our population. So getting to that 15 magic number in a normal responder is such a, such a big task for us. And we try best to reach them. Then why not go full throttle? Yeah, so the problem here is we need to figure out what is the magic number to get the pregnancy and life birth that the patient wants. So I have dwelled on this and I asked people also, even Shesh, I ask you, what does this mean? So for me, the how we have interpreted it, it has just meant that I am a little more aggressive on deciding my dosing. So if earlier I was okay with 150, now I'm okay with 200. You know, there's a subtle shift towards a slightly higher dose. But that's the on-ground situation where normally I would have given a 150, I go for 200. Now, yesterday there was a chat on what is the highest dose and so on so there are two papers but i think the one was the bart paper which came early which showed but there were some flaws in it but they said that higher gonadotrophins and you'll have uh, more aneuploidy and so on but there was subsequently another paper which was quite large in number and they did not show the euploidy rates changing with higher gonadotrophins so essentially the pgta is a very good research tool You've come discovered a lot of new things because of that. It's not necessarily a good clinical tool. So I would say in on ground, it has helped. It has just made me a little more aggressive. I was mild stimulation, uh, you know, uh, proposing it earlier, but now I have slightly moved away. Even for poor responder, I would argue a slightly more, you know, um, aggressive stimulation. Yeah. Yeah. And the second thing is, uh, you nicely quoted about the modified natural cycles, and that's the way yeah. ahead because you get the best endometrium and the best yeah. pregnancy rate, the corpus luteum is there, etc. Now, uh, then why not go elective free solve for everybody when we understand that with any amount of stimulation, we are going to take supraphysiological high estrogen, and that is going to cause some problem with the endometrium, which has been proved enough by the endometrial gene st studies and everything. Then why not go elective and go modified natural for everybody? No, and because that strategy, first. see, the strategies need to be validated. Now, I will just look at two papers. One is Freezol versus Fresh. There are two papers uh, in NEGM. As far as I remember, one is in a PCOS group and one is in a non-PCOS group. In the non-PCOS group, there was no advantage of freeze-all versus fresh. The live birth rates were same for freeze-all versus fresh in a non-PCOS group. Whereas for a PCOS group, there was definitely safer because there are no HSS. Also, the live birth rate was higher in the frozen. So that's why I would be wary because on ground, freeze-all and modified natural for everybody is a nightmare, I would say, because you will have the patient coming in, then going back, you know, and, uh, you know, the logistics and thing. And I'm a little wary of the lab, uh, you know, adding in one more layer of manipulation. You know, please don't take this vitrification very lightly. You know, end of the day, you might have certain reports coming 10 years down the lane, which will show there's a problem. So I'm a little wary of adding more of in vitro manipulation. But that strategy needs to be validated. It's, so, it's somehow I feel when the NEGM paper talked about the PCOS and uh, the non-PCOS group. Yeah. Uh, in a non-PCOS group, we're going to have a lot of high responders. Yeah. Uh, who would have more than 10 follicles yielded. Let's call it simple definition. I, more I than 10 follicles. And still I feel the endometrium would be bad. So uh, do we go strict by the PCOS definition? of No. Academia? Yeah. So How that is where individualization it? comes. So I'm not very much into like cutoffs, ki, okay, 15, se jada hoga, then only I'll freeze and 14, I will transfer. No, you will have to. That's why evidence-based medicine is about evidence, clinical judgment, and patient values and preferences. It is not standalone 
evidence. So I take all these three parameters. If somebody has got 13 eggs or 12 eggs, she is thin BMI of 17 and her age of 23. This is a sure shot case who's going to go for a OHSS. If by definition you say, no, she's got less than 15, I could have simply missed those follicles. You know, so many times I'm, you know, I'm not able to take all the follicles. Couple of them are left behind just because the number. So we have to be circumspect about this, I would say. Yeah. And second, second one practical question is uh, a lot of people after doing laparoscopy, we don't see a, a classical hydrosalpings with the closure yeah. of the femoral line completely. And we could be seeing a, a pathological tube, which is a dilated tube, which is patent yeah. on either side. And many mm -hmm. times I've seen clinicians recommending removal of such tubes after one or two failures of IVF. Uh, is it really advisable? Because I, I think it's a medical legal disaster. It will be. Uh, if I'm the expert, I'm going to really make it because you can't go around doing, you know, this kind of presumptive, you know, uh, prophylactic measures, you know, knocking off the tubes and so on. So modified natural, what we do is, let's say first we document that the lady has got ovulatory cycles. So take your time. So that's why your initial evaluation should be quite good. I sometimes, if I have doubts about how the endometrium has behaved in the IVF cycle, I will call her on a mock drill. So call her on a day 13 or day 12 or so on and look at the endometrium pattern. Like I did yesterday before coming here, there was a lady who had some, you know, not so great endometrium and during natural, it was nice triple line with a nice follicle. Once you're sure about that, you call the patient next time. I call them around day six, day seven, and patiently track it. So typically for a modified natural, your cycle cancellation rate is around seven to eight percent. And you have to tell the patient you will be requiring to come repeatedly, unlike HRT cycle. From somewhere around 10 to 11 mm, I'll do a urinary LH. I'm not into too much of, you know, doing it twice and so on. You Because modified natural give you time to course correct. If you have missed an ovulation, you can always retrospectively calculate the date. That's the catch here. So once they are 10, 12, 13, 14, and by 15 to 16 mm, if you want to time it, because I'm not going for natural, I'm going for modified natural, you give the trigger. So I usually give around 16 mm and then plan. So if I give a trigger, let's say today, then I make it like an IVF cycle. So egg pickup is day after, and that's the day zero. And you can add progesterone. Progesterone supplementation can be started from the so-called day of egg pickup. Days, okay, that becomes a day zero, one, two, three. So on the fourth day of progesterone, I'll do a cleavage test transfer. On the sixth day of progesterone, I'll do a blastocyst transfer. So that's the way. And if you have doubts, you in the beginning stage, there's a learning curve. You can be a little more aggressive on doing a serum LH and P4. You know, so... It takes time because there are a lot of permutation and combinations. Like the other day, I did a, um, a electrozole stimulated FET. So at 4, 15 mm, I sent a urinary LH. It came weakly positive. Then I sent a uh, serum LH. It came at 16. Okay, so I still gave a trigger and went ahead. So it 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 is a learning curve, but you can get there. Remember that there is a margin of error you can get away with. The margin of error is at least 24 hours. So even if your calculation is wrong by one day, you will not really burn your fingers. Not so aggressive. I just add, you know, let's say micronized progesterone. That should be enough just for sake of it. Basically, you have taken off the estrogen from the, the previous HRT experience. See, if you're not happy with the endometrium, you put in a hysteroscope, you know, that's what. So I, I only told you what is clearly normal. What is gray area is something that the clinical call you'll have to take. If you're not happy about it, and sometimes what I do is I go ahead with a transfer with, let's say, average embryos and keep the best ones with me. It doesn't function. It doesn't work. Then I put in a hysteroscope, you know, see, because there are a lot of gray areas. Sometimes we are not convinced, but we have doubts. For every doubt, you start canceling your embryo transfer, the patient is going to run away. You know, so that's not the way it is. You know, you can't get black or white in uh, you know, clinical practice. So what I do is I immediately change the strategy. Suppose I have four embryos. I'll take a chance with not so the good embryos, put them in, see things don't work out, then the patient earns the hysteroscopy. You know?
if you are not happy with uh, endometrium and iui i am not too aggressive on doing things but you can always argue it out and put in a histoscope if you feel that you are missing something yeah excellent normally they say around 1 cm but in an ivf even let's say 7 to 8 mm you are going to remove it you know it's very difficult to convince other ways um see the largest see as long as that septum and everything whatever that it is not beyond 1 cm i'm okay with it but um um if you have an obvious septum diagnosed even subseptate i would say it is prudent to remove it uh, before an ivf excellent lot of good guidance uh, just your thoughts about ibc pixi and uh, of course the sperm preparation techniques uh, what does evidence say whether it is swinop no, pixi or... as far as i know as uh, the trial has not shown any benefit pixi uh, pixi okay uh, absolutely you know there is no this thing okay and what about imc uh, none of it is not it. shown any benefit it's just so laborious that the lab laboratory people has abandoned that as far as i know see the okay. thing is it is very difficult no matter what selection method you use to figure out the genetic competency of the sperm which you are going to inject see uh, what whatever these methods are max and everything else you will just get a slightly better cohort of sperms to select from but your guy can still pick up the aneuploid or the genetically incompetent sperm and inject it so you will never have that kind of you know uh, results that we are expecting to do that till you find a method to identify the sperm which you are going to inject whether that's okay or not so ixi is all about those 10 sperm that you are going to inject in 10 new sites so unless you have a mechanism to identify that it's not going to yield as far as i know but evidence says that probably it's no it's not shown to microfluids no. and all no no, no no evidence am i i think ashray this time i didn't go but i don't see anything no, coming up and between the uh, sperm preparation techniques spimum we go for density gradient no, no, for i agree but what does uh, see if it's a normal spermia if you want to go for a uh, you know swim up and all it's fine it's not something that cannot be done but uh, it is there is no clear advantage of one over another okay. ultimately it's about the skill of the embryologist which will play out yeah actually, thank you I, i feel from the sperm point of view we really don't know exact parameters which is a good sperm or which is the sperm which will give a better euploid embryo whatever you say it uh, the the information on sperm is quite very limited to us and that's why uh, we are just selecting what today as we understand what sperm is uh, probably if we know more about the p part of sperm or more about the middle middle piece more information as it flows into us by flow cytometric studies probably we have will have developed some selection method but till the time such information is available all men are good so you pick up a handsome sperm and then do an ixi no? that's it that's all we have not moved beyond that thank you i really don't look at the endometrium volume i just go for thickness and one more thing there's a big talk about this thin endometrium so i just want to quote this canadian study which actually got live birth rates at 5 mm around 15% so even if it is 7 mm so called definition of thin endometrium starts from there people get good live birth especially if it's a triple line so we just go by thickness and if it's anything beyond see we traditionally say 7.5 but as i said there a lot of inter inter other variation i might decide at 10 o'clock it is 7 and the next morning it might be 8 so overall as long as it's more it's a good triple line 6 7 mm don't worry too much about it i would say yeah okay when so we do a routine hysteroscopy many times we see a lateral wall thickening routine is like when we yeah. see a, a, a we want to assess the volume of the cavity or i don't really touch it because we really don't know what is normal and what is abnormal okay, okay. so i let the nature do the job you know we really are trying to that's what as i said once a surgeon is a surgeon you give him a knife you feel like cutting everything around that's why i'm so uh, you know this thing about putting a scope because then everything once you go and you feel like okay now that i have done it let me do this that 
not required. Yeah. Okay. Actually, it's so true. Abroad, people laugh at us that in India, lateral metroplasty is such a common intervention. And they literally laugh at us. And they tell us, Ki, you're creating infertility. Your doctors, you're going ahead and you're creating infertility. That's stupidly. And we, I see so many reports of even semen analysis. Count 55 million, 10% motility. Otherwise, karyotyping. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, we have gone berserk uh, from the point of view of having passive incomes. We have really gone berserk on advising our patients to very stupid things. So sometimes in a bad adenomyosis, whatever we do, we cannot get a triple layered endometrium. It is retroverted and it is curved back. So what to do in such cases? In Even in down-regulated HRT cycles. And do you consider blood flow of the endometrium or the, or the PI of the uterine arteries before planning your transfers? Both answering, trying to answer both the questions. Uh, when it comes to adenomyosis, probably you would have done a hysteroscopy because any reproductive disorder can have a bad endometrium. Okay, so let's say I assume that you have done a hysteroscopy and there is no hysteroscopic abnormality in the uterus. You are just getting an echogenic endometrium right. onto yes. the or isoic or echogenic yes. endometrium. If you have already done hysteroscopy, biopsy, everything, I wouldn't bother much because the studies are saying that the thickness is important from the pregnancy point of view. Echogenicity is okay. You can still transfer and you still have uh, a decent pregnancy rate. Now, how much to downregulate? So I was just reading this paper about uh, what it kept saying that you give Zoladex 3.62 milligram and then do a scan after 28 days. And if the anterior posterior diameter of the uterus is beyond seven centimeters, you give Zoladex one more and keep doing repeating this till fourth dose of Zoladex. But I'm sure Goody can share that he could have gone beyond four doses of Zoladex also. Obviously you won't get the uterus to normal but you will suppress it to whatever extent you can, the adenomyosis part, and then obviously you can prepare the endometrium. Overall, you must counsel the adenomyosis patient. Your pregnancy rates are going to be very, very low. Sadly for her and sadly for us, the surrogacy is gone away. Probably it comes in a proper way and then we'll be able to benefit these patients uh, again. Yeah, and so the Doppler part? <laughs> and the Doppler part. If you go by uh, Sonal Panchal study, let me quote that, because everybody does it because Sonal Panchal does it. She is a dedicated radiologist associated with the ART center. Hats off to that center because they have been able to have such great association for a long time. And they keep publishing studies after studies on the Doppler. And everybody thinks that we can uh, copy those studies. They have an E10 machine. Goody, you also have E6, I suppose. Yeah, they have an E10 uh, machine. It's a center of excellence recognized by GE, an electronic transvaginal probe. If you and me have to buy it, we have to invest 80 lakh of rupees. So we don't work on such machines. We work on machines which is 20 lakh rupees. Okay, right. so it does not give the same resolution what Dr. Sonal Panchal gives. Secondly, do you and me don't have time? You see probably 100 patients a day, I see about 10, but I don't have time to do so much like if you go to the materials and methods, wherein she has compared her paper with Kurza et al. paper, which is an IVF study, and hers is an IUI study. I'm not criticizing, I'm just telling you the fact which is there in the paper. And then she says the materials and methods that you do first sonography, then you do 3D sonography, then you do Doppler with adjusting the PRF, then you do vocal, then you do image rendering. Who has the time? Who has the time to do all these things? And then put the transfers, and then all of us say Doppler, Doppler. Okay. What Goody says is correct. It's colorful, nice, easy to balance. <laughs> That's my take. Criticism welcome. And so the last question was to, uh, the treatment you advise for chronic endometritis and how to diagnose it. Okay, it's a syndrome. It's a syndromic diagnosis. Uh, syndrome means it will have some clinical symptoms like you you are done, done an IU and suddenly the blood comes out. The IU was very smooth and the blood came out. The cervix appearing congested. You know, cervix may be tender. So these are some clinical criteria. Hysteroscopic criteria are stromal edemas, strawberry pattern, uh, then having micro polyps, etc. And the histopathological criteria of taking biopsy and doing the plasma cell and CD138 labeled plasma cells, more than five plasma cells which are CD138 positive, then that is uh, chronic endometritis. Ideally, you're supposed to take a small biopsy and send it for uh, uh, culture sensitivity. The culture sensitivity of the endometrium will never come as salmonella or something like that. It just says positive, negative, cocci, bacilli. So generally, a broad spectrum antibiotic works. The uh, Sicilian net, uh, network papers, they're advising ciprofloxacillin, 500 milligram twice a day for a period of 10 days. Then they say, go ahead and say, do one more biopsy. Till the time it is coming positive, three such events are welcome of giving antibiotic courses. That, but again, only one paper, one author consistently been presenting 
on Sicinelli Latori on the same story. Replication, they say, don't do anything. It's something an enigma, and we really so don't know whether it's your, your, your personal. Yeah, my personal take is I explained to my client, they could be chronic endometritis, and I have not evaluated you for that. But the papers are telling me to give you a broad spectrum antibiotic of 10 days. So let me take a chance and give you a broad spectrum antibiotic of 10 days. And then I give, uh, I'm going to cover that in my luteal support lecture. I prefer giving some vaginal probiotic. If you ask me why, it's nothing to do with chronic endometritis. It's more to do with, you have to standardize the absorption of progesterone from the vagina. And one of the reasons the vaginal progesterone may not get absorbed well is intercourse and in vaginal infections. So take care of the vaginal infections before you do embryo transfer. That's the way we do it. Thank you, sir. No indentation. Just down regulate and transfer. We are expecting too much. Yeah, we are expecting too much out of one transfer to give a pregnancy. Sir, it... how patients yourself and how patients the patient. So, uh, don't you think, Mohan? This this comes to uh, that we, we should start counseling patients that repeated cycles are needed to have a decent pregnancy rate. Yeah. And in that, two individuals, rather one cycle may not one and done is only good for probably some PCOS, but otherwise, the repeated cycles are needed. And uh, I get worried when I see adenomyoma, focal adenomyoma, more than adenomyosis. So if you have those cases with, you know, a four centimeter posterior wall and the uterus is kind of retroverted and it's all stuck, these cases will particularly give you a tough time. Yeah. And you, I, I immediately guarded prognosis that is. And all you can do is probably a downregulated uh, FET for them. And that's all it's you a, can do. And the other sorry. issue of the triple line in uh, adenomyosis and adenomyoma, it's more of a technical reason we are not able to get the right plane. So I don't really read too much. We just write their angle issues and shut there, you know. As long as it's not looking really pathological, we are fine with it. You keep on struggling because the uterus is deviated. You don't get that cut, you know, what you want. So that's much fine. Three, four, it's fine. Three has come in gynecology. Yeah. <laughs> Everything was three months. Menorrhagia, three months. Sir, in adenomyosis, what is the take of letrozole, sir? Do you add letrozole for down regulation? One, one minute. There are two questions going on. Let, let us complete. What about question. the role of letrozole for uh, the down regulation in adenomyosis? Compared to the Lupride? Uh, it's basically just picked up on pain relief. I would not uh, advise letrozole for our IVF purpose. It is now being looked at as a... Um, treatment for severe pain relief and stuff with OCPIL combination. Uh, and there are some studies which are coming up. I know one of the Indian groups also is looking at it very closely. But I would not look that far of trying to downregulate with that. Also. Actually, I've come across one study uh, wherein uh, they have given uh, one group has been given GNRH agonist along depot preparation for two to three months. And the other group, they gave GNRH agonist depot preparation with letrozole for all that time. And they looked at the integrin levels and they said that letrozole uh, looks after the aromatase activity even in the endometriotic deposits or utopic endometrium and gets the estrogen secretion down from those uh, places as well. And they did the integrin studies and there, are, in spite of three doses or four doses of GNRH agonist, uh, there are some women who have endometrium integrin defect and that would get corrected if letrozole is added to that and that they noted very nicely on the uh, study. Uh, but uh, the problem is, uh, we will look at the study and start practicing. You know, the rabbit goes much ahead than the tortoise, and that's the way it is. The clinical practice moves way ahead till the evidence is produced. But how to select, how to know without doing an integrin level? I really don't know that because that test is not available to us. One more question to Dr. Kamath. Uh, fantastic presentation, sir. Thank you. Uh, in modified uh, natural cycle, most of the time we get a good uh, follicle and an endometrial pattern. But in some cases, the follicle is stuck at 14 mm, but endometrium goes till 8 mm triple line. So what is your take on that? I don't know. It's very unusual for me to have a natural cycle which is stuck at 14. I know that would be some pathological. I won't. Otherwise, for us, it's a growing trajectory. You should get where you normally get in natural cycle. No, I have not seen I, cases. I, I, like I'll, that. I'll answer that. So there's, and if you look at nature, there's a lag. And uh, so there's a lag between endometrium and uh, uh, follicle. So uh, post-ovulation, the trilaminar endometrium continues for three days. 
Yeah. Uh, the endometrium picks up later. So uh, if you're going by the follicle, go by the follicle. Mm -hmm. If you're going to look at the endometrium and then decide uh, why the follicle has stopped, it's, it's going to tell your story three days later. Uh, so you're chasing the wrong uh, aspect. The endometrium always comes later. So if you look at trilamina to progression, it's a three-day process. Yep. Both are fine. Both are I keep fine. both of them happy. <laughs> For this microbiota and stuff, microbiomes and it's all in the realms of uh, you know research right now in fact right just now i know that there's a call for this research so i would not even look at that right now see it's a long progression from basic study research to clinical so we have not gone there so i won't even look at it right now thank you yeah. Yeah. sir um, sorry sir uh, so last question in the modified natural modified natural cycle before giving the trigger like you have said ki you test either the urinary LH or serum progesterone. If you want to play it safe, you go serum LH and progesterone. That's fine. So serum LH. 15, values, less than 15. It should be 15. Less than 15. Less uh, you than don't, 15. And progesterone should not have gone beyond 1.5 1, 1. nanograms. Then we can give the trigger. That means that there's no LH surge. You, it is safe to conclude and you go ahead and give the trigger. Okay, so but then, even if there is a borderline, let's say 16 LH, and progesterone is low, you can still go ahead and give the trigger. You will not really have any, any problems. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. One last question. Uh, in a down-regulated uh, uh, transfer, uh, uh, frozen ET, many times we come, up, uh, come across uh, cases where you find suddenly find an endometrial collection before transfer. Thin line of uh, uh, tiny collection in the endometrial cavity. And uh, once you cancel for that, and again, it keeps on coming repeatedly in few patients. So what do you do in this? Situation? See that um, sometimes the estrogen that is given can lead to minimal collection. Uh, but if it is persistent, like what I do is I go back and see in a natural cycle. If you don't have collection in a natural cycle, you go ahead in natural cycle. But if it is persistent in all around, then you have to investigate. Is there an occult hydrosulfing sitting there or do a hysteroscopy and things like that? But most of the times, if it's a persistent, it's a different thing. It's just a one-off thing. You back off and then you have a look in the natural cycle. And if it works well, you go for a natural cycle rather than give an estrogen. That's the way I would. I think you, we have a great belief that medications solve all problems. They don't. Um, uh, equally, as you said, with surgeons, I think uh, uh, metroplasty, I think it's the craziest operation to do uh, because a surgeon to do metroplasty never follow up uh, their patients. And uh, let's take a religious view to it. What is God created cannot be matched by man. So if you're going to cut a uterus that has never fa faced a pregnancy, uh, I get very scared. Uh, I have seen a lot of adhesions inside, uh, bad uh, surgery, and you can't predict it. And even with a septate uterus, I say, well, there is no evidence that septate uterus causes infertility. So why take the risk? Give it a chance. And I think you have that open discussion with your patients that, yes, a septate uterus can cause miscarriage, but I can do a surgery, I can ruin that uterus, and then I'll make you forever infertile. Uh, so I, I don't even, irrespective of muscular septum, I don't uh, treat it if they are infertile. Uh, I, 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 believe, I, I believe in my divinity, which basically means that uh, there, God has many fallacies, and you see that in nature. And then, uh, then you can go ahead and do it. See, you have to decide what is right for the patient. If you believe that you can treat somebody and cure it, I believe that you cannot surgically treat a T-shaped uterus adequately. So how do you know if there's no other reason? I, I, I'm not. You tell us first how you diagnose T-shaped uterus and then we will analyze whether that is a proper diagnosis. If it is not, forget about it. Let's, you know. So. 
So, so there is HSG is not an investigation to do. Yeah. Yeah. Many reasons and two to three HSGs for the patient every time it was like that at some other center and a repeat one as well. And that patient after correction with a lateral metroplasty, sir, conceived cesarean, everything normal. Congratulations, madam. But that's what it ranks because I, I still yet to get a patient who has undergone three HSGs. No, so that itself is an anecdote and that itself is a very roaming, uh, Let's not go much discuss into those things. You know, Peter Medever, the father of reproductive immunology said that you give a useless treatment to somebody. He did not use the word useless, I modified it. Give a useless treatment to a lady and achieve a pregnancy. No reasoning whatsoever can convince her and her doctor that this was a useless therapy. That is what we are discussing. So Anil, uh, Dr. Anil Kudi will go with uh, his the presentation on stimulation for poor ovarian cancer patients. Uh, uh, see, I, I stand, you know, I've got a, a huge amount of respect for researchers because uh, researchers will uh, try and get you an answer, but it's not that they always give you answers uh, because at the end, it is what data comes up ahead with you. Now, uh, one of the sad features of uh, research is that if you are an unknown entity, let's say you are in uh, Bangladesh and you want to produce a good paper and you have the right methodology, you'll find it incredibly difficult to getting it published, isn't it right? And uh, so as, as much as there is a clinical nexus, that means there'll be doctors and senior doctors who come at every conferences and tell you the same story. There's also a group of researchers who are in the West who are uh, very much a nexus uh, and will also tell you a story. So trying to break into this nexus is difficult. And many of them are European and American. And so what are the Chinese been doing? They're trying to break into the system. You're, and you'll find it difficult until you get your own data uh, and have that fight. It will take years and years. So when we say that uh, there is no evidence, we'll say, see, at present, there are flaws in uh, the way we look at uh, research. And you collect the data and you say, well, there is no evidence there. But it doesn't mean that those treatments don't work for a small proportion of patients. And they will work. So, and I say, um, you know, I don't know how many of you all know a gesture called Tenali Raman. Ever heard of him? No, he was a jester in a, an Indian court years ago. And, and if you read his works, he says, who tells you the truth? The jester. So in, a, in the world, the joker tells you the truth. And Carl Jung also said that. Carl Jung said, who speaks the truth in the world? The person who jokes. So you know, when a government decides I'm going to ban cartoonists, it's wrong because a cartoonist's job is to tell you the truth. If you're a joker, you're a joker. Politicians are jokers. And if a cartoonist tells you, he's a joker. The same way, uh, science also progresses because of those jokers. And who are those jokers? Kurt Sem was referred to a psychiatric unit. Why? Because he was doing laparoscopic surgery. He was called mad. And that is jokers. You, you're pushing science. So while you're looking at immune therapy, you're looking at ERA, you're looking at PGTA. We don't have the answer yet, but that is how science progresses. You, you have somebody who pushes the boundaries, but to make it into a general way of uh, giving treatment, giving a worldwide treatment, research has to give an answer, which is open and say, is it worthwhile to do it? So, I know the policies of PGTA. Do I do it? Yes, I do it. Why? Because I want some answers. I, I see women with three failed cycles, four failed cycles in their 30s. And this is probably their last attempt. And they want a closure. It is easier. For example, let's put it this way. You, a woman has a miscarriage. Uh, and some women opt for genetic assessment. Why do they do a genetic assessment? It is easy for a couple to accept that I miscarried a genetically abnormal embryo. So it means that this embryo is never going to implant. You know, it's never going to give me a healthy baby. Acceptance is more important sometimes. And sadness is, you know, uh, 
is it's e easier to accept to accept sadness and uh, tragedy and find reason in it because that's how we are humans you know we somebody dies uh, you can look at it from a research point of view and say every day 100000 people die so why are you crying death is certain because the gita said that death is certain so you should be happy no we are sad because that's the way we accept sadness and the same thing what is the biggest complication of ivf is failure it is sadness and you, a large majority of patients in your care will be sad will be you know psychologically damaged their relationships will be heading towards a breakdown and why does that happen it's it's you know all you have to give them some support and what forms of support do you give and that is what we have to build towards it and i know the first thing i tell my patients is they'll say what can go wrong with ivf i say to it, it won't work and people say sorry i said yes that is the biggest complication and i i call it the boxing match you know and it's truly a boxing match i say if you want to uh how is it i said it's like a boxing match it has 10 rounds so you remember that you may need to get, you may be punched out each time in 10 rounds so do you have the strength to come up and fight another battle and she says no then i'll say have a rethink about what treatment you can go for uh, and so the same thing happens if somebody says i can't do more than one punch or i i'll go i just can't bear with it and i'll say okay go all guns go for uh, freezing go for pgta go for ira go for microbiome assessment and then if it doesn't work i have tried everything so if, if you see it is a negotiation which you reach again giving the patient the right amount of advice so let's go up to the most difficult subject uh, now uh, i think uh, uh, people say you know do you look at microbial uh, microbiomes um, my gut feeling is that there is something there which we haven't yet found out are infections increasing the answer is yes are men and women getting more promiscuous the answer is yes and something is going to change you know uh, so uh, are there endometrial infections the answer is yes they are uh, do you know them we don't it's huge don't see other videos on the Okay, sir. 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 okay okay so uh, let's go to the most difficult subject of how to treat a poor responders and uh, i'll try and share some concepts i use some of them in my private practice i see a lot of women with low amh so that's why i'm a bit skeptical about amh as a uh, tool i believe that uh, the younger the woman the better the chance that she'll get for a pregnancy Uh, but i'll share some of my experiences and uh, what i have done in the past few years and uh, where i have co i've constructed a, a certain amount of thinking so can poor responders be treated effectively so if you have a look at the number of treatments available there are multiple number of treatments there are close to 20 to 25 different protocols for poor responders 
as soon as you have so many protocols for poor responders, then for any treatment, you just don't know the answer because you're facing a difficulty. Now, if you look at techniques, for mild stimulation, natural pre-genetic screening, and yet you don't have an answer because it is difficult. You've tried all this and it's still not working. Now, let's go for some treatments. Now, I think the, the most intelligent man in the world is uh, Norbert Gleischer. I have got a, a huge amount of respect for him. Why? Because, you know, it is easy to convince people, a few people, but to convince a huge number of people over a long period of time on a very small bit of data, you could either be God or a great scientist. And that's what he is. And, and have a look at it. It is repetitive because we believe what he says. Okay, he's talked about DHEA based on 25 patients. He's spoken about growth hormone. Okay, he's spoken about GCSF. And all these interventions have come up because he has spoken it. And if you look at his studies, there are 20 cases, 25 cases. But the amount of people who are using it is huge. But equally, have a look at his uh, push towards putting back genetically abnormal embryos, mosaic embryos. Now, who does it? He's the only person doing it in the United States. So he's also pushing science to a certain extent. So in fact, I read all his papers because I can understand where he, is, he's, he can convince you with that small amount of data. But again, when he did this trial, small number of patients had to stop the trial because everyone wanted to take DHEA. Then you looked at testosterone implants, and there are many papers which come here and there, and again, that does not work. Uh, do you use letrozole, microdose, and again, that does not work. Do you use LH in ovarian stimulation, and the logic is better oocytes. Do you increase the FSH dose, aspirin, Vigra? Again, they don't seem to work. Uh, again, they've looked at using clomiphene for poor responders. Does it work? The answer is no, it doesn't work. Uh, again, growth hormone, it's coming back again. Um, uh, the last time I looked at growth hormone, my patients increased their height by one centimeter. But I think eventually, we'll, uh, by the time we end up using growth hormone, you know, uh, the endocrinologists are, are completely uh, surprised by the amount of growth hormone that people use. Now, there's a clinic in the United Kingdom where everyone gets growth hormone. It gets phenomenally good results but everyone gets growth hormone. And I can't understand. The only thing I know is that if you look at growth hormone, look at who says growth hormone works. It's again, no, but Gleischer, a genius is back. But what does he say? He says that if the IGF-1 is low, then growth hormone works. Then majority of people do not do IGF-1. So even if you want to believe what he says, then start doing IGF-1. So if you don't want to do it, then, well, you're just using it because you feel it works. And then they come to natural IVF. And I think uh, natural IVF, I, I tell my patients, I said natural IVF is a very good business deal where you pay me money for what you can do at home. So I tell my patients, I can give you a better idea, a better plan, and it make you happy. I said, take your wife out for dinner spend it on good wine, good food, come back, have sex, that costs you 500 pounds. The success rate is exactly the same. Or you give me 4,500 pounds and I'll do natural IVF. And I think it's a fair discussion. That helps me to pay my children's school fees. The other gives you a good deal. So if you look at, so they looked at the entire data in the UK of natural IVF. People said, natural IVF works. Okay, let's look at the data. The live birth rate was 4%. So hang on, is it worth doing it? It's the same success rate you get trying to have some you know, joy at home. So let's come to one, let's believe in certain things. Is oocyte quality and age is beyond repair. You cannot change oocyte quality. Okay, that's it. ASRM says there's a provision of futile treatment, which is yet not just uh, ethically justified. And in real terms, there's no effective treatment for a poor responder. Uh, but let's see if we can change it. There's one certain treatment. 
one treatment that can work 100%, and that is if you can lower female age. So if you have some technique in which you can try and make a woman younger, sorry, ovaries younger, women never grow old. So let me correct myself. <laughs> ovaries grow old. So if you can change that, then maybe you can look for results. But surprisingly, no one can change time. If you look at uh, our ancient works, even God cannot change time. So uh, very much it is in a fix. But as Mohan said, can we get more eggs? So let's take the first step and say, uh, can we end up getting more eggs? And what we know, and this is from a very old paper, the more embryos you implant, the better is the chance of pregnancy. And this is from Templeton years ago, and it still holds true that you get more embryos. And again, uh, Mohan presented this paper of Shunkara where you say, well, again, if you can get around 15 eggs, the chance of pregnancy is the maximum. And I think beyond that is not worthwhile. And that's what he showed in a paper. But if you have a look at it, and it's, 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 it's quite a good way to look at it. If you see that in younger women, you, those same batch of eggs will give you a higher chance of pregnancy. And by the time you get to 40, you're looking at a low chance of pregnancy. Do whatever, whatever you want. Do irrespective of how many eggs you get. So if you don't know what to do, I think you take a step back and you say, let's start classifying poor responders. So initially they go into the Bologna criteria. I think it's very much we have um, abandoned it. Uh, and the reason why we abandoned it is there's no difference from a young poor responder and an old poor responder um, to a certain extent. So it's not a protocol that really helps us. So then you come to the uh, you know, uh, Poseidon group and the Poseidon group uh, is I think quite a nice way of trying to understand. I don't think we've got yet to all the, the possible variations, but the Poseidon group gives you an idea. I'll, I'll use a simpler word. So let's look at this way. Is, which is your best group of patients? And this is Poseidon group one. And what is Poseidon group one? It is a woman with a decent AMH who is young and you had, who is a poor responder, which means that on the surface, that's your patient where you can do something different next time. And so num group number two is the same, but is older. Group number three is somebody who is young and has a low reserve. And group number four is again, old and has a low reserve. So uh, what does it tell you is that if you have somebody in group number four, whatever treatment you do, it is going to be less effective. Group number one, you need to seriously have a look at your protocols because that can change. Group number two, you can change the protocol, get more eggs, but age is not on a sign. And group number three is where we'll talk about today, uh, mainly because these are women who are young, who've got a low reserve, and who may produce less number of, who have got a low antral follicle count. If you have a look at that. So it divided into A and B, and that's based on antral follicle counts. So, uh, here the antral follicles are low, AMH is low, here AMH is good, and the antral follicle counts may vary or oocytes may vary. So that oocytes is more of a retrospective. So let's look at this and say, so what is Poseidon? So it's like, um, uh, so in the West, if you want to sound very intelligent, you use Latin words. In India, if you want to sound very intelligent, you should use Sanskrit words. So, you know, you suddenly think, gosh, what an intelligent human being. So the same thing, what the um, uh, Europeans do. So group one and group two underwent stimulation leading to impaired ovarian response. So they got divided into group one A and two A, and it's based on number of oocytes. Group one B and two B, it's again based on oocytes, more oocytes. The difference between group one and two is age, and group two patients will need more oocytes to get one euploid embryo. Group, group three and four is again, as I said, age dependent. Group three is young women with low reserve. Group four is old women with low reserve. So what challenges come with Poseidon? One is 
it allows us to fine tune poor responders. And the reason I think it's worth looking at, at this is because you need some way of trying to, uh, you know, categorize patients and trying to uh, see which treatment model would work and also give, give a better idea to patients you know, and say, you know, I can do something different or this treatment is going to be quite hopeless. It aims for a better collection of data. And, and, and that's very important because everyone says I can do magic with poor responders. How? There is no data and you see anecdotal studies. So if you classify everything in one go, maybe you are, you are a clinician who can do brilliant in group four. Maybe that could be possible, but collect that data in Poseidon Group and that will allow us to plan future strategies. Again, what are the drawbacks with Poseidon? It doesn't tell you which protocol is the best. It will give us a better platform to collect data and analyze the best treatment. And you know what I, uh, I tend to do is there is a, the, the Poseidon Group has a website uh, and it's, uh, the reason why it's good is not because it has good papers, you can get those papers anywhere, but it gives you a probability of a live birth rate. It's a calculator. And the reason why uh, I use that is uh, because it tells patients, I go on the calculator and say, hang on, this is done by the top scientists of the world. It's a calculator based on all the data that we have. And it will tell you how many embryos do you need to get, to get you to, a good chance of pregnancy. And it's scary because I showed it to a, a 44 year old woman who says, I believe in God. And I said, sadly, God doesn't believe in you. Uh, and when we looked at, when we put into a calculator, she, she needed 25 blastocysts to get one normal embryo. And she said, well, then it's not going to work. I said, and very unlikely it's going to work. So what you're doing is you are giving more information rather than giving information if I tell her, I said, it's not going to work, she'll go to Sachin. Sachin will say, mm, it may work, it's very low, but um, uh, then she'll go to Mohan. Mohan will say, well, uh, the research says that there's a 5% chance, so he's given a figure. So he'll say, yeah, let's go to 5%. But what this tells us is it will give you, say, hang on, this is the data across the world, which tells you that be either be prepared for multiple rounds of treatment or think of opting out early. And that's a discussion we want to have. See, uh, I, when women want to, uh, you know, wait till the end, their late thirties, that's not a choice I made. That's the choice you made. You took that choice. You took a choice of having children later, and th that comes with challenges. So equally, be prepared to take up the challenges that science may not be helpful. So. People started looking at uh, different studies and looked at uh, you know, cumulative pregnancy rates. And this was quite a complex study and they looked at it from an optimistic and a conservative way of predicting success. Um, and I won't go through it, it's so complex. But what it tells us is, it tells us that the, there's a primary role of age. And that is, age is the only thing that links to oocyte quality. Younger low prognosis patients, good quality of oocytes, and quantitative parameters and older low prognosis uh, patients uh, will have lesser eggs. So now we'll say, if I tell you there's nothing we can do, then we'll say, then what have you taught us? So we'll say, let's look at the various strategies which may work. So what is your aim? Your aim is to one, to get the shortest time of live births with the lowest risk of complications. And so uh, what is the biggest complication of IVF? It's failure. It is the psychological impact. So you want to see what can you do to get to a pregnancy the fastest. So if you look at poor ovarian reserve, it fluctuates. It fluctuates from 5.6 to 35.1%. And what's wrong in these patients? Reduced number of follicles, reduced granular cell function, and reduce the number of follicles responding to FSH. Some cases, there is a low response with a good reserve patients. Possible genetic polymorphism. You know, I, I don't, don't talk about this because it's so damn confusing. That, you know, uh, I attended a lecture uh, on polymorphism a few years ago, and I didn't understand a word of it. 
And I, I doubt if even the people doing research understood what they were talking about quite often. But it's, it's, it's something that complex, but somewhere, you know, that, that, that's the way science is progressing. And poor ovarian reserve does not have a single cause. So one is a classic of poor ovarian reserve, and that's a low reserve, low anterior follicle count, and a, low, low, you know, and a poor response. And, and that's something which you would be able to say very clearly that you are going to respond badly. You know, which group? Group three and group four Poseidon. There, everything is low. So the AMH is low, the anterior follicle count is low. Other is a hyporesponder where the ovarian reserve is normal. There's an unexpected suboptimal response and there's a low follicle output rate. And we'll come to that. So you, you look at a poor responder, low AMH, low AFC and age, and a poor response is inadequate simulation and probably inadequate to break the threshold. And it just may not be due to inadequate FSH levels. Poor respond is a problem often lies within the antral follicle. There's decreased sensitivity to FSH. FSH stimulates follicular growth by binding to receptor and granular cells. And there seems to be an FSH receptor problem. So, and you see that, you see that in older women. You stimulate the ovaries, the estrogen levels don't rise very high. It's because there is defective granular cell function. So the first thing is what, you should try and avoid. Should you downregulate a poor responder? And the answer is probably don't. Uh, all that it does is it reduces the anterior follicle count and there's, you do not assess the anterior follicle count very well. So can you change the destiny of the anterior follicle? It's time to start thinking of different protocols. What we do know is that follicle recruitment is is a constant phenomena. It's not a follicular phase phenomena. The peak of anterior follicle varies. And in poor responders, the pool of recruited anterior follicles also varies. So it's important to know when to stimulate. So I'll, I'll explain that concept different. So if you have a look at this, and I think Sachin uh, explained this in the uh, first lecture. So women tend to have two or three follicular recruitment waves, which means that, uh, uh, you know, if you want to learn about this better, you, I do a lot of follicle trackings. I, 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 I don't say I've got a lot of time, but I've got a, a, a lot lesser patients than uh, what you all handle. And I see all my patients from the first scan to the embryo transfer. So it's a, it's a, I, I run a, a phenomenally personalized practice and I give them a lot of time. So I, sometimes I scan women right through every seven to 10 days. And what you see is, and it's true, you see follicle counts, anterior follicle counts changing. Why? Because that's how women are. Uh, so if you look at research, and this is quite old research, that women can either have a continuous recruitment or a single phase recruitment. Now, I think, and I may be wrong, that women, when they are young, have a continuous recruitment. When women recruit all the time, as women get old, their recruitment stops and it gets slower and they go into a single recruitment episode, which means they recruit only once. And I think it varies. Now, what you have to understand is, and again, I'll basically tell you, do this if you have the time and the inclination. If you don't have it, then uh, don't think of doing all these starts. And also, you can't do this if you're batching. So if you're batching uh, your cycles, please send them somewhere else because it, it, you, you just cannot treat these patients if effectively, the small group of patients. So second, again, this is for poor responders, is which is the best recruitment window? Often it is the late luteal phase. Is it always so? The answer is no. And that can vary. It can vary from cycle to cycle. I think of stimulation. Now let's go back a step further. And again, let's look at the evidence. So how many blastocysts are needed to get one euploid embryo? And this was from about 13,000 uh, biopsies. At the age of 35, it is about a 25% rate. So you've got four blastocysts. By the time somebody reaches 45, you need 29 blastocysts to create a euploid embryo. Um, how many cycles would that need? 30 cycles? Who knows? So if you see, it keeps on getting more and more difficult. And if you again look at another study, and this, they looked at how many 
oocytes were needed to get one euploid embryos. And people are trying to get this data out. The reason is because it helps you to counsel better. And under 35, eight embryos will give you one oocyte. And why is it important? People will say, I want egg freezing. I want to postpone my fertility. And I say, do you know how many eggs are needed to get, give you a, get you a baby? And they'll say, um, maybe one cycle. I say, no, you may have even 20 eggs and a chance of having a live birth rate does not exceed 50% for young women. And how do you know that data? You know that data from looking at euploidy rate. Do all euploid embryos implant? No. They don't, they still have a failure rate of around close to 40%. So in young women, about eight eggs as you get older, but when you reach your forties and that's Western data. So take five years off this data when you're looking at Indian women and you look at 17 oocytes. Do 40 year olds get 17 oocytes? No. So which means that to collect these eggs you may end up having two or three rounds of treatment and again, at the age of 40, what is the chance of a euploid embryo implanting? 35 to 40%, which means that even euploid embryos are age related as they decline their chance of pregnancy. So can you get more oocytes? The answer is yes, you can try. So uh, let's have a look at some other systems. So there are two markers. One is called follicle output rate. And why is this important is this allows you to have a rethink about your protocol. So one is called FOLD, follicular output rate. So let's have a look at it from a, a simple method. So you scan somebody and that's at the start of stimulation, not two months ago, not when you decide to downregulate, not when you decide to give the oral contraceptive pill or you, when you decide to give Proganova. So the day you start stimulation, look at the antral follicle and then see how many follicles have been recruited. And that is FOLD. So if you see, 10 antral follicles and three follicles get recruited with stimulation, that is a poor output rate. If you see eight follicles and four or five get recruited, that is a good output rate. And that is key. So you cannot get more eggs if you recruit less follicles. So if you have a poor fort, you have to look at what is it that happened that made me that got only four follicles to recruit. What is the commonest cause? Age. As women age, many of these follicles just don't respond. So you're going to have a lower follicle output rate depending on age. The other is follicle to oocyte index, which means the number of follicles and the number of oocytes that you get at the end. And again, that also tells you about competency of follicles. So you've got two measurements, one which is telling you how is the ovary recruiting and advancing its follicles? Second, it's telling you how many of these follicles are going to be empty. Uh, and both will give you an idea. Now, why does hyporesponse occur? A lot of reasons. Uh, it could be a low gonadotrophin dose. There could be genetic problems. There could be environment problems. And we don't have a single cause. We will say it's just a dose. No, I think there's a lot happening in the world from food to uh, environment to pollutants that are having an impact. And the same thing is happening with sperm. You know, people say that uh, uh, we can change sperm counts. I don't think we can. I think we, have, we are going through uh, a decline in fertility and we are going through a decline in fertility because that is how nature tries to control. We humans have messed up with nature quite a lot. We may think we are the most important people in the world. And the answer is in nature, we are not. And nature will balance itself. And if you see fertility rates are dropping. You know, what is Indian fertility? I think it's 1.7678%. 7, and I read this report that said that in 100 years, the Indian population will shrink by, by 50 crore people. And that's scary. That's phenomenally scary. It's scary for you and me because we'll be old and there'll be nobody to look after us. Uh, and that's a selfish desire, isn't it? But that, that's a fact. And nobody to pay for our pension. And that's the thing I worry about in the, in the UK is if uh, fertility rates drop, then who will pay my old age pension? You know, the funny thing is uh, uh, in here, you can collect your money and you can uh, hang on and give it. In the UK that if you have uh, houses, the government takes 30% as inheritance tax. Uh, so the, the government takes, even when you die, that government takes your money. 
And uh, you know, as uh, economies get better, and uh, this is my advice to you, this is non-IVF advice, this is economic advice I'll give to you, is uh, uh, as, you know, take some advice because inheritance tax will come to India. And the reason why they come to India is government needs more money. And who will they touch? They'll touch people who've got property. So it's a matter of time when all these things will come. So you know, start planning for the future because you'll get to 80 and you realize that government has taken 50% of your house anyway. Uh, and then you, you know, government doesn't li uh, listen to people who uh, are educated because the educated don't vote. So the options of treatment. The options of treatment could be dual stimulation. Uh, everyone gets excited with dual stimulation. I've stopped doing it. I think it is madness. I, I'll put it as it's sheer madness. But I'll explain to you why it is madness. I'll tell you how to do it also. If you want to do it, then go ahead and do it. Luteal phase stimulation. I do a lot of luteal phase stimulation. And my favorite is random start. It is brilliant for private practice. Because see, patient comes to you. Patient says, when can you start treatment? You will say, day one of your period will start treatment. You will say, I'll put you on the uh, Proganova. And in a week, you'll start treatment. I'll say, today. Pay the money and start. Fantastic. You see, what a wonderful doctor this is. That is random start. And I'll, I'll try and explain to you how can you do random start on poor responders. So luteus phase stimulation, does it work? And when do you start stimulation? You start stimulation in the luteal phase whenever the antral follicle count is the best. The luteal phase has the broadest or the maximum recruitment window. And the reason is because the FSH and LH levels are their lowest. Exactly what happens with a long protocol. And that give, may, gives you an opportunity to stimulate. So what, I, what sometimes happens is you scan somebody on day 24, 25, and you see a dying corpus luteum. And then you end up seeing uh, about 10, 12 follicles. And then you say, okay, wait till your period comes. By the time the period starts, those follicles have disappeared. So if there's a poor responder and you scan someone, you cannot give a guarantee that these follicles will get recruited. Remember, the fort changes and the fort is important, but for that you require more antral follicles. You can't have four follicles and ask for eight eggs. They, it won't come. So if you see that, I'll say start stimulating them. And the evidence is there from cancer patients that random start, luteal phase start, do work. So they, uh, there were studies that compared random and poor responders, looked at uh, follicular phase start, luteal phase start, and random starts. And very much the su success rates were very, very similar. And the, if you look at that's a random start, again, a, de a decent chance of pregnancy. And this was for egg donors, where they complained at day 15 start, to a day 18. So what they were testing is, does it affect USAID quality? If you start a random study, and this is no, USAID quality is maintained whatever you do. And that is again in young patients. So let's go to dual stimulation. Dual stimulation is to stimulate in the follicular phase, stimulate in the luteal phase. The concept is don't give HCG for the first tech collection because HCG will uh, you know, luteinize all follicles. And uh, it teaches us that follicles are constantly recruited. In poor responders, some follicles may be better than both stages. Don't drain follicles. Leave the small follicles at a collection and always use the analog trigger for your first uh, collection. And the luteal phase stimulation has been used in cancer patients. So there's been a huge controversy by calling this a luteal phase stimulation because it's not really a luteal phase. This is <clears throat> luteal phase stimulation is different. Luteal phase stimulation is when you stimulate in the luteal phase. A dual stimulation is a two phase stimulation where you are not stimulating in the, the late luteal phase. And it's called the Shanghai protocol. I know it's, uh, and uh, what he, have a look at this, you know, he, he presented this in Eshre and uh, uh, I think I attended his, his talk and it was, uh, you know, people laughed at it, but a lot of people are following it now. And what they did is they started stimulation with clomiphene, letrozole, and HMG. 
and they did one egg collection. But what they used for the first egg collection is they used gene RH analog. The reason is you use HCG and all the small follicles will go. Uh, they'll get luteinized. And then they waited for a day or two and then restarted stimulation and uh, then decided to uh, give a trigger. And then you, you can go on and on doing it. Uh, and he had fantastic results. The problem is nobody has been able to replicate those results. Now, the way uh, you, know, you can uh, adapt the protocol is you, uh, if I say that by doing my technique, you can get a 90% result. Uh, and if 10 of you use the same protocol and can't get it, that means either I'm a magician or I'm lying. It could be only two things. So you have to, I may not like that answer, but that's the truth. And people have not been able to get these results. So we don't know is, you know, is he a magician? I am willing to accept, you know, there, we have many magicians uh, around and I think I can go to some conferences and I see a lot of magicians. You know, I, I went years ago, I, I came when I was a new consultant, uh, um, drug company said, oh, come, will you come and talk to some doctors? And I said, yeah, 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 I will, I will. I came with my old boss called Richard Howell. And I, I went to this meeting and I thought they were all new doctors. And who was sitting there? Almost everyone of Bombay uh, who were at the top. And there were, uh, there were people who had taught me. And uh, as uh, my colleague asked her, uh, you know, what are your results? And they started from 85%. And then, um, and it ended at 92%. And then the person who said the results were 85% said, Oh, I'll correct myself because he realized that he was at his lowest. He said, no, no, I'll correct myself. It's, it's a bit higher. And he says, gosh, our results are at 30%. And we're trying to teach people whose results are at 80%. So I, uh, what I said is they were not telling false. I saw about 20 magicians. And I'm a, I'm a clinician. I'm not a magician. So uh, I, that's how I normally tell people who say they've got fantastic results. So um, again, if I... Uh, I love drawing. I'm not a great artist, but I love drawing. So what it tells us is you start the stimulation and day 14, you give a trigger and you see three large follicles and you see small number of follicles. That's the only place where I think a dual stimulation may work, that you see follicles on the day of trigger. And if that happens, you drain the big follicles and then you go ahead and start stimulating again. Now, what we know is that whether you give clomiphene in the follicular phase or in the luteal phase, it seems to have the same impact on the pituitary. Also, the advantage of stimulating in the luteal phase is that the LH surge does not occur in luteal phase stimulation. Uh, and we know that. So you can delay the antagonist very late. And again, I don't know why that the whilst you can uh, trigger the pituitary with analog in the luteal phase, so you can see, see an LH rise, a spontaneous LH rise does not occur. Um, and I, I don't know that somebody will, uh, yeah, some clever person will write a review and I, I enjoy those reviews. I think uh, recently, you know, yesterday, uh, there was a, somebody presented a paper, I think uh, you presented a paper. I think on FSH quantitative, uh, uh, it's such a good paper. Uh, and I've read it twice and it's still not entering my head very, very easily. So I'm going to spend some of those papers and uh, that's good. And in, I was just reading now that in today's human reproduction, this week's human reproduction or RBM online, there's a paper on what letrozole does to the biochemistry levels from day five onwards. And somebody's done a huge review on that, and it's, it's this month. It's worth reading it because what it gives you an idea, it just gives you an idea of how physiology works. So here again, coming back to this, it's if you can see this, do a dual stimulation. What protocol you use, you decide. I'll say use some clomiphene because I'm a great believer of clomiphene and um, uh, IVF because what clomiphene does is, unlike giving you artificial FSH, remember what you're giving, you're giving uh, artificial either produced from urine or which is biochemically made, but the pituitary FSH is different. Pituitary FSH comes in waves. 
and clomiphene also gives you a, a wave pattern of FSH. So I have a feeling in these cases, a natural push towards a wave form of FSH may work. And I think it's worth looking at it. I tend to use um, recombinant FSH in poor respondents because that's, it's a more potent FSH. And then I write HMG because uh, I, I'm a great believer that anything that comes from the urine of women is fantastic, um, uh, and including urine of cows. So it's a joke, but, uh, but that's, uh, I, it's the only place where I think that uh, you, you may get more follicles or more oocytes using recombinant. And this was a study which he did. He had fantastic results of uh, ongoing 53 and 54%. I don't think any of us have managed to do that. Again, if you look at dual stimulation and look at euploidy rate per oocytes, it's very similar. So it seems that irrespective, when you stimulate, you don't change the euploidy rate of uh, embryos. So what have we done? We have said, can we do a luteal phase start? And we said, yes, if in the luteal phase, you see a good follicle account, start the stimulation. Uh, in the early luteal phase, the only place where you have to give a maximum dose, where a mild, mild dose will not work, is in the early luteal phase. And you, if you know the reason, in the early luteal phase, there is a high LH, which is declining. There's a high progesterone, both have a negative impact on your stimulation. So in the first seven days after ovulation, if you decide to stimulate, you need a higher dose of FSH. Everywhere else, you can look at follicular size and decide whether you want to give a mild dose or a maximum dose, but that's the phase. So first seven days after ovulation, if you see a good follicle count, and that's an early luteal phase start, you need a maximum dose of follicle. So now let's look at Poseidon Three, and what is Poseidon three? Young women with a low reserve and with a low ankle follicle count. Poseidon four, it, this does not work because age is still the most important part. So let's have a look at it. There'll be some women, and again, um, in, in my, uh, as I told you, God gave me three triangles. Money gave me a goody triangle to explain follicle recruitment. Then there was a fat goody triangle for PCO. And there is a, a dietary a goody triangle, which I aim to be um, in uh, this. So what it tells us is there are some women who have a low AMH, who do have a variable ankle follicle count. There are some women who have very small ovaries. So what gives you an indication? Small ovaries will always do that. Fixed ankle follicle count. Here again, you can't do much. You have to go ahead with a smaller number of follicles. Whatever happens, you can't, cannot change that ovary. It's an ovary which is, a, if you have a look at the ovary and say, hang on, the right ovary looks a bit larger and the left ovary looks very small. So that AMS decline is probably due to left ovary. Now, again, a thing about AMH is uh, the decline of AMH and it's linked to decline of, uh, of follicles is based on AMH with both ovaries being intact. So when you remove, do an oophorectomy, there's the disproportionate decline of AMH. And we don't know why that happens. So we feel that there is that story still that is AMH also measuring some follicles, which uh, it was not supposed to measure. So like the pre and we don't know that again. So in the same way, if you have got one very small ovary, that ovary is al almost going like an oophorectomy. So you'll see, a, a, a disproportional decline of AMH. Look at the other ovary. If it's a normal size ovary, it will generate more follicles. The question is, do you have the patience to wait till the ovary does that? And that is what is called as a random start or what's called as a chasing the follicles. So very heavy protocols generally don't work. They do not create more follicles. You can only stimulate what you can see. You cannot stimulate the follicles you can't see. Stimulate whenever the antral follicle count is the best. And for that, you have to wait. So what should you scan? So you have a scan and you count the follicles. See the number of follicles and the size of follicles. Again, four to five millimeter follicles are more easily 
stimulated. So you, know, you start stimulation. So, and this is what I normally do and it changes. And uh, this is a slightly old way of doing it, but I do give Clomid. I give Clomid for a bit longer so that I can use the antagonist later. I tend to use recombinant and somewhere down the line, I put HMG if on day five or day six when you have dominance. So this allows me to at least test if the follicles are growing. Now, uh, I've changed my way of thinking about the dose of FSH over the past few years. And I tend to increase the dose based on the size of follicles. So if the follicles are small, they require more FSH. And as I said uh, in my uh, lecture on PCO, is that the size of follicles, the role of AMH is different here. So the AMH is low. And as the AMH declines, what happens? Uh, so the AMH having an in inhibitory control on oocytes, uh, on follicles, will allow follicles to go up easily. So you see as the AMH declines, andral follicle count starts getting better and better and better. And that's the initial part of aging. And if you can look at that, then you get a good chance. But equally, in poor responders, there's a problem with follicles. There's a problem with how the follicles get recruited and these follicles are smaller. So you see a follicle between two and four millimeter, you want to stimulate it, that 150 dose will not stimulate it. In those cases, you need to push the dose at 300 or if you want 450, I use uh, 300 as a maximum. So uh, let's say looking at random start, but looking at I'm not talking of good responders. You can do random start on good responders anytime. I'm talking of poor responders. So you say, okay, I'll give you an example. On day 14, I have two antral follicles. So I say, hang on, it's not a good time to start. Day 18, again, two. Day 27, I see four or five follicles. That's a good follicle. And that is what the variability of follicles are. Start stimulating on that day. Again, just use a normal stimulation. You do. You, can you pretreat? Don't. These follicles will disappear. So again, let's, let's look at late follicle start. So you got day 27, you see a low follicle count. Day 5, again, that follicle count is low. By day 12, new follicles have come up. There will be an LH surge. LH does not affect small follicles. So don't worry about it. Don't give an antagonist. In the past, we used to add the antagonist. Now you don't need it because these follicles are just not affected by LH surge. And in three days time, the corpus luteum would have formed. But in these cases, if you're close to ovulation, we think that giving a higher dose is beneficial. Why? Because the FSH close to ovulation is on the decline, the LH is on the increase, and the progesterone is on the increase. So pre-ovulatory to seven days post-ovulation, your follicles are in a more aggressive, uh, need to be pushed more aggressively because the hormonal condition is an antagonist to, to the follicles. Your LH is high, your progesterone is high. And if you start a mild stimulation, follicles will not get recruited. So does luteal phase stimulation work? Probably yes, in, as long as your follicle count is good. Now, does adjusting the dose in poor responders uh, work? And the evidence is that it doesn't. You know, uh, trying and mix and match, trying to increase the dose mid-cycle, I don't think it makes any difference. Once you have not recruited follicles, it's gone. Those in this study, those greater than 115 poor responders did not increase oocyte numbers, but that's not entirely true. There's a, again, a huge controversy and people will say, uh, push on a higher dose. Do maximum stimulation work? And again, this study basically said, well, uh, it didn't matter what stimulation you use. Pregnancy outcomes, again, looking at mild stimulation and looking at conventional stimulation was probably very, very similar. But my concepts here are a bit different. If you see smaller follicles, to recruit them, probably you need a higher dose. If you see three or four larger follicles, then go for a, a mild stimulation. Again, increasing the dose in a poor responder mid-cycle just does not work. Uh, they do not have an adequate number of antral follicles. And I generally, I, I don't think you're, you're able to change that destiny of that follicle. 
I guess exactly the same thing which I uh, said. So once again, the maximum concentration, I, I said that yesterday, um, the maximum concentration of recombinant FSH after repeated administration is reached between seven to 10 hours, which means that once you start it, you're, you're going through that uh, range of FSH. By 48 hours, any change that you give to FSH, unless the follicles are recruited, are not recruited, I don't think matters. Serum FSH stabilizes after 24 hours of injection. It creates a window in the first 24 hours after which the FSH increases very, very slowly. Serum FSH, I'm saying. And at present, there's no test that will give you a very clear idea about uh, how to, what FSH does. Uh, can you think about other concepts? You can bang the eggs or embryos, and some clinics do that. You create more embryos. Uh, so a woman with a low AMH comes and she says, I want to have two children. Um, any data on how many uh, treatments you require to have two children? I'll say no. There isn't enough data to tell you what are, how many eggs you need or embryos you need to have one child. So I say, first get one child, then we'll think of a second. So as you go on banking embryos, that's one way of looking at poor responders. And finally, what happens is uh, I've missed a few slides, so I may need to go. Uh, Sachin, uh, I may need to go on to the uh, other computer. I've got a few slides there. I, I don't know uh, this. So finally, uh, stimulation cannot change oocyte quality. Uh, egg quality is beyond repair. Now there are just about three or four slides, uh, which I don't know why it's not got uh, uh, sent. Thank you. It shared the old. Um, yeah, we'll go back. Okay, so the, the question get asked is, you know, uh, when do you stop? So I, I, I you know, over the past two, uh, two, yesterday and today, people ask us that um, one cycle did not work, what to do? So let's look at the real life data. And this is the only study which looks at uh, real life data. Uh, I think we'll keep some silence. 
Because what happens is, you know, uh, uh, I'm a man and, uh, and men, are, you can only listen to one voice at a time. And usually that's a training that a married man gets. Um, and uh, uh, it's difficult to uh, listen to multiple voices. Uh, the same thing, you know, when people speak, then I find it very difficult because uh, it's against my evolutionary background of listening to multiple voices. So the question is, when do you stop? And there's only one real life data which said, Israel is the only country where you can have unlimited cycles of IVF. And the way is that the government will fund as many treatments as you need till you have two children. And no other country can do that. So, and this was a study that said that our six cycles enough and here people want to stop after cycle number two so this is a study that said that our six cycles enough to achieve a pregnancy uh, and this was about 3,000 patients all protocols were used clinical pregnancy was looked at and they went up till 20 cycles so and these are young women they're not women who are very old and what they saw was and this was with normal FSH AMH was not there at that time so this is a, again with normal FSH younger women who are getting oocytes. So you are, you are getting, uh, having a normal period of stimulation. You, uh, your number of FSS that you use, the amount is increasing. E2 levels are declining because as you have a, a poor responder, your E2 levels also go down. So as you try more and more treatment cycles, your oocyte numbers go down. Fertilization rates remains the same and embryos, embryos transferred starts increasing. So it's a unique study until up till 20 IVF cycles were done in some group of patients and pregnancy rates between the first and second cycle slightly declined, but until the fifth cycle were very much the same. And there's a very modest reduction in live birth rates between cycle number one to five. So the question is, do you, when do you stop? And again, I tell patients, do you have in you enough psychological uh, you know, uh, reserve to be able to go through multiple rounds of treatment? And it's very important to tell patients that. If you tell patients, I'm going to get you pregnant in one cycle, you are lying. You may be lying for various reasons. We, we, we sometimes lie because we don't want to cause harm. How, how is, you know, you have a, uh, a cancer uh, for an elder parent, you have cancer and you don't want to tell the, the elder parent you got cancer. That's, that is a lie, right? but that's a, that's a lie with an intent of causing less grief. But the same way, we tell patients, oh, let's do one cycle, the results are very good. Explain what very good means. And sometimes I, I tend to be more explicit. I tell patients that, you know, you're 40 years old, your chance of having a live birth rate is 15 to 20%, which means that there is a, pos a good possibility you will not get pregnant. Why? Because that's a truth. We, see, I, I'm, I'm not an uh, astrologer. I'm not a, a psychologist. I'm a doctor. I need to tell you the truth. And I think it's very important to be truthful. Next is training. And uh, why do some clinics do well and some clinics don't? There is a, a difference. Everyone is not the same. And it borders down to good training, good education, and trying to push your standards. Getting to a good stimulation is very important. And how do you do that? You do that using different techniques. Good centers run good protocols and they assess it. So what happens with single center clinics? You do not have a form of assessing your performance because it's saying that I'm going to keep running and I'm, I'm very good, I'm very good. You keep saying that I'm very good, I'm very good. No way of assessment. And that is important. Institutes have a better way of assessment. Why? Because we'll say, oh, uh, such in your embryo transfer rates were 30%, and yours were 40%, mine was 20%. So I'm doing something wrong. Equally, the embryologists, the KPI indicators, and you, know, you should have KPI indicators. Embryologist says, okay, X embryologist has a lower ICSI fertilization rates, has a lower rate of blastocyst creation. Why? X uh, you know, incubator is doing more poorly. And these are KPI indicators. And if you look at the uh, European uh, SRA, you'll you get a list of KPI indicators. Why is it important? It is an exercise. It is a process. It helps you to 
fine tune your embryology, you need an excellent laboratory. If you give good quality eggs, the key to a successful cycle remains in that embryology. You need to have embryologists who go for training. You need to pay your embryologist very well. Because remember, it is they who will give you a success rate. And push their training. Good embryologists will not leave you provided you pay them high amount of money. And in a country like India, where there is a scarcity of embryologists, everywhere there's a scarcity, it's a long training. And I think you'll have to find ways of hanging on to good embryologists, including looking at doing profit sharing. You know, it's in a business, if you lose your embryologist, or if you have a hopping embryologist, a hopping embryologist is not interested in giving you good results. You know, I'm going to, uh, and this is from a big center in India, and we used to have a lot of observers who came uh, from uh, uh, India, and we had about 800 odd observers who came over for uh, six years. And some of the stories which I heard was, was scary, was phenomenally scary. And they should have, and this is in a big clinic, the embryologists would come for uh, fertilization, uh, for egg collection, and do ICSI, and then fly out and come back on day three. So there was no first check. There was no way of embryo grading and they would replace embryos on day three. In some cases, after ICSI, the embryologist would not come. That's what and your local embryologist did it. See, that will not give you good results. That will give you a lot of money, but that will not give you good results. And you have to accept that if you cannot change a system, you cannot start thinking of why am I not getting good results? It's because you have processes that are deficient and faulty. And finally, I think you have, you have to be truthful. It's not wrong to use PGTA. It's not wrong to do, uh, you know, look at health parameters, look, look at thyroid and look at vitamin D and look, and look at, it's not wrong to do it. But remember that there is a certain amount of truth there. We are reaching a, a level of treatment where I don't think we are going to go beyond a certain success rate. Whatever we do, there will be about 30% of women who do whatever we do are not going to get pregnant. So what do we do there? We have to push science. There'll be some who will benefit from having infection screening done. Some who will benefit having genetic screening done. But you're pushing that small area where you can improve results. And as much as research, it is what data we put into research. And uh, you know, as more and more people from India and China and the rest of the country start contributing, we start getting real worldwide data. At present, I think it is focused on to a select group, group of researchers in uh, countries. And many of them are doing a good job. But again, there is a certain amount of uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 group there which uh, you'll find difficult to crack. But anyway, thank you very much. So and that's finally the harm that we can probably cause. You, you do, I, I did show that. Uh, I, I tend to use a flexible start. I do it when follicle size which is 14. So antagonist is a flexible start. So antagonist can be given in two ways. A fixed antagonist, which is day five start. I use a flexible start for my random starts. So I give it when, whenever the follicle reaches size 14. Um, so uh, you were talking about this random stimulation, chasing the eggs, you said. How do you go about stimulating a lady if she walks into your clinic on day 12 of her cycle? First question of mine. And the second question is, you said that uh, when you're doing the stimulation in the late luteal phase, the amount of FSH required is quite high. No, no, in I, spite of the dosage being very high, would you still recommend doing a stimulation, starting a stimulation in that phase itself? Or would no, you no, want I, to I, wait I, for a few I, more no, days? I, I didn't say that. I said that in the early luteal phase, yeah. uh, the endocrine is in such a manner that it does not aid uh, easy stimulation, which means that follicles are in a more antagonist uh, phase. So, so uh, 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 look at your uh, uh, biochemistry. Early follicle phase, FSH is low, it's rising. LH is low and progesterone is low. 
So it's a phase where again, follicles recruit well. Late luteal phase, low FSH, low LH, low progesterone, uh, and that's a good phase. Uh, Pre-ovulatory phase and early luteal phase is the only time when you got a high LH, you got a high progesterone, and both these are indicators of not where mild stimulation does not work. Irrespective of size of follicle, if you are planning to do a random start around that time, I'll say go on to a higher dose of gonadotropics. So, but would you still prefer starting at that time? My Why question not? is. Why not? The cost, the cost effectiveness. Let me just, just give me one moment. You know, in the morning when we were at the breakfast table, Mohan and Anil said, let's confuse everybody. <laughs> okay, so did yeah, he did say that. Yeah. No, I and you said it quite harmless. loudly. So one, 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 yeah, no, no, one minute. I'm just start? diverting it away from your question. I'm just taking it a little differently, and let's have these two opine okay, whether we are, the way we are thinking is correct or not. So we decide to do all patients random start. Let's say everybody has to go on random start only. There are four phases the patient can meet us. You can have a seat. One, the patient will meet in the early follicular phase, day two, three, four. The patient can meet in the late follicular phase, maybe day nine to day 12. The patient will meet, meet us immediately after ovulation and the patient will meet us in the late luteal phase. So we have four patients who are coming at this. Can we start random start? Let the patient comes in first two, three days, nothing wrong. It's the same thing, you just start it off. Let the patient comes with a dominant follicle of maybe 16 millimeter and more. I'm just putting forth my thought process. Let these two opine how they would uh, go ahead. I would say, well, I can start you, madam. I will just give you a GNRH agonist trigger today. Your follicle will rupture in about two days then, two days time. There'll be an active luteolysis. And after two days of, uh, let's say I've given the trigger today, after four, three or four days, I will just start off the stimulation. Okay, even if the luteinization takes place, there are small multiple follicles, which are less than five to six millimeter, and they don't have LH receptor anyway. So those follicles are now going to get luteinized, and I still have some hurt to develop. But this patient meets me just after ovulation. I said, well, you have just ovulated. You, your LH is going to be high. I'm not giving anything to her. So LH is a little high, the progesterone is high, and this is a nice phase. She has a few small follicles again, which are available for to go ahead with the stimulation, and I just start the stimulation. And but since it's in the luteal phase, I'm working on a high LH, high progesterone atmosphere. So it's okay. I need not go for a fixed, fixed anta protocol. I will go with his view of going 12, 14 millimeter and then adding an antagonist. Suppose comes late. Well, anyway, you are sinking with the luteal follicular transition. Probably you're doing right. What will be your opinion on this? Yeah, I agree. See, uh, uh, the only place I'll defer is because uh, when I started this, I was to give the analog trigger to start ovulation. Now I don't because the LH rise does not affect small follicles. Why initiate it? Uh, I, so I don't. So uh, let's come back to a basic concept here. Is you are seeing a poor responder where the follicle count is not good. Now you see a follicle count that is good at a specific period. Now either you can say it is a wrong time to start or come back a few days later where the follicle count will disappear. So I'm saying you've seen a fantastic follicle count on uh, day 20, uh, uh, day 18. There's a corpus luteum, and there is a very active corpus luteum, and there are eight, eight or nine follicles. What do you do? Either you can miss that cycle, but we know from evidence that you can stimulate these follicles. And but you know, from experience, my logic is I have tried stimulating them with 150, and it hasn't worked. And the reason why it hasn't worked is going back to the overall physiology is that there's a high LH. Same concept in PCOS when there's a high LH. So stimulation is damn difficult. So same place, post ovulation, your LH is very high. So what do you need to do? You need to push the ovary, hard, those follicles harder. Now, will they get recruited? If they are competent, they will get recruited. But also remember in poor responders, the, the chance of the fourth number of follicles to be recruited is going to be low. So if you're lucky, you'll get a lot recruited, but you cannot change that. So what you're telling the patient is, see, I know your follicle count is low. I have found a window in which your follicle count is the best. Now I am going to try and stimulate your ovary in that window. And I think this protocol would work. In five days, I know if your follicles have been recruited or not. If they're not recruited, let's stop it. 
Yeah, I have. And, and second, so uh, see, I, I, the aim is to reduce the burden of care, which means that if on day five I see one follicle grow, I'll say we tried it; it hasn't worked. Let's give it a try again. Now, see, it's very easy to tell a patient uh, to do egg donation, and I, I tend to have a slightly different view. I do egg donations, but I have a slightly different view. Now, who takes the burden of egg donation? The woman. The man doesn't take any burden of it. Men are very easy. They say, well, hang on, it's going to work. Hey, I do egg donation. But a woman takes the burden. And I tell a woman this very clearly. So as she's young, I'll say, you've got probably one or two years where there is a small possibility of a pregnancy with your own eggs. In life, what, what do we go through the most? It's regret. So in 10 years' time, when you sit down, you, uh, what do you want to be? You want to be somebody who says, I tried my best. I gave all the possible treatments. And then I progress towards egg donation. Or do you want to regret thinking, I wish I had given it a chance? And I think that gives a much clearer view into what people can do. See, at the end, they have to take control of their lives. And it is painful. In some cases, try what we may, they may not get uh, children from their own eggs. And it is painful for a woman and she has to bear this grief over her period and accept it. And that, that, that is what motherhood is. Motherhood accepts egg donations better than sperm donation. That's because that's how women are. But it's, it's, it's painful. No, it's good for any responders. So one the poor responder is good only if you see follicles. And again, I'm saying, keep that in your head before you ask me a question is, if they are good follicles. So if they are good follicles, the random start is, go is good in poor responders. If there are no follicles, it doesn't matter when you stimulate. You're not going to get any eggs. Secondly, you, you, you talk about this uh, following the follicular wave or chasing the follicle. How patient you need to be and how much of patience you tell the client. Like they, they, because they keep asking us, what is the timeline? So I, I, I say, uh, I give up after three months of scanning every 10 days. It's, it's hard work. Uh, I have the patients and I do that. I do that. See, at present, I have got about 10 patients who are having this, which means that uh, for every 10 days, she'll come for a scan. And at the end of it, uh, if it doesn't work, I said, I, I have a try. And I charge them a fixed sum of money for having done uh, eight or nine scans. So I give them an idea and I said, I'll give you a, a 10 scan package and I'll say this is how much it's going to cost you. If it works, then I'll incorporate it into a fixed price of IVF. So they know exactly what they're going through. If at the end of 10 rounds, I don't see any follicular change, I think I've done my best. It, it, you can either go and see somebody else uh, or think of egg donation. Mohan, I just want to come, come to you for a question. Uh, we, uh, your published work on your adjuvants. We would like to know about uh, the testosterone, DHEA, and growth hormone. What would be the research take on this? As we, uh, what is the evidence stand as as we stand here today? I think uh, the last time we read and updated uh, this, and all has fallen off the radar. I think uh, even growth hormone, um, the Cochrane supported it, but later on, I think two trials have come which looked at Poseidon. No, I think they looked at the Bologna as a poor responder and then they found there's no benefit. And uh, regarding this random start and all, I will give it to Dr. Goody because I have not so, done uh, this. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll put it this way. So, uh, yeah. you know, Nick McClone, Ma McClone and, uh, yeah. uh, and he's a huge researcher and he's yeah. linked to London Women's Clinic. So he came up to us and said, uh, you know, because we use the same laboratory and he says, your poor responders have a higher live birth rate. Uh, compared to us. So that's one way of looking at it. And it says, what do you do different? And I said, uh, we said, see, this is the protocol we use. And he says, see, it's impossible to write this as a randomized trial because yeah. it doesn't go it. So we are thinking of writing, writing this as a proof of concept and say, yeah. because you can't do research on it. You, uh, you know, you can't say that uh, I, if I believe that doing a random start and chasing the follicle is helpful. And I put another group of patients and say that, let's try this. Uh, I, I think I'm not doing justice I'm, I, I, because I believe in this uh, treatment being superior. 
So we, when we looked at the collective data of AMH, age, and antral follicle, we have seen the huge change in difference in success rates uh, and live birth rate. So probably there is some uh, somewhere in between. Yeah, only thing is when we look at this kind of strategy, we'll have to also factor in the logistics, the cost, yes. and everything. Because calling patients again and again might not be feasible for many units. You know, uh, that's, 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 that's true. I think what... Uh, and that's yeah. the reason why I have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, when, I'll put it this way, when you see the same, uh, and this is what evidence shows, when you see a same practitioner every time, yeah. uh, it brings familiarity, it brings a certain amount of trust and belief, and patients tend to uh, be more open to it. And so I, I, I see it very often. I spend a lot of time with my patients. I, I enjoy reproductive medicine. I, I, I enjoy talking to patients because... Hang on, the pandemic showed us that we can't talk to people. And it's such a joy talking to patients and trying to feel their pain. And I, I enjoy it. I, I can go on talking for hours um, on, on irrelevant topics. So you know, I talk about history. I talk about philosophy. I talk about food. And I, I briefly talk about medicine. Because, you know, what is important? You know, a patient comes to you and he says, oh, um, have you been to that restaurant? It's, it's very good steak. And they, and you know, it, it, it gets you involved. You know, why do patients pay you? They pay you for a good pregnancy rate, but they also pay you uh, to be happy. So my job is to make my patients happy and then get them pregnant. But I think it's very important to be happy. And uh, I, you know, I'm, uh, I believe that, you know, infertility causes more sadness to women. Uh, and uh, men have, you know, it's not that men don't feel the pain on infertility, they do also feel it. But women seem to uh, get affected by it significantly more. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's so important to be able to, uh, you know, do your little bit of making them feel a bit more comfortable and feel a, a bit better. You know, my, my first aim is to make my patients laugh. So I, I say a lot of phenomenally crazy things. I've always said that, and I and uh, there have been a few complaints about that too. But, um, that's the way I am. Yeah. Uh, excuse, me. Uh, sir. I wanted to ask, uh, like, uh, suppose if there is a dominant follicle, like a pre-ovulatory kind, sixteen mm, so there will be high LH and some kind amount of FSH also. And if you want to start uh, during this time, so you how you you would go about it? You will so trigger it. Or you will take it that way, or add and tag, or like so. Uh, so let's come to this uh, concept of uh, there is uh, there's a dominant follicle, and I see nine follicles there. So I'll say, see here, there's a dominant follicle. We are starting stimulation today. I'll start you on three hundred of gonalf recombinant, and I'll see you in five days' time. By which time ovulation would have occurred, huh? and plus I'll see how many follicles have got recruited. Okay. So you'll not trigger it, you'll take it. No, I don't trigger it. I, 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 I would rather go with the uh, physiology I know rather than create a new physiology. So, so that high E2 of that follicle will not affect the small. No, it doesn't. Uh, so uh, uh, E2 is not uh, an, uh, an antagonist to, to follicular response. It's more to do with LH and progesterone, which are, you know, so if you have a look at PCOs, when you start stimulation, they're on a baseline high E2, and you can still stimulate. But what is the complicating matter in, in uh, uh, PCOS? When you start stimulating, then on day one, day two, the high, women with high LH, stimulation is more difficult. Mm -hmm. And that's the only place where you need to step, step down with a higher dose. The same thing happens here. So if you start on 150, it just doesn't work. It, uh, you, you don't stimulate these follicles. And I, I've learned that through trial and error. I've tried using mild stimulation. It just doesn't work. And so you go back and I do, I do bloods not to change protocol, but to understand. So I, I do a lot of uh, routinely do FSH, LH, E2, and progesterone during stimulation because it gives me an idea. So you mean if the baseline E2 is high, we can still start the stimulation like if it's yeah, 100? Absolutely. You just... Uh, as I told you earlier, what is uh, LH? LH is uh, an indicator of a difficult response. It's an indicator of theca cell dominance. It's an indicator against follicular growth. So there's a balance between androgens and estrogens. 
So how does successful follicular growth occur? It occurs when granular cell is in dominance over theca cell. In PCOS, it's opposite. Theca cell dominance over granular cell. So you need to shift that. What shifts it is FSH. So if you have a very high theca cell dominance, you need to push your FSH high enough. So you see a granular cell dominance. So that, that's the way it happens even in, in the early, in the late follicular phase, you see a huge amount of LH and progesterone. Thank you so much, sir. And in dual stimulation, like suppose we did the egg collection today and uh, when we should start the other stimulation ideally? It's, um, uh, I used to do it, I stopped doing it because it takes a lot of toll and I don't see the right uh, situation. So on the day of egg collection, let's say you're given an analog trigger and you've collected the eggs. On the day of egg collection, you create the big follicles and then you see eight to nine follicles. Now you can either start on that day or you can start the next day. So people here have started the next day. Okay. It is, uh, I think it is very expensive. I don't think we've got adequate data on it yet. Uh, and I, 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 we don't know, uh, there's been a, a very nice paper, uh, which I did not understand. I'll be very frank. Um, I did not understand a word of it. I gave it to my colleague Amit. Uh, it is, does dual stimulation cause harm? Have you read that? Um, I read that paper. I couldn't understand a word of it. It's, it's very, very rare. So I gave it to my colleague and he couldn't understand. It's so complex. What are you looking at? You're looking at uh, the preantral recruitment and what uh, dual stimulation may impact on, on this. Uh, it's so complex and uh, you can read it. It, was, it's, it went a bouncer. Uh, and, you know, in the first reading, if it goes a bouncer, I don't read it again. Thank you, sir. Uh, it, it has no value now. Uh, I, and the last aspiration of cyst I did was about 15 years ago. Um, so, uh, uh, so as soon as I see follicles, I start stimulating. How do you decide that this day she has the best number or should you wait for another three, four days when she would have a better count so you have to follow her for one cycle at least and uh, would the response be same in the next cycle also so so, 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 I, so, so i'll give you two answers to it one is what i do and the other is what we should we can do uh, one is what i do is i when i see a good follicle count and she's never had a better follicle count i start the stimulation how do we know that so uh, because i've scanned her i scan her every 10 days for for just one month or uh, three months after that only you decide. No, so during the three months, my, my uh, cutoff is seven follicles. Seven okay. follicles will give you two eggs or three eggs. So that's my cutoff. Uh, that's my cutoff if I don't get it. Now, how can I predict it? Uh, I use a very good astrologer uh, <laughs> who uh, looks at her horoscope and says that uh, uh, if she comes seven days later at, at one o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> her follicle count will be good. So um, and that astrologer is me. Uh, and it's very important to be an astrologer. I'll tell you why. If you tell patients that take your uh, FSH at 9 p.m. at night, your antagonist at 9 a.m. in the morning, and see me on Tuesday at 1 o'clock, uh, human psyche is such that they will try and look at uh, uh, other reasons. So if you're a Hindu, you'll say, hmm, uh, it's Ganpati's day on Tuesday. And that's why he has called me. So, uh, uh, you know, when people are looking for hope, they look at various factors. And that's how we go. But it, I, I just, it, so the right answer is, in that process, in the three months, uh, why do I put three months is because I think it gives a round. But suppose we don't get seven follicles in the next cycle, then we have already lost you know, so uh, you're not How do you decide? So I don't start stimulation. So let's say we got three follicles, three follicles, three follicles. See, at the end, some patients will decide that I want to go ahead with three follicles. They'll say, go ahead. 
it is a it is a tiring process it is a long process but in some cases it works i say it works in a third of patients in two third of patients it does not work which means you can do all this i i, I tell a patient clearly i'm i'm trying to give you if it doesn't work a closure that you've done everything you've had a low amh low antral follicular count you don't want egg donation and so i've got a few patients who will not take egg donation right. because they have yes. religious convictions for it and so what do you do you know they say i just don't want this is my religion does not allow me to do egg donation and so you're in a fix you can go on doing treatments and somebody who's had four rounds and five rounds of treatment and she's getting embryos uh, and it doesn't yeah i think it's right sir okay so you didn't okay. Doctor, that when he calls at nine o'clock, you take injection. You have to chant Gayatri mantra, and the antagonist you have to chant Mahamutrunjya mantra. <laughs> So on uh, Friday I become a Muslim. On Saturday I become a, a Jew. Uh, because my, my concept is, let us try and find out. You know, uh, have you looked at this study that prayer improves the chance of pregnancy? The randomized control trial. The question is, we don't know which God to pray. <laughs> so what I do is I say, come on, uh, let's give it a chance. You know, who, who knows? Some God may be more powerful. So Friday I become a Muslim. I pray to Allah and say, grant me success. I, pray, I become a Jew on uh, Saturday. I become a Christian on Sunday. And, and then the only thing I don't become, I, I don't become a Buddhist. Not because I don't believe in Buddha, but I make me agnostic. You know, agnostic doesn't help you. So then I, I move between being a Hindu and a Sikh the other days. Um, and um, I think that's the reason why my results are good. <laughs> I'll just put the slides. This is a very light talk, so we have had a very heavy session. So I thought we will make it a little more interactive. I'll just share uh, my own journey because it's 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 probably something that um, I would like to thank Dr. Kulkarni for sharing. This is a very light, fifteen minutes talk, but some interaction would be useful. To, uh, so let's see. So I'm sharing uh, mainly anecdotal uh, experience in my research and how from our department, whatever has come, how it has made our practice, how it has changed. So, and I'll just share a few things. Uh, also probably stress the importance of reading the methodology again uh, and not only the conclusions because a lot is hidden by the time the conclusions are made. So again, uh, this is something that I always believe that many people just quote the studies and say that, uh, you know, the study has quoted this, but study doesn't stop you from making your own clinical judgment and also listen to your patients. Uh, that paternalistic way of doing things is no longer acceptable. Uh, we kind of tell them that this is what I believe. So in my practice, I, I talk a lot uh, in terms of, I don't know, you know, my answers to many of the questions from my patients is, I seriously don't know the answer, whether this approach is good or which, which is good, because we are far away from the truth. So uh, that's what has changed in my practice. Earlier, 10 years back, I used to tell the patient, this is what I think will work. But nowadays, I use a lot of I don't know. Um, and that's where all three join and become the evidence-based medicine the way I understand. So it's important that all of us are involved in some kind of research. So the MD thesis for us was actually to introduce into the world of evidence and clinical, uh, the evidence generation. But sadly, we have pretty much forgotten most of our thesis work. Um, but I, it was to understand what, you know, how you plan a clinical study. So even in your own practice, probably you could, even now also, I would say, 
put down a database, start analyzing your own results. So yesterday when we are talking about the TMF, so I would suggest you go back and just look at your own data for the last two, three years, pl plot the TMFs and see how many conceived above 5 million, how many conceived below 5 million. It's a very pretty easy exercise. You need to take time out and audit your own results and you'll figure out where things are going right and wrong. So, and that's probably the first basic step when you're planning any study, you know, understand methodology. And quite frankly, I do believe that all the problems and the devil is in the details. So I would like to ask our audience here, do you think we need to prove that a parachute is required or, or is beneficial uh, when we jump from a plane? Uh, a big yes would be good. Um, so people need to prove that. Or it's, uh, uh, you know, do you really, because it's quite an unethical thing, no? Uh, I will be really tough to make people jump from the plane with or without aeroplane, a uh, uh, parachute. So it's, it's, uh, it's a thought. So, so answer, let's see what people have done. So they did a study like this. Population was PICO statement. It was published in 2018, where they had one group which jumped from the plane without parachute and one with parachute. And what is the outcome? No death or major injury. It was published in BMJ Open. So what was the conclusion? So how, how do you think they planned the study? Yeah. So you can get what you want. You know? People are very smart nowadays. So the conclusion was there's no need for a parachute and try extra police. Exactly what we are doing in practice nowadays. The study is something else. The guys have made very clever conclusions and we are busy trying to practice like this. Exactly. This is a beautiful analogy in the world of evidence-based medicine that people have done. So all this while, I before 2018, I used to only present the first picture. Then I dug around next time and I figured out these kind of articles are also getting published. Okay, so this is where it is. So if you don't know the details, uh, you are going to make very dangerous routine changes in your practice, which is actually going to be counterproductive. So this is called selection bias in uh, a term that we use where you have selected a very different group of patients from actual practice. That means you selected patients who were jumping from the aeroplane, but the plane was static. Whereas in real life, the plane will be flying and people have to jump. So that's called a selection bias. And typically that's what I was trying to refer to. So this is just an analogy, but it's a very, very, very nice analogy. So I, my journey, of course, my boss and mentor, Corolla George, sir, who actually was instrumental in starting two courses in this country, the FNB and MCH. So my uh, project as a fellow was this trial uh, when letrozole was actually um, introduced in 2006. Subsequently, they withdrew the permission in 2011. And that point of time, we did this randomized trial looking at clomiphene resistant patients. And uh, we found pretty high ovulation and pregnancy rates in patients who were given letrozole. On the other side, it was placebo. So this was my first paper uh, in Fort Sturt, it went, went in because at that point of time, there was no trial. But I just want to tell about what happened on ground with this study. So immediately our research made way and by 2007, in our practice, we had shifted to OI with letrozole. It has taken few more years for the practice to change. But for us, we generated our own data. We subjected it to very rigorous peer review. And when it was validated, we changed practice straight away. So a lot of women benefited. If you ask me, thousands of women who had otherwise had to reach gonadotrophins conceived in uh, letrozole. And you and me know that letrozole is more effective. And now there are big trials and studies which have clearly shown letrozole to be the first line. Uh, and it has higher live birth rate than clomiphene. So this was what we did. Our research changed our practice and made life easy for our patients. Long back than what was eventually the new trigger. So the question for the audience is, how many of us give 
HCG trigger for CC cycles. A big yes would be good for me to start. Yeah. So I expected that answer. So I thought, let me just share our own data. So in a randomized trial or in a study, you immediately draw a PICO statement. PCOS women undergoing OI, ovulation induction, intervention HCG, no trigger is the comparison, and your pregnancy rates are the outcome. So the first randomized trial actually came from India. And we actually looked at giving HCG versus waiting for spontaneous ovulation in a CC cycle. And we did not find any difference in the pregnancy rates. Okay. So this was way back in 2006, even before I joined. And one of the first Cochrane reviews from this country was on this same topic. So I was a part of it 2007, updated in 2014. And the results were there is inadequate evidence to actually support giving an HCG trigger for a clomiphene cycle. So if you ask me, uh, right now the status of this review is stable. That means that it will no longer undergo any more updates because the evidence is stable and it is believed that there are only no longer trials. Essentially, we don't give HCG and that is because it really doesn't help. And the cost of the trial will go up. Your clomiphene is hardly a few hundred or less than hundred and HCG is definitely in hundreds. So what are we trying to achieve? You need to ask yourself. What did we do? We stopped HCG way back in 2006. None of our patients are on HCG. Less cost for patients, no injection. There's zero risk of OHSS. And pregnancy rates for our results for the unit hasn't changed because regularly we audit our data. Every one year, the annual data is presented. The number of pregnancies coming from CC cycle remain the same. So you can change your practice, see what is happening, happening subsequently and if the results are same you know that your change hasn't really damaged the prospects of your patient so this is what we have done way back in 2006 and we continue so i would urge all of us here to go back and check whether really you need to give an hcg trigger for a clomiphene cycle or a letrozole cycle because the endogenous lh surge is intact there is no real need to give that there are very few, this is a, again the screening hysteroscopy. So we've worked on these things and we figured out that there's no need. So the take home point for our practice is only offer women with previous history of difficult embryo transfer. So I usually offer in you know cases of severe endometriosis where we could not negotiate the cervix for whatever reason. And then of course, as I said in the morning, Ultrasound guided cervical transfer can actually, or you use a heart catheter like Wallace or something under ultrasound and figure out a way yourself, but otherwise no real change. This was a very uh, important review about number of embryo transfers. So this was actually then guided the SRM guidelines. So in practice, if you ask me, uh, last 10 years, I have not uh, put more than two embryos at any point of time. Now, my colleagues might say, um, Professor Goody might say, why are you putting even two? Uh, you can go for a single embryo because this review did conclude that a single plus single, that is a single fresh plus a single frozen will give you the same cumulative result as a double embryo transfer, but with a higher cost of uh, multiple pregnancy in the DET. But the problem is, what they have not mentioned is you need a very robust cryopreservation program for pulling off things like that. And a good uh, patient compliance in terms of logistics, you will have to call the patient again and again for a AFET cycle. This kind of repeated uh, transfers is attractive on paper, but it does create its own problems. So I am struggling to move from two embryos to one which I hope I will, but definitely no more than two at under any circumstances. And we have looked at our data. The data has remained stable. It is not like our live births have come down for the audit. So when you um, introduce changes, then go back and look at your data. What has happened, let's say pre-intervention, let's say in 2018 you introduced. So you look at your data from 2000, before 2018 and compare it with the next year or so, and you'll figure out what is working and what is not. So you really don't have to look at the studies again and again.
GCSF, I have never used GCSF in practice because I exactly know how these studies have come and what is the current level of evidence. It's just to give you an example of if you are updated with the current literature, it really makes an impact because you really have to figure out what's working and what's not. So my question, the last example I'm giving, because it's a very short talk, is how many of us actually test for ovulation in as a part of fertility workup when the lady comes with regular cycles? Do we do more follicular monitoring? To, I would say at least some of us you do. Okay, so the question that why I'm asking is, do we need to test for ovulation for humanetic women? In other words, regular cycles. So I, I can see that some of us do follicular monitoring and some of them track that. It's a very common practice. I see a lot of papers with the patients who have done, they have undergone follicular tracking and so on. The NICE guidelines suggest that you should do a mid progesterone for women with regular cycles as well. So in the UK, they follow this. The US, they are a little less specific about this. So they have written, recommend assessing ovulatory function as part of subfertility workup, but they do not educate any particular test. This was the ASRM practice committee guideline in 2012. In our unit, we don't test for ovulation for women who's having regular cycles, but we wanted to test this hypothesis and prove it in whatever manner and get it peer reviewed. So actually this was published. This is my fellow, uh, Dr. Parimala. So she published this in 2020 in the first study. So what we did was we looked at, we challenged the ASRM and NICE guidelines. And we said that there is actually no need to check serum progesterone in women who are having human eric, that is so cycles are regular. So what we found was 97% of these women had ovulatory cycles. And uh, we, we concluded there's actually no need to routinely do any testing for this group. Try to understand the, the impact of this research. I'll just tell you, the impact was that the ASRM recent practice committee guideline has changed and they have no longer said to perform any test of ovulation, quoting our study. That is, additional tests of ovulation are not required for confirming ovulation. Only when you have doubts about menstrual history or if indeterminate, then you can offer. What I'm trying to tell you is this research kind of see what we are doing is the gynecologist and specialist take these things lightly. Okay. Patient coming repeatedly for ultrasounds, blood tests and all. I can tell you they are very disruptive in nature. Patients really get feel miserable and we had to do everything possible to cut down all these redundant tests. You know, making life miserable for patients is not something that we are trained for. So I really take pains to cut down the number of scans or testing because it is uh, you know it's not going to yield anything so if you want to even dive down to this particular thought first thing is you need to understand the basics of diagnostic test accuracy so the diagnostic test accuracy principle states that when the pre test probability is 95% okay then you really don't need to do any test and you can move on with the management. To give you an example, if somebody comes in this COVID pandemic with telltale signs and symptoms like fever and you know all the upper respiratory tract infection thing, and he's had a travel history to COVID you know, region and so on, are you going to do a COVID test or you can still, and patient is not well, you really don't need to do a COVID test because the pre-test probability at that point, at least in one point during the pandemic was 95% plus. Okay, so here we gave the stats that the chance of lady having ovulatory cycle is 97%. And that means that if somebody has got a pre uh, a regular cycle, the pre-test probability is 95%. Plus, so you don't need to do any more testing. Just spare the lady of all those tests and scans. So this is where 
I think the research helps and you are in a very good position to change because we are the ones who know where all the confusion lies in clinical practice. How do we diagnose? How do we uh, treat? You know, we don't know what is working, what is not. So we are very good at identifying the knowledge graphs provided we know the literature. You know, we know how to critique the literature. So I feel that all of us need to be involved in some way. It is not only I'm a busy clinician, I don't have time. That is no longer truth. That, that doesn't work well for our patients. I feel it's important that we understand methodology. But essentially, as you read more and more and you understand the whole dynamics of evidence generation, you'll realize that keeping things simple definitely is the best way forward. That's all I would share and I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mohan, so thank you so much actually for telling us so much about research and it's so very important. Even I think the way we learned was going through so many materials and methods of published trials and those materials and methods really tell us how we should implement uh, things into our practice. So, and I think what Goody keeps telling everybody that read at least one article every day, you can start with the review articles first. So get acquainted to the scientific knowledge and how the, the review article will debate between the two trials and will tell you what is the material method differences and what are the uh, selection criteria they use. And then you can go on to study the randomized trials as well. Any questions onto this? But why do we need to follow up about uh, follicle? It's a timed intercourse treatment. You just couple, advise the couple on timed intercourse. There's no restriction. Alternate day intercourse is fine enough. Uh, See, you only follow up and give trigger when you are planning an IUI. Okay. Otherwise, there's no need. That's why you are just making it simple for the patient. So you give a CC or letrozole for five days and... Do the, the ultrasound if you want to. And then uh, on a redo on day 13. If the dominant follicle is there or it's just about to rupture, that's fine. We just document it. The whole idea of doing an ultrasound is just to document response and uh, rule out any multifollicular development. That's all. In fact, if you document a single follicle in one cycle, that is the index cycle, you actually can cut down the scan also for the next couple of cycles if they want to. There's no reason to do it. See, you have to look at this, that how to make life simple for the patient. That's your driving force. You know, you're not missing anything great. And the endogenous surge is intact. So why should you give the trigger? You are increasing the cost dramatically, if I'm not wrong. Uh, well, I'll have a slight change to it. I agree that's what evidence says, that you, know, you don't need scans. You can do your LH kits and you can do everything. But let's look at real life statuses. When you tell couples who have been trying for two years or three years, uh, desperately having sex, and then you tell them, hang on, now, next week, have sex alternate day. I can give you, as you ask them, you see, what happens is we have become a culture that does not talk about sex. Uh, we have become a, 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 a hidden culture that watches the maximum pornography, but doesn't talk about sex. Uh, even though we come from a culture that is phenomenally sex-based. So that's the type of people we have become. So, but if you ask them what happened, they said it was too stressful, uh, I had work to do, I had this to do, that to do, and that is what happens. And as I told you earlier, read that paper from China where they found that young couples were having less and less sex as they were infertile. The reason I give a trigger is it's like a negotiation. You're saying, have sex twice now, please. Uh, and sometimes you have to tell that to uh, couples, come on, uh, uh, have it. And I always used, I used to give a lecture to uh, uh, my patients and I used to say that, you know, it's good to have sex on alternate days. That's a good advice if you are 18 year old or 22 year old. To tell a 30 year old man or a 35 year old man to have a sex on alternate day is like asking him to climb Mount Everest. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, with the same woman, which is, he has been for 10 years. <laughs> now, th those are real life data, you know. I, Generally, CC will be in a very young couple come for the first time. So there are, you know, you know, scats there. I won't and the thing is, one more thing, Dr. Goody is like, we are not even sure about this timed intercourse business. Yes. You know, 
whether you advise once in two days, three days, all this is just going on. Nobody has really questioned that. In fact, actually, there's a paper on expected management. They say 90% in a week. So I'll say, have a look at this paper. It's coming in a quarterly study where young couples were having sex four times a month. And then you feel at that rate, the only treatment that will work for you is IVF. So, uh, and I think it's important. I don't think we ask these questions to people, you know, uh, and in the Asian community, it is quite high to have psychosexual problems because there is so much hype. So you know, if you look at in the UK, who faces the maximum psychosexual problems? They're Asians, Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, uh, because culturally uh, you are expected to do a lot of things. In practical point, I, I think it's a hope. It's a hope that a man thinks that uh, he's uh, some share. You know, he can he can go on and on. And a woman thinks that she'll enjoy sex. Now, uh, if you look at the data, um, uh, forty percent of heterosexual women have never had an orgasm. So, how do you convince women to have sex, which is very mechanical? So, ha have a think about it. See where the fertility is going. Yes, but but but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but 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 have a look at it. Is what is fertility? Eighty percent of couples get pregnant having sexual intercourse. So that's it. That's the usual way. From millennium, that's what you had to do to get pregnant. IVF specialists came later. AMH came later when we went to Lord Brahma and said we want a test. Brahma gave us AMH. But at the end, what he what said, there is a psychosexual problem. There is a huge expectation that we are putting on patients that they will become 18 year old. And it is not happening. And I think it is very important that if as, an, as, as a world, uh, we need to uh, get be better is I think uh, the ideal solution would be have children as our grandparents did when sexual activity was its highest and fertility was its highest. Then our parents decided to do it later. And the next generation wants to have sex and try for a baby on a chance of pregnancy are the least. Good luck. My job is entertaining. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, with the improvement in the education standard and increase in the awareness in the people in since last decade, the male infertility causes on a rise and one of them is azuspermia. So uh, azuspermia, once the diagnosis is confirmed, we should not offer donor gamete as an option unless and until you are taking that azuspermic patient to the evaluation and you, when we are coming to a conclusion, well, any therapy is not going to help with this patient. Because in India, many times when the azuspermia report is there in semen analysis, by the time patient comes to us for the second opinion, the, patient, the wife has already undergone donor IVF three, four times, and it's not been successful, so they have come for a second opinion. And could be a surprise, it could be an obstetric azuspermia, and where that man is very much willing for his own genetic uh, gametes to take you know potential transfer in the next offspring rather than going for donor so this is the way like you know how i'll take you through this presentation how we should go about evaluation and treatment of azuspermia so this will be like agenda in uh, whether like we are described into obstetric azuspermia and non obstetric azuspermia what is the logical approach and what is the role of surgical sperm retrieval so for azuspermia first confirmation of diagnosis is very very important because many of them could be cryptozoospermia and the sample semen sample has not undergone in a centrifugation and the pellet has not been observed. So we are missing and we are unnecessarily labeling them as azoospermia when the patient is actually cryptozoospermia. So coming to the clinical history, uh, like you know, what all factors will look, the BMI clinical examination and the hormone evaluation, which will substitute to that is FSH, LH, testosterone and estradiol. An ultrasound in male genital ultrasound of the male genital tract will give a global picture, like whether the treatment is going to be beneficial or not. So the guidelines with American, uh, like you know, uh, American Urology Association and ASRM guidelines, 
like when the patient is having non osteotic azospermia or severe azospermia and before advising any options for like you know going through surgical sperm retrieval and many other medical therapies before that it's better to impress upon them that almost 50% 15% of azospermia men will be having genetic abnormalities and in severe oligospermia the uh, the incidence is though lesser like 3.6% but in azospermia the incidence being higher we should sensitize them there is a possibility and it's a heritable condition which may pass to the offspring and may impact the success of art outcome i forgot to mention like what are the tests we are doing that is karyotyping y chromosome microdeletion and cf gene abnormalities so uh, i'm top, uh, starting this discussion with non osteotic azospermia rather than osteotic azospermia because there's a clear, clear guideline about osteotic azospermia so when it comes to non osteotic azospermia we have three patients like hypogonadotropic hypogonadism a patients where there is excess of androgens maybe because of some exogenous sor source or the tumor secreting those androgens and third is hypergonadotropic hypogonadism we can't do much about this group where it's a hypergonadotropic hypogonadism and already the fsh is very high and the spermatogenesis is no more correctable but what we can do about hypogonadotropic hypogonadism in clinical practice obviously we are not seeing a congenital hypogonadotropic hypogonadism case we are dealing with the patient who are coming to us with infertility and those are the patient could be a combination of heavily diabetes and obesity because these two iatrogenic conditions does take like you know the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is a iatrogenic condition because of these two things so uh, to diagnose there is low fsh lh and testosterone and uh, what i want to uh, like you know enforce here is it's a treatable condition when we are treating hypogonadotropic hypogonadism in your counseling it's very important that you can give them assurance this is a treatable condition and let's not go for directly donor option the only thing is like you know, on counseling only you should impact on the patient that this patient this treatment is going to take lot of time and you should have patience to take these treatments when you are desiring your own genetic potential to transfer in the next offspring so hypo uh, hypo hypo there is lag delay or stop in puberty sexual development and it's very difficult to differentiate between delayed puberty and a true hypoc hypoc because both are having low fsh lh testosterone and at the uh, at the age of 18 years we can actually differ, differentiate whether it's a delayed puberty or it's a true hypogonadotropic hypogonadism so when it's a delayed hypogonadotropic hypogonadism uh, and like you know these are the patients who will come to us with low lib uh, low libido obesity hot flush and obviously infertility and the incidence being 25 to 33% and maximum incidence is found in patient with diabetes the diabetes is nothing but combination of diabetes and obesity so in indian scenario like we are uh, uh, commonly coming across with the patients who are having central male obesity and this central male obesity is a reason for secondary uh, hypogonadism so if we look carefully about the pathophysiology this central obesity is increasing estrogen estradiol level this estradiol level is causing decrease in the gnrh secretion and lh less uh, pulse amplitude and then that is how it is affecting the spermatogenesis it also decreases the testosterone and pro inflammatory cytokines increase the hepatic lipids and hyperinsulinemia so this all contribute to like you know decrease the gnrh uh, levels and that is how the person becomes hypo hypo so there could be hypoc hypoc which we are coming uh, like in uh, in our clinical practice we see who are not come to us desire of fertility but when we look into that and he's uh, we are labeling that patient is hypoc hypoc in these patients only androgen replacement therapy will be helpful and that could be helpful for improving erection muscle mass and bone turnover the patients with infertility we can give them an option uh, to undergo the treatment with hypo uh, with the gonadotropin therapy and there is improvement in this therapy when the testicular volume is beyond 3 ml in those patients will respond better to our therapy compared to those who are having testicular volume less than 3 ml so it may take 2 years for the therapy to work that is why i told beforehand that in counseling you have to tell the patients it's a 
patient's taste of yours and you have to go through so many injections to get the result. So at least start treatment six to 12 months prior to the time for pregnancy interval. So the treatment suggested in hypogonotropic hypogonadism is like HCG 500 to 2005 IU twice a week for eight to 12 weeks. What this HCG will do that increase that intertesticular testosterone and that will initiate the spermatogenesis, which is followed by the FSH and HCG combination. And that combination will continue twice, a, uh, three times a week for eight to 12 weeks. So when the patient is on therapy, you are also anxious and patient is also anxious whether this therapy is really making any, any benefit. So in, uh, to assess that whether the therapy is working, we can go about the testosterone level every two weeks. And if at all there is rise in the testosterone level, well, your uh, treatment is working. And everybody will be anxious whether they, with all these therapy, when the testosterone is increasing, whether there is increase in the sperm count also. So SQ is advisable every three months, if at all we have to follow up this patient on a longer time. So uh, like the study does mention that when the patient is having testicular volume of more than 4 ml, only HCG will work because it's just an initiation of spermatogenesis. But it's always better to add FSH to give uh, more faster result in this patient. So obviously this patient, uh, you know, it's very difficult to counsel a patient and many times we have end up our counseling and the patient like you know the male uh, partner is not ready to undergo so much of injections and finally he will be like you know let's go about like donor gametes many times it may happen that they are very open about it and they're not uh, willing to go under this procedure but those who wants as i mentioned that uh, their own genetic potential to transfer is a treatment is costly but it's an effective treatment and 12 to 24 months of treatment that induced testicular growth spermatogenesis in 80% and pregnancy rate up to 50%. So once the treatment has started, like the spontaneous pregnancy by uh, six to nine months of treatment is expected. And if there is no pregnancy in next 20 months of treatment or eight months after sperm in the ejaculate, then the next option of ART treatment is advisable. And as soon as we have like sperm count in the semen analysis, we can always store that sample and cryopreserve for the next treatment. And TISA can be done in these patients to detect the sperm. So I uh, like you know I already conveyed about the diversity part of it and uh, giving hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Let's discuss about uh, which drugs can cause hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, and that is nothing but anabolic steroid. So, uh, empirically, the people uh, like you know GPs used to have tendency to give exogenous testosterone without any evaluation, just uh, being a male factor of infertility. But uh, intratesticular testosterone concentration is almost 50 to 100 times more than the serum testosterone. And if we are giving oral or par parenteral testosterone, then we cannot achieve uh, this high level of intratesticular st testosterone. But what uh, our therapy will work, it is actually suppressing the LH and in turn suppress the intratesticular androgens because it is giving signal to the pituitary that enough amount of testosterone is there and that is why the GnRH pulse frequency will come down and the in uh, upcoming months like let's say we are giving exogenous testosterone more than six months the patient can present to us with azuspermia. So what will the treatment just stop testosterone observe over a period of eight months to one year and many of them like 90 percent will have sperm in their ejaculate at the end of one year. <clears throat> So uh, our, uh, like, you know, the 20% of this sold uh, sport nutrition supplements are having synthetic anabolic steroid. So uh, like when we, uh, the patient is very much oriented about the fitness freak and like uh, they are taking continuously these products, they can happen that because of this continuous anabolic steroid, the patient can have low semen parameters. So uh, as I said, like when the patient is uh, like, you know, taken exogenous testosterone and now you have stopped the th testosterone and you are observing over a period of six to eight months and still there is no recovery like there is no sperm in the ejaculate in this patient we can go ahead with combination therapy of hcg 3000 iu every other day and combined with letrozole the comment fsh can be added when there is no improvement in next six months so uh, the important thing is like it's very important to elicit a history Many times a patient is coming for a consultation and 
apparently everything looks normal like you know he's not having any sexual dysfunction and there is no diabetes obesity which will guide uh, like you no know, further treatment so in these patients do ask like what kind of drug he is he was on in last few months or whether he is into this uh, what you call the fitness freak medicine like you know he is continuing taking anabolic steroid through other uh, other supplements so coming to the azuspermia logical approach like i have considered uh, i have covered one part of nonotrick azuspermia so whether the semen volume can guide us how we should go about the treatment of azuspermia in yesterday also i embarked on this point that only 5% of the sperm ejaculate is like you know contributed by testes and maximum by uh, these other glands so in case of azuspermia azuspermia we may get a normal semen volume we may get a low semen volume so low semen volume azuspermia where the semen volume is less than 1 ml ph less than 7 and this azuspermia this fructose is not a, not necessary test because it's just telling whether the obstruction is beyond or above the seminal vesicles and what are the con uh, conditions of obstructive azuspermia which we come across is congenital bilateral absence of vas deferens bilateral ejaculate duct obstruction and absence of seminal vesicles so azuspermia with semen volume if at all we are having azuspermia with low semen volume uh, this is like a like you no know, we can predict this could be a case of congenital bilateral absence of vas deferens bilateral testicular atrophy where it could be a primary testicular failure or secondary testicular failure and it could be ejaculate duct obstruction where the testicular function is normal then patients with normal semen volume the as i mentioned that maximum contribution is by seminal vesicles and if at all uh, like you know the obstruction is above the seminal vesicle then uh, there could be a normal semen volume in these patients and in abnormal spermatogenesis that is nonotrophic azuspermia patient may have normal semen volume so i'm just giving an idea like where the semen volume can guide us how to evaluate that patient further so uh, what is the role of fsh the in obstetric azuspermia most of the patients will be having normal fsh unless and until the obstetric azuspermia is having impaired spermatogenesis also but can fsh is no, can fsh be normal in patients with non obstetric azuspermia so let's go to the physiology fsh this is regulated by inhibin inhibin a from sertoli cells but inhibin b b from germ cells so maturation rs cases germ cells are there but meiosis is a problem so fsh can be normal in patient with nonotrophic azuspermia so fsh is just to rule out hypoc hypoc and anabolic steroid use so in obstetric azuspermia like like what are the our options when it comes to a therapy of azuspermic patient first option is surgical sperm retrieval and what is important to choose right candidate for surgical sperm retrieval and in it's very obvious that in obstetric azuspermia the most common indication when the fsh is less than 7.6 testicular volume more than 12.5 ml and one of the testicular diameter is more than 4 cm in this patient we can directly offer uh, tsa xc there is no need of trial tc or going for the testicular biopsy and then analyzing it so now the question is like with the patients with nonotrophic azuspermia whether this microsurgical technique like surgical sperm retrieval whether suc successful or the donor is the only option in these cases so moving to nonotrophic azuspermia we should be having uh, like you know this paper has beautifully explained what could be the predictor of success in patients with nonotrophic azuspermia so if we look like there is younger age better histology lower fsh and higher testicular volume these are more better uh, predictor of uh, successful uh, surgical sperm retrieval but i want to concentrate here that this lower fsh and high testicular volume they have minimal value when it comes to the predictor of success why so so we went through a study where uh, like the non surgical azuspermia patients were divided into two groups depending on the fsh value and testicular volume and they are categorized into fsh more than 20 and volume less than 10 ml and fsh less than 20 but volume more than 10 ml in their analysis they found like there is no criteria if it's not, it's not like when the fsh is on higher side then the pre, uh, surgical sperm retrieval is giving less success and even is the same case with the testicular volume so fsh level does not indicate if any normal sperms are there in the testes so 10% of nonotrophic azuspermia sperms retrieved by 
like needle aspiration and 50% by open biopsy since larger tissue is obtained. I want to divert you to a fact that like, you know, uh, as we know that in a main, the spermatogenesis is a continuous process throughout the life that is not in case of a female. So what happens like there is a part of global spermatogenesis and focal spermatogenesis. So when we are, uh, we are treating a patient on the basis of FSH and testicular volume, we are considering a global picture. We are not considering the focal picture. So it, the, uh, the, it represents the global spermatogenesis failure, but it may happen the focal spermatogenesis in the test is still going on. And these are the patients which we can go around the therapy and give them a better outcome. The better predictor is always a histopathology because it's a giving clear cut idea, whether it's a maturation arrays, whether it's a Sertoli cell only syndrome, whether it's a germinal aplasia, or it's just, just, just a hypospermatogenesis. When it comes to a y, y, microsome, uh, y chromosome microdeletion, yesterday I mentioned that when it's AZA and AZB, we are not having uh, option of surgical sperm retrieval. It's better to offer them a donor gamete. The, then uh, one more predictor, like whether the normal testosterone and subnormal testosterone can be a predictor. So uh, like the study was done and like uh, they concluded that patients with normal testosterone of more than 300 nanogram deciliter, significantly higher chances of surgical sperm retrieval compared to those having subnormal testosterone levels. So I have made a confusion about saying the global picture and the focal picture. So how to identify the area of this focal spermatogenesis, whether the, our options are only surgical uh, sperm retrieval and whether a testicular biopsy is re really needed for diagnosis and treatment. So the systemic review in 2016, when they analyzed non-recosospermia uh, patients, whether it's acquired or it's a genetic condition, they, uh, the conclusion was the micro TC is having better results to compare to a conventional TC. The mean volume more than 12.5 ml, the better surgical sperm retrieval, that is more than 60%. And bilateral and equal unilateral surgical sperm retrieval rate is same. Higher pregnancy with fresh than crab preservation sperm, that was the analysis. But the recent analysis in 2018, they are, uh, like, you know, they are saying ki if it is a cryopreserved sperm or fresh sperm, it's not going to matter. The results are going to be same. So when we went to the meta-analysis, the micro TC is having fair better prediction, like 17% more than a conventional TC and more than a TSA. So obviously the take home message is micro TC is always better when it comes to surgical sperm retrieval. So the testicular biopsy, whether it's really needed for diagnosis and treatment, what the testicular biopsy is doing, you are just taking a small part in the testicular biopsy. And maybe we are, we are just accumulating the global picture. We are not actually targeting the focal spermatogenesis. So histology of biopsy specimen does not mirror the complete testicular parent gamma. I'm not giving impression then you keep on dissecting, dissecting till the time you're getting sperms. But this is like, you know, uh, the, the part which I want to impact that the focal spermatogenesis could be present even if the FSH and testosterone, uh, FSH is on rise and testicular volume is low. Micro TC, it's a potential uh, like, you know, so, uh, source of uh, sperm recovery. And entire tissue, believe me, it's never going to be analyzed because we have to take so many samples for that. TC analysis provide results before histopath report is available. So now, uh, the, like, you know, here in the question comes, the patient coming to you who has failed with first TC. And he's very much interested, like, and he's asking you, doctor, whether the chance is zero, if I'm going for one more chances, one more chance with the micro TC in my next consultation. So in this patient to substantiate your evidence, we can always club whenever the patient is, uh, we are doing surgical sperm retrieval and we are collecting a tissue, but we can do it simultaneously. We can uh, subject that sample, whether we are actually getting sperms in that sample and the same tissue, we can analyze histopathologically. And that will give an idea whether it's a maturation array, whether it's a certainly cell only syndrome with, and germinal aplasia. When these things, three things are there, then you can counsel that patient. Look, the histology is saying that we should not go for the second set of micro TC and the success rate will be low. So that is what, like we can, whether we can combine this TC with histopathology. 
And this is a micro TC procedure which we typically undergone. And the focal spermatogenesis, we have to dissect a little more to uh, get that tissue. And the seminiferous tubules, which is like you know higher in volume, that we can select and uh, we can uh, uh, proceed with the surgery. Uh, uh, whether uh, we can analyze, analyze whether the sperms are there in there or not. So the concept where I'm telling you the combine um, of this testicular biopsy and analysis of histopathology comes from this paper, where uh, wherein they analyze the um, testicular biopsy sample and they subjected it to uh, uh, for surgical uh, like a sperm in those sample and the tissue after the analysis like they subjected to histopathology and the histopathology will give the idea which I have mentioned already. So the testicular pool is easily uh, analyzable, practical, manageable, and more accurate for predicting surgical sperm retrieval than standard testicular biopsy. So let's not sub subject that patient again and again, uh, going first to the testicular biopsy, then results are okay, then again subjecting that patient for micro TC. It's better that we have this idea fair you know, prior to the embarking on the treatment. So uh, uh, testicular histology available after TC report, as I mentioned, so histological diagnosis is only relevance once the TC has failed. Because what the embryologist is going to do, he is going to analyze the uh, sample immediately. And if the sperms are there, we are not bothered what is the histopathology. But if at all, at the same time, we are subjecting and we are failing or we are not getting sperm in that sample, then for our next counseling, it will be helpful. So single failed case, uh, failed TC is not representative of complete, uh, complete testicular function. Simultaneous analysis reveals the larger picture to advise with surgical sperm retrieval effective treatment now and in future. So who, who, uh, who will be beneficial patients? So these are the hypospermatogenesis will be encouraged, but the atrophy will be discouraged for further attempts. So non in uh, patients with nonotric azuspermia, the micro TC was really a boon. But uh, as I mentioned, there could be some genetic abnormality which will be heritably transferred to the next offspring. So four out of 10, uh, like 37% couples of ICSI deliver in this particular study. The TC ICSI with nonotric azuspermia, only one out of seven men eventually father genetically own child. So in your counseling in patients of nonotic azuspermia, do counsel like we are actually trying uh, to have like you know sperms from the surgical sperm retrieval, but these are our ART success outcome, and the same genetic condition can be transfer uh, transmissible to the next offspring. So. Now I'm coming to a scenario. We are very rarely coming across with this scenario, like the patient with onostric azuspermia and who has already, let's say, undergone micro TC, uh, whether we can uh, do any change to improve the success of micro TC and whether there is any role of hormonal evaluation, hormonal treatment in patient with nonostric azuspermia. These studies were done before 2005 and uh, like maximum study was from urology group it's not from the uh, like clinicians which are practicing so uh, what are the hormonal treatments options are available in patient with nonotric azuspermia so in these particular studies what they have done they have, as the patient is having azuspermia report they are under they have subjected that patient to testicular biopsy and then the conclusion was derived and they have selected a specific population, like you know, those having hypospermatogenesis and maturation arrest. So, in those people, like in those group, they advise clomiphene citrate treatment, and that was titrated with the testosterone level till the time the testosterone level of 600 to 800 nanogram is achieved. They continued the CC, and post treatment, they found there is increase in the uh, sperm count, that is one to 16 million, and even the sperm concentration one arise. So sufficient sperm for ICSI by surgical sperm retrieval and even 35.7%, uh, even if they are azuspermic, there are chances uh, to get sperm in the surgical sperm retrieval. So here I'm not advising that all patients you subject to a hormonal treatment, but yes, if at all some patients are very much insistent, what we can go ahead about the treatment and then, then only the option this come. What will the next uh, hormonal treatment which we can advise to these such patients? That is FSH. So they, uh, this particular study was focused on the main with normal FSH and LH. So eugonotropic main with normal testosterone with nonotric azuspermia. In these patients, when they gave 75 IU of FSH three times a week, 
it increased the surgical sperm retrieval at micro TC. So the surgical sperm rate was increased 64% in patient with FSH treated versus 33% without treatment. So this uh, paper particularly tells that if at all the main focal or hypospermatogenesis without maturation uh, disturbances, these are the patients who are going to get benefit out of FSH therapy. So very important point. You can't give a, a therapy of FSH where it's a hypogonotropic hypogonadism in patients with onotric azuspermia. FSH treatment biopsy proven maturation arrest and normal hormonal profile result in surgical sperm retrieval of 45%. And some men with maturation arrest, even if with FSH therapy, they did not have any improvement. There could be a defect in FSH structure or activity with the, within the seminiferous tubules. <clears throat> so the recent meta-analysis about this FSH treatment and improving the outcome, obviously, as I said, that hypogonotropic hyponatism, it's not making any difference. But in uh, normal gonotropic main, the imp uh, like the pregnancy rate does improve after FSH treatment when it comes to a nonotric azuspermia. So that started with a statement that it's a very rare patients which we are coming across and we are persist insisting on their own uh, sperm. Uh, and in those patients, like when we analyze these um, papers on nonotric azuspermia. So there are two outlooks. One is ART outlook and one is urology outlook. So why I'm saying this, we have a typical guideline. Let's say a patient is having azuspermia, patient with FSH less than 7.6 and the testicular volume, which is good. In those patients, I said, we can directly go ahead with direct TC without subjecting that patient for testicular biopsy or trial TC. So patients who are having a FSH of more than 7.6 and diameter of less than 4.6, could be a focal spermatogenesis patient. And in these patients, we can go for trial TC and it's a micro TC. If at all there is sperm in the uh, sample, then we can cryopreserve that uh, sperm and they can, we can use for uh, ICSI. If there are no sperm, then histopathology will come into the picture. That is our routine protocol, how we are going with the treatment. How urology outlook in this regard, the patient of azuspermia, they will first take a testicular biopsy and they will analyze what kind of nonocytic azuspermia is, whether, whether it's a uh, subtly cell only syndrome, germinal apesia, and so on and so forth. So in this patient, when there is no sperm isolation, they subjected those patients for the hormonal, eva, hormonal treatment. That is nothing but FSH, HCG, or Clomid treatment. And then they did micro TC, and they are claiming that there is improvement in the results. So we are not following the urology outlook. We are following the ART outlook. So Limited data is supporting the hormonal treatment in nonotric azuspermia according to ASRM guidelines. So surgical sperm retrieval, uh, we can't advise patient to go undergo this procedure again and again. Poor female can go so many cycles of uh, ovarian stimulation, if at all she's a advanced maternal age, but that is not case in male. Because every insult to the testes is like you know, crossing, uh, like injuring that uh, testicular blood barrier, and it is leading more fibrosis. So, uh, the, what is important is selection of patient. The surgical scale is obviously very important, and we should know, uh, have idea what are the physiological consequences of the testicular uh, surgery. So, what are the immediate complications? These are being intertesticular bleeding, transient lesions appear, but they resolve by six months. After micro TC or any interventional procedure, in three to six months, the testosterone dropped almost 80% to the pre TC level. And the level does rise, but it takes almost 18 months. And after testicular, uh, like, you know, the surgical sperm retrieval, there is mean FSH increase too. So, testosterone deficiency requiring replacement, like, you know, maybe a risk in patients who are subjecting for surgical sperm retrieval. What could be the other consequences? This decrease in tubular volume uh, at biopsy and decrease the germ cells. So unilateral epidermal arcuitis affect the germ cells in other testes too. Then uh, this procedure can cause testicular atrophy if you are subjecting that patient for multiple cycles of TZ. And devascularization, inflammation, which is leading to fibrosis, and that will, uh, because of the diffuse parenchymal bleeding. So there could be a calcification scar like post your surgical sperm retrieval. So herein, I want to give a message that transient post-inflammation, the impaired retrieval rate 
we, if at all you want to re repeat a TC, you should at least take a six months gap before again repeating it because it may give a false result and the patient has not recovered from the last insult with the micro TC. I'm not going to the slide in detail. This is just uh, ultrasound of male genital tract and what exactly the parameters to look and how we'll get, give an idea about the male infertility causes. Herein, I'll just concentrate the testicular volume as an independent marker of SSO. And when a testicular volume is more than 9.5 ml, the retrieval, surgical sperm retrieval rate is good. And hypoc hypoc patient with testicular volume more than 4 ml has a better response to hormonal treatment than a patient with less than 4 ml volume. So uh, in the beginning, I explained, like, you know, it's very important to confirm azospermia. And those patients who are having cryptozoospermia, the treatment is ICSI. And these patients, there is, there is a nice meta-analysis where like they have uh, compared the testicular ICSI, the testicular ICSI and ejaculated ICSI in patient with cryptospermia. The logic is obvious. The testicular sperm will be having le less DNA fragmentation compared to those patients who are having in ejaculated sperm, the DNA fragmentation is high. Because in cryptospermia, it's very less amount of sperm we are going to get in the ejaculate. And those will be having high DNA fragmentation, which will affect the success of ART outcome. So testicular ICSI, with this meta-analysis, the testicular ICSI is better than ejaculated ICSI. And it has high success rate compared to uh, ejaculated ICSI. So repeated centrifugation releases more ROS. So that is why TSA is better. So obviously, we can't subject all cryptospermia patient to go for testicular ICSI. Then how we can differentiate between that? So ejaculated sperm, we can advise in young age with normal semen analysis. Uh, no, uh, I forgot. Sorry for this. The young age with cryptospermia, uh, necros necrospermia, oligospermia, and teratosospermia and idiopathic oats. The testicular sperm, high DNA fragmentation, cryptozoospermia, patients of recurrent implantation failure, and azoospermia patient with uh, obstructive, uh, the, the patho when the, it's obstructive azoospermia, and unexplained RPL. So it will make difference in unexplained RPL because it could be a cause that high DNA fragmentation is not giving result. So no difference in outcome when it comes to a fresh and frozen sperm, which I already mentioned. So uh, to conclude, like surgical sperm retrieval, the best candidate would be azospermia with FSH more than 7.6, normal testicular volume more than 12.5 ml, osteotic azospermia and cryptozoospermia. Trial TC in a group where the FSH is less, more than 7.6, uh, but less than tw uh, 20, and look at the testicular volume. It's better to offer donor when it, the FSH value has crossed beyond 20, like small atrophic testes, and testicular volume less than 4 ml. So the question is whether we had done all these jugglers and now we have like, you know, have a, a sperm in the surgical sperm retrieval sample. So whether these paternal factors contribute to the embryo quality. Let me take this slide. So in this particular, this is uh, the cleavage rate is altered. There is poor embryo development and decreased blastocyst formation with poor embryo quality. And there are unemployed embryos with high number of grade 3 embryos and implantation failure and pregnancy failure. So in your counseling, we have to advise the patient, those we are doing with so many procedures and treatments, so there, this could be a result. So uh, uh, before embarking any treatment, it's better to add, like, you know, make the patient aware about these things. So uh, when we compare osteotic azospermia, nonotric azospermia with other parameters, whether there is any difference between the blastocyst formation rate, morphology, and coming to a live birth rate. So this study beautifully analyzed and they categorize the uh, factors into five groups where it's a normal semen analysis, mild male factor of infertility, oats, osteotic azospermia, and nonosteotic azospermia. So in this particular study, what they found, like, you know, when it comes to a blastocyst, uh, fertilized oocyte, it's not making any much difference. And uh, as I mentioned, like basis per fertilized oocyte is not making any non, uh, it's not statically significant. But when it comes to a non fertic azospermia, so in this patient, there is continuous decline when it's come to a euploid per blastocyst, liber per ET, and liber per incompleted cycles. And obviously, the patient with non fertic azospermia, like they may have to uh, give multiple cycles to achieve these results. 
so coming to a neonatal outcome in uh, like in how if these procedures are going to have the neonatal outcome so there is no difference in mean birth weight and it comes to the perinatal and neonatal mortality rate the congenital malformation doesn't differ whether it's a male factor of infertility rather than in a control group but what they found that congenital cardiac malformation rate was higher compared to the normal normal uh, conception and conventional ivf and a patient as the severity of male infertility increases the rate of und undescended test is also increases and in the study study uh, in the study study almost of 30000 infants when they went through they born out of the icsi had higher autistic disorder in tc pregnancies so 8 out of 6 28 had this problem so what is important the holistic approach to the couple is important whatever i explain about the azospermia evaluation and treatment we have to consider couple as a whole before embarking on the treatment do consider the female factor if at all we can do all these juggleries and we can subject the patient to go through the surgical sperm retrieval so far and so on only when the wife is young and you don't want her to carry all the burden like when we are uh, we have chance to correct that male factor of infertility thank you thank you see now since L lot of genetic labs have come so all these uh, it's not azospermia it could be oligospermia also and then we subject them to uh, karyotypes and a report comes uh, uh, enlarged satellite in chromosome 15 so can you just gu guide us about how do you look at it what exactly uh, uh, how do you counsel such a couple or the so patient enlarged satellite chromosome 15 yeah There is an enlarged satellite in a particular chromosome. I think it's. I don't know. And the these are also period. patients of RPL. Also, you know, when you subject them to these karyotypes, you have such reports. So, how do you really? Uh, I'm not a genetist. No, I understand. Yeah, but you also must be probably going through such reports. These are these are normal variations. So they hardly matter. And many times when I have googled it out, because sometimes when I don't understand, I google it out. It all comes under the rare genetic disease uh, website. It goes. <laughs> and then they have some anecdotal reports like so that. so what so what do you what do you tell I the patients tell those couples you just try again because nature is great i don't even advise pgt or nothing i advise you i just keep telling them to no no see uh, okay and another scenario couple of repeated pregnancy loss and such a report yeah, yeah. so so what do you do so no? normal variation I, i wouldn't do much okay i wouldn't do much. so uh, is there a role of pgt at all you know sir front of us is normal he is having a defect genetically but he is normal See, this genetic platforms have taken such a big leap. There are so many diagnoses that are uh, like the ASCAS, no, the pathology Pap smear one. So they are just putting in that. So we don't know what the answer is. And as uh, Dr. Sachin said, uh, we will just refer it to the medical geneticists. They have to opine whether this is clinically significant or relevant or not. If they say because RPL, so many times we send karyotype and they come out with some very you know uh, reports which we don't know. the medical geneticist job is to figure that out and tell us whether this is clinically relevant or not if they say it's not clinically relevant we'll leave it and move ahead you know that's so i would like yeah, to, to add on uh, to this same point like uh, with the genetic advances we are subjecting all these people for the uh, it was not only related to karyotyping and ycmd deletion and all so uh, many of us are like you know advising a full exome genome sequencing like next generation sequence and that is why it is actually picking so many micro deletions and like we, we are really not aware whether what is the clinical relevance to give an example we last six months we had one uh, doctor couple and like uh, they were having uh, recurrent implantation failure and uh, like you know that doctor took effort to subject that patient undergoing this full genome sequencing and it's a very rare micro deletion we had to google and take out the inference from that and no, yeah and uh, like you see the psychological aspect he was such in depression like you know i'm not able to give result being the semen analysis is quite normal there is no abnormal parameters in that and uh, it's very difficult to digest I, I, and uh, to give the fact that you are having some genetic abnormality 
uh, I think we should I, we should not subject the patient for more. It so happened so, that they had uh, just two blastocysts and uh, one turned out to be uh, both turned out to be aneuploid. And because of that, they decided themselves that they want to have a complete evaluation for themselves. And they went through all these tests. But we are still nowhere. Basically, having two aneuploid blastocysts in one cycle doesn't mean anything. Yeah. You could be having four euploid blastocysts in the very next cycle. And that has to be conveyed to them. We, we are going to cover it in my embryology lecture. So just one. Uh, so exactly this uh, happens. Uh, satellite heterochromatin in chromosome 15. I have seen three, four reports in last six months. And they write it's a normal variant but could be a reason for recurrent pregnancy loss. So when I, yeah, so when we talk to a genetic, I talk personally to my genetic counselor because she's directly not available to counsel patients. So she says that if all other parameters are normal and uh, you find the female karyotype is normal, but the male is having a heterochromatin or satellite uh, chromosome 15, then that could be a possible reason. So the only best thing that we can do in uh, Orissa, it's not very easy to send for PGT and all, and it's costly also. Most people won't afford. So um, it's only about counseling that we can say that, see, this minor problem has come in your genetic report. So it's up to you whether you want to continue with your gamut or you go for a donor. That's all. Well, thank you so much, all of you. And uh, we'll go for lunch and uh, we'll be back here after 40 minutes. Thank you very much. We would just uh, a humble request to all of you to uh, do visit the stalls as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
हेलो
हेलो हेलो Check one, hey. Two. Check one, hey. Two. Check one. हेलो हेलो या यू कैन ये तो फिर ज़ूम से जो इनकमिंग आ रही है उसकी है पर आप यहाँ से ट्राई करोगे तो अच्छा है क्योंकि यहाँ से आप उठ जाते हेलो डेस्ट माइक डेस्ट वन टू थ्री
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so we're starting with the afternoon session just now, and uh, I'll be speaking to you about the luteal support and endometrial preparation, and then we will uh, go through some protocols on GNRH agonist stop protocol, uh, PPOS, and we'll quickly go through a small revision of protocols as well, and uh, uh, what the embryological information uh, as a clinician you should know about, and we will finish these topics with all of you. Obviously, luteal support and endometrial preparation is a very vast topic, and I think uh, day in and day out, uh, we are concerned about it, and our clients spend now, now with a lot of uh, freeze-all policy being executed by many gynecologists and IVF centers, we keep on uh, spending a lot of time thinking about the ways to prepare our endometrium and what, to, what luteal support to give, etc. So I'm just putting up a few views on the luteal support and endometrial preparation as I know about it. And we can always have some question and answer and Dr. Goody and Dr. Sherry will contribute to that. So if you go through a comparison between the uh, typical natural menstrual cycle, ovulatory cycle, and that of a stimulated cycle, what you find typically is the FSH, which is coming down in the later part of the cycle, doesn't take place in a stimulated cycle. We are pumping in FSH injection day after other, and the FSH level just keeps going up. And the natural LH surge is different. It has, uh, we have learned from Dr. Goody yesterday, that it goes up for 14 hours, stays there as a plateau for 14 hours, and then comes down uh, in about next 20 hours. So in a period of over 48 hours, the LH surge is practically over. When it comes to HCG, the HCG lingers around for a long time there until about six or 6.5 days, the HCG is seen in the circulation. So probably your, uh, the luteal phase, the part of the luteal phase gets covered uh, for a long time there. But the problem is the HCG is a very, very strong drug. And it is very, very steroidogenic compared to the LH alone. And with HCG, uh, normally when the LH surge takes place, the LH level go up to 60 to 80 MIU. With HCG, with 12 hours of trigger, uh, almost about 120 MIU of HCG will be there, which will correspond to nearly 800 IU of LH. That's a huge LH surge. So the peak progesterone level achieved is very high. And the way the progesterone level goes up in a HCG, that within six hours, the progesterone will be measured in circulation. While in a routine LH surge, it may take about 24 hours for the LH to, uh, progesterone to appear in the circulation. The levels will go beyond ovulation, then the surge of progesterone, which will take place and not at the onset of LH surge. And so HCG is a bit different. And with HCG taking the LH-like activity to such a high degree, the pituitary will get suppressed and the LH will fall that drastically the after six days, the support of the corpus luteum will go away. And the innate blastocyst will come, uh, will start uh, secreting the hyperglycosylated HCG after beyond 7.5 days, and that will take some time. So we are creating a window or a luteal hole, as we understand in my first lecture, with HCG trigger as well, with multiple follicles. And that needs to be supported. And beyond 6.5 days, there could be a progesterone low, a luteal hole, which needs to be adequately supported. And the luteal support will be needed with multiple follicles, HCG trigger. Don't allow, don't assume that HCG will be a complete luteal support by itself. And this is worsened when we give GNRH trigger. Where GNRH agonist trigger, again, as we understand, in four hours time, there's a peak of LH activity. And over the next 14 hours, it just comes down. So practically within 20 hours, the LH activity totally disappears. So as the follicles get luteinized, immediately the LH level starts falling and there is severe luteolysis. So within about four to five days of the GNRH agonist trigger, the progesterone level have come down very drastically that causes severe luteolysis of the corpus luteum. And there's a huge window period where the progesterone level is very, very low. And it's a challenge for all of us to correct that uh, GNRH agonist induced luteolysis and have a normal luteal phase. And it's a real challenge wherein we learned yesterday that Peter Humadan way of going with HCG are adding 1500 IU of HCG there, but an American way of putting intramuscular progesterone and vaginal progesterone together and with some estrogen as well. So it's very paradoxical that we need to do most at implantation, but sadly our protocols lead to deficiencies exactly at the implantation. And that's why the importance of knowing and learning about luteal support is so very important for all of us. As I told this earlier as well, yesterday, that 
the blastose secretes a hyperglycosylated HCG, which stimulates the ERK pathway, which are anti-apoptotic pathway, and they make the corpus luteum survive better. While the HCG works on the cyclic AMP pathway, the receptor is the same, but two different pathways are stimulated. And that's why it is more steroidogenic. So what are the ways we can give progesterone? This is vaginal, intramuscular, subcutaneous, or oral progesterone. You can use HCG also as a luteal support. And some women will come to you after two or three cycles of IVF fails. They will say, please don't give me progesterone injections. I'm sick of them. Don't give me so many things to take orally, vaginally, intramuscularly through the progesterone support. Can you give me a progesterone-free luteal support? And that's where HCG is so very physiological and that can come into play. That we will learn it as we do a modified uh, natural cycle endometrial preparation. HCG alone would be more than sufficient as you're supporting the luteal phase. Some people have even attempted giving GNRH agonist. Like the other day I was reading a paper, we give GNRH agonist trigger wherein we give about 3 ml of lupride of 0.2 of decapeptine. And herein they give 1 ml of lupride every 12 hours, 3 doses. So they are triggering the LH activity at 3 different intervals. Obviously the severe luteolysis may not take place. And this particular kind of trigger, may, you may be able to save that cycle. But I was thinking whether we can use such kind of a trigger in rescue IV, instead of going for rescue IV of with hyperstimulated ovaries in IUI cycles, we can just give this kind of a trigger and you will be able to manage the luteal support better. So GNRH agonist uh, luteal support is also been practiced. This whole concept of giving GNRH agonist came very early, about 2003, 2005 paper, where they gave one dose of GNRH agonist six days after OPU. And they realized that their pregnancies were better. And because that giving GNRH uh, agonist injection will again increase the LH activity. And those days were of those days of fresh embryo transfer, giving more LH support and purpose luteum will survive and chances of pregnancy would be better. So what do we want to use? A vaginal progesterone or an intramuscular progesterone? And we are looking for a verdict on this. Again, the new player is a didrogesterone. And how does it stand? How does it fare in our practice? Is there any importance of doing progesterone levels in FET? And how do we do endometrial preparations, different ways and uterine importance of uterine peristalsis. And that's my agenda when I'm presenting to you this presentation. Oral progesterone obviously has a short half-life, it rapidly metabolizes to 17 hydroxyprogesterone. is hardly any bioavailable progesterone is there. So orally, never, never, never give micronized progesterone. I think India and China must be the only countries where oral progesterone is a big business, multi-crore, multi-million business. Otherwise, no other country has oral progesterone but for hydrogestone as a commercial model. And stupidly, our gynecologists proclaim that they know so much about it, and we all prescribe oral progesterones. The only trial way back came on oral progesterone and how it came into our market was on a postmenopausal woman taking progesterone to have a better endometrial health and better health. And that trial we accumulated and we started using so much of oral progesterone, and which is absolutely a waste of practice. What about intramuscular progesterone? Gone are the days of intramuscular uh, oil-based preparation because they have so much amount of problems with local issues, inflammation, myositis. Even some patients would have suffered from abscesses. So we have come out of it. Uh, but still, the American people still believe in giving intramuscular progesterone to maintain a good serum level because I think for them to show the report is very important. The ladies there are also very huge. Vaginal progesterone is a way to practice ahead because vaginal progesterone is universally accepted. A worldwide survey done some years back of the kind of luteal support everybody gives, 80% of the IVF clinics all over the world agreed that they all give vaginal support. And uh, the Paul Devroy group or the Belgium group is all their consultants, they give only vaginal support. A very few of them even give diatrogesterone. So vaginal support is very much famous. And that is supposed to have a very good endometrial concentration. And probably that is the reason there. What about vaginal and intramuscular progesterone? What could be the verdict? And we are seeking answer to the question is, what is the target? Do we want a good endometrial progesterone level or do we want a good serum progesterone level? And what is going to give us a good pregnancy? So I was just going through this beautiful paper. Uh, I would request all of you to read, uh, published in 2019. This is about analysis of serum and endometrial progesterone in determining endometrial receptivity, uh, published by Elena Labata. And she's traveling probably the whole of Europe, putting up this paper. And this is really very really nicely conducted trial. In this particular trial, what they did was they did a simple HRT preparation of endometrium, where they were given progynova 4 milligram to 6 milligram a day. As the endometrium became trilamina pattern beyond 6.5 millimeter, and the serum progesterone was less than 1 nanogram, that's the point they shifted them into progesterone. And they gave vaginal progesterone 400 milligram BID was given to them. And after the progesterone was done, after 6 days, after 5 days of progesterone, on 6th day morning, 
they did an endometrial biopsy. The endometrial biopsy went for an endometrial progesterone level. An endometrial biopsy also went for an endometrial receptivity assay by proteomics method. And also they collected serum progesterone levels at the same time. So we had all the information on serum progesterone, endometrial progesterone, and endometrial receptivity assay. And the correlation was very simple. And they started doing linear regression for all these things. And let's see what are the results. The results are if the serum progesterone level is less than 8.8 .8 nanogram, in spite of such low level, 37.1% of the time, it was a receptive endometrial era report was receptive. And when the serum progesterone was beyond 8.8 .8 nanograms, the receptive era was seen only in 40% of the patient. In spite of high progesterone level, serum level, era receptivity was not there in 60% of the patients. And high receptive era report was corresponding more to the high endometrial progesterone beyond 40.1 microgram. So receptive era was hardly any correlated to that of the serum progesterone levels existing there. So serum progesterone levels did not correlate with endometrial progesterone nor with endometrial receptivity in this particular study. Uh, endometrial progesterone is related to endometrial receptivity. So Labata and Shaha et al. in 2019, they said good serum progesterone level is necessary, but for maintenance of pregnancy, so as to avoid miscarriages in an IVF pregnancy, what you get. So what is the role of serum progesterone? Vaginal progesterone maintains a good endometrial receptivity and serum or subcutaneous progesterone is for pregnancy maintenance and that is the best strategy to follow. So if you want to give a luteal support, don't doubt it, give a subcutaneous progesterone to maintain a good serum level because that will decrease your miscarriages later and good uh, endo vaginal progesterone to maintain a good endometrial receptivity because it is the serum progesterone which is important in increasing the TH2 kind of immune tolerance activity in the endometrium and which is related to having a good pregnancy and continuing the pregnancy further. What about didrogesterone? I think this has been, I think didrogesterone is just about to become a billion rupees or a billion dollar business in India, isn't it? Everybody's come, coming out there. Lastly, goody, even they can load a didro goody also. You'll never know. They will soon come out with a tablet called Didro Goody. So many names of Didro are there in India. And uh, I think that I'm quoting only one paper by George Gissinger. This is then individual patient data meta-analysis, which he presented. And he, he very proudly talks about this particular paper. He proudly says that we started off using didrogestron as a non-inferiority trial, and we are proving it to be a superiority trial. Because look at the ongoing pregnancy rate. The the whole graph, this is, is on the positive side of the line of unity and the confidence intervals are also on the positive side. That is, it is not only clinically significant, it is statistically significant. And um, then look at the uh, age and all the, all the parameters, they're all on the side of the unity and they're not only clinically significant, they're statistically significant. They said, so didrogestron is a superiority trial. And he says that this is the best. And all our Indian companies have just taken this particular slide and they're saying, thumbs up, this is the best million dollar business. The next, next time you want to go to ASHRAE, you know what to prescribe. But go through the individual patient meta-analysis. There is no FET cycle. They're all fresh embryo transfer cycles. And if I ask you, out of the 100 cases you do in a year, how many are FET? And you will say 80% are FET cycles. And you are, are you using didrogestron? You say, yes, sir, we are using didrogestron. But there is no evidence at all. So is there an evidence of using didrogestron in FET cycle? So let's look into the literature. So this is a beautiful paper published by Dracopoulos et al. says the future of luteal phase support in ART and the role of didrogestron. And he only studied the papers where they use didrogestron in an FET cycle. I think this is more relevant to our practice than the blue slide we saw earlier. And see the results, nothing is significant. Okay, there is no p-value which is significant. So when you use didrogestron in FET cycle, it's just not significant at all. And then let's go through one more study, which is published by Zairi et al. And in this study, look at the didrogestron clinical pregnancy rate. It is lower than vaginal progesterone. But we all use didrogestron as if it's our great friend. Okay? Just a paper has been published in just now. July 2022, human reproduction of using of didrogestron in early pregnancy and its role in maintenance pregnancy. I've not gone through, but probably it could be telling a different story again. So we went into a, another paper. This is a beautiful paper on didrogestron, which talks because the problem is 
serum progesterone is measurable. The didrogestron does not get measured as serum progesterone. And we are not doing serum didrogestron levels because it involves a huge technology there. And companies are introducing didrogestron after didrogestron, but nobody is providing the technology to all your laboratories all over India to estimate the serum didrogestron level. So this is the only paper which was published on didrogestron level. So they had dihydrogestron levels and 20 alpha dihydrogestron plasma levels on the day of embryo transfer and clinical outcome in an annulatory program thaw cycle. And it's very relevant. Are we making a true difference there? So the mean quartile of plasma level of didrogestron after giving three days of didrogestron is 1.36. And that's pretty good. So you achieve good serum didrogestron level within three days. So if you're doing blastocyst or cleavage stage, you're still achieving a good serum didrogestron level. By day five, the level doesn't go up much. It is just 1.04. It's not statistically significantly low. So by we can just say by three days, you achieve the peak serum didrogestron level. You can see that. Concomitant food intake this is very important. Concomitant food intake and enterohepatic circulation is there when you take orally didrogestron. And that enterohepatic circulation makes the didrogestron get absorbed more and more. So this is a tablet to be taken after food, not before food. And this particular advice, we don't give it to our patients. So they looked at doing a serum didrogestron level three to four hours after the food intake. But there was level difference was there, but statistically over a period of time, the live birth rate, everything was not different. So they did not say much about it. We did give an important message that didrogestron is to be taken after food. And what about the correlation of didrogestron and dehydrodidrogestron levels in serum? They all correlate. The linear regression said, well, it just correlates very well. So both are in correlation. And what about that? They, they put linear regression with body weight, the body mass index. And you look at the R value, it is coming down. Okay, that means with higher body mass index, the patient maintains lower and lower levels of didrogestron and dehydroxy didrogestron. That means in certain cutoff would be there beyond which you will have to give beyond 30 milligrams of didrogestron as a luteal support. And you cannot restrict to 30 milligrams because you need, need a higher level, higher dose because the BMI decreases the serum level. So it did say that if the serum level is kept low, there was a cutoff uh, for about uh, something about 0.8 or so, then only the pregnancy rate improved. And then they plotted these circles. The circles are actually, uh, the pregnancies obtained are the black circles and the hollow circles are the pregnancies not obtained. And they put estradiol level on the Y axis and the didrogestron level on the X axis. So look at this part. This part of the story, when didrogestron level and estrogen level both are low, there are no pregnancies. So there is a story to tell that we have to achieve a certain amount of didrogestron level to have to have a successful pregnancy. So didrogestron alone 30 milligram a day, what would be the ongoing pregnancy rate and live birth rate? It is suboptimal since as a singular therapy. So when they give didrogestron, look at the, look at the live birth rate. This is pretty low. So alone didrogestron is not going to give you a good pregnancy. So you can't use didrogestron alone in as a luteal support. So your luteal support would be either a vaginal progesterone and a subcutaneous progesterone, or your luteal support will be oral didrogestron and a vaginal progesterone. You cannot come out of vaginal progesterone as a luteal support at all. So it is, it is, it is a must to convince our patient that you better take the vaginal progesterone properly. The vaginal progesterone faces a problem of absorption. It's a rate limiting step. They have done studies where they have put 400, 600 milligram and they have put 1,200 milligrams of vaginal progesterone. The 1,200 milligram dose could not increase the serum levels. So vaginal absorption is a rate limiting step there. But it improves the, though not serum, it improves well the endometrial progesterone level and which is in turn responsible for good pregnancies. So let's come to another topic of what is the importance of progesterone levels in frozen embryo transfer cycles. Firstly, is the low progesterone level and high progesterone level is a difference because we all know that all these hormones are secreted in a pulsatile fashion. But what the literature tells us, these are very old papers, which tells us that when they did serum progesterone level, almost every half an hour they did it in a very few patients. And they realized when the serum progesterone is low, it is really low there is hardly any fluctuation. So if a patient is giving you a low serum progesterone level, that means definitely she is maintaining a low level. 
If you're maintaining a high level, well, there could be fluctuations. But in low level, it is definitely a low level. So this is definitely significant that serum progesterone level can be maintained low in some subgroup of women. On that background, let's understand a little further. So vaginal progesterone fact check, which I already told you, that lower absorption due to coitus, low compliance, difference in absorption and distribution. If the lady doesn't get enough private time to put her gel or tablet properly, she will put it in the just inside the introitus and probably it may not do a proper action. So that training, any nurse in your hospital is giving that training, just cross-check. Low progesterone level in one-third of women taking 600 milligram vaginal progesterone in spite of 1200 milligram dose, few women have low levels of progesterone and increasing dose does not proportionally increase progesterone. And individual metabolism is again different. So what about, we went, this is an immense number of patient papers presented on the serum progesterone levels and universal acceptance that the serum progesterone level on the day of ET or a one day prior to ET, if it's less than 10 nanograms, it is a low progesterone level. So people have devised their own, their own variations, like, you know, they will do it, then they will add, uh, they won't thaw them, they will thaw the embryo, but don't put it, they will culture it further to make it a blastocyst and they will give subcutaneous progesterone, then again, check the levels up there, and then if the progesterone level goes up, then only transfer out freeze again. I think it's all a lot of jugglerys done there. I, I won't recommend to practice such jugglerys. But definitely, are you achieving a good progesterone level? And the trials are saying, see, what they did beautifully is they, sub, they made different quartiles of serum progesterone level. Less than 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, etc. So when the levels, the quartile was between 20 to 30 and beyond 30, having a low level and a high level did not make a difference. That means the level between 22 and 29 has the same pregnancy rate. But when the quartile was 10, the cutoff was 10 and 20, the, it made a difference. Maintaining a higher level of progesterone had a better result. So I think we can assume 10 as our cutoff, but most of the trials are saying 11, 9.2, 9.5, 10. So let's put 10 as a cutoff, as a universal cutoff, that below which if the progesterone level is there, your pregnancy rates could be low. So, but there came a Woloski trial. And this Woloski trial talked about uh, that serum progesterone level on the day of embryo transfer doesn't make a difference. He said, well, it is, uh, you, you have any amount, any level, the pregnancy rates are the same. And that was exactly the contrast of all the studies published by Elena Labata. So, but actually they are, the results are diagrammatically, they were results are opposite to the previous trials, but it was not an observational trial. You know, actually they published it as an observational trial, but actually it was an interventional trial. In the Woloski group, what they did was, whenever the serum progesterone level was less than eight nanogram, they did intervention. They gave subcutaneous progesterone as an additional progesterone support. So they should have published it titling, if the serum progesterone is low, addition of an intervention of intramuscular subcutaneous progesterone improves the pregnancy rate. So it's a very false, uh, uh, way of presenting the trial, the serum progesterone doesn't have a value. It was an interventional trial. They did realize the importance of that. And this is another paper which is telling us, well, there is a window period. There is a window of progesterone levels when you get the highest pregnancy rate. At a low progesterone level, your pregnancy rates are low and a very high progesterone level, also pregnancy rates are low. And, but the thing to understand is, once all the progesterone receptors in the endometrium are saturated with progesterone, taking the serum progesterone levels high is not going to make much changes in the endometrium. So there's one particular study, but other studies are not saying that. So on the higher side, we don't have any cutoffs to say that your ongoing pregnancy rate and live birth rate will come down. This is an interesting study. I purposefully put it because I'm not comparing two studies here of serum progesterone, which was done by Thompson et al. earlier in human reproduction and another study by these authors, wherein in the materials and methods said that it was a typical antagonist cycle. They gave an HCG trigger. They did a fresh embryo transfer, but Dufaston alone, 30 milligram a day was given as progesterone support. And they did progesterone level on the day of embryo transfer. So look at, this is the present study. Look at this. What if the progesterone level is between 60 to 100, they are the, high, they are the uh, lowest pregnancy rate. And the progesterone level went beyond 400, this pregnancy rates were still very high. Am I right? I'm I putting the, yeah, I'm putting, correct. The pregnancy, live birth rate was very high. But when they did without Dufaston, the earlier study, which was done by Thonson et al. in 2018, in this 6200 group, they had the highest pregnancy rate, which is low here. 
And as the progesterone level increased and beyond, went, went beyond 400 nanomoles, then you had the lowest pregnancy rate. Now, why this difference? Because when you go to fast on, it is paradoxical. The dufaston suppresses the corpus luteal secretion of progesterone. It is a negative inhibition. And because of that, the serum progesterone drops. And dufaston doesn't get measured as progesterone. So this, in spite of this progesterone being low here, your pregnancy rates are still, uh, sorry, uh, this progesterone being high here, the pregnancy rate has not suffered because it's nothing to do with that serum progesterone level. Your dufaston is acting there as a progesterone support. How about endometrial preparation? The commonest endometrial preparation, the easiest way to do is an HRT cycle, and this is what we follow. I'm not going to go into details of this. We all are practicing day in and day out, wherein you are going ahead with uh, progynova for some period of time. The typical question comes is how many minimum days of progynova? I would say minimum nine days because it takes that much time to endometrium to mature. Maximum how days? Well, you can go any any limit. There is no limit, particular limit, but the uh, significantly the pregnancy rates come down if it, you go beyond 28 days. The few trials have gone all the way to 30, 35 days. But most of the trials are saying they are given uh, uh, progynova for a period of 16 to 18 days. And if a certain endometrium thickness is not achieved, they have cancelled the cycle. So I think we go by that. So I feel the period is also important. A certain period you should achieve a certain thickness. And you will look at the endometrium should be beyond 7 to 8 millimeter. E2 level should be 150. Your progesterone should be less than one nanogram. Doppler question mark, I, I may do, I may not do. Uh, it's, it's more of a consensus-based practice in India, not huge evidence. The endometrium which prepares well will have a good blood, blood flow anyway. And then put progesterone. Uh, and on day four, you do day three transfers, day three cleavage transfer, day six, you'll do blastocyst transfer. And on day six, uh, day six blastocyst also you do on day six transfer. And I prefer giving a small injection of progesterone uh, either on the previous day intramuscularly on the day morning of the embryo transfer. After four hours, we do an embryo transfer uh, only to make the uterus a little quiet. I'm not a great fan of atosiban in my practice. Uh, those are a few trials published on that, but I'm not, I'm not, don't ask me any question on atosiban, but that's not my practice. I prefer progesterone because progesterone, as I understand, will stabilize and quieten the uterus, myometrium, as well as the junctional zone. And that's what I do. Then certain cases you'll be down-regulating them. And when do you down-regulate? You will down-regulate in patients who have adenomyosis, endometriosis, fibroids, you know, out of myometrial fibroids, I wouldn't down-regulate, but a junctional zone, yes. Or you could be down-regulating for scheduling and batching purposes. The question comes is how much to down-regulate? One injection of Lupred depot, or the two injection or three injection or whatever. I think it depends upon your indication. When you give first injection of Lupred depot, what will happen? That loop, there'll be a flare. With flare, a few follicles will start functioning and they will secrete estrogen. Those follicles will not ovulate, but estrogen will linger in the body for a period of 10 to 12 days, and then it will start coming down. So you're going to give a Lupride depot today, and immediately you're starting a preparation in seven days, your Lupride depot is not acted at all. So many a times if I'm down-regulating, especially for purpose of endometriosis and adenomyosis, I'll end up giving two Lupride depots because I need a real quietness there. Then again, it is individualistic, depending upon the, let's say I'm talking of adenomyosis. If I'm diagnosing adenomyosis for the presence of myometrial cysts or maybe sun ray patterns or some heterogeneous lesions in the myometrium, I will give two or three Lupride depot and allow them to settle down, let them settle. They literally settle on ultrasound. And that's the time I feel the down regulation is complete. The ideal test would have been to know the Hoxha 10 expression in the endometrium, but sadly this test is not available. So what we realize is endometriosis and adenomyosis, there is a decreased Hoxha 10, a homeobox, 10 genes, which are the implantation genes, and that is what is the, that is the reason for failure of implantation and pregnancies. So by down-regulating them, you're increasing the Hoxha 10 expression in the endometrium, and wherein you are increasing the pregnancy rate. But sadly, that particular test is a research tool and not available to us. So we will give Lupred depots and get menses, and typically the HRT cycle similarly will follow as after down-regulation. What about modified natural cycle FET? And this is what we do in modified natural cycle. So the patient will come on day two or day three, and I will look at the endometrium if it is thin, and if the ovaries are quiet, like there's no, no dominant follicle there, I'm happy to start off. I may not do these tests. I will do these tests only if I see a cyst there. Then I just want to know whether it is secreting progesterone. You know, that's, that's the reason I will do it. Otherwise, most of the time I won't do this. Then in between is all chill, Ramdev Baba, pray, you look some YouTube videos, hear jokes, have family time. You know? So they really do nothing. They come straight to me on day nine, day 10 of the cycle. And I look at the endometrium 
and a dominant follicle. I'm looking for a dominant follicle, which is 16 millimeter or more, and an endometrium. In such a preparation, even if an endometrium is 6.5 millimeter, triple line, I'm happy about it. I'm not so insistent, insistent that I should get a seven and eight millimeter endometrium. That, that may not be a true story for everybody. And you'll keep canceling your cases. And then I will just uh, do, uh, I, I will give an HCG injection, but I will do these levels. I'll check for the estrogen level, uh, should be beyond 100, 150 picogram. Again, many studies are saying, if your endometrium is triple line, good beyond 6.5 millimeter, there is no need to do estrogen levels. And there are a few studies saying that if the estrogen level is beyond 150 or better pregnancy, you can do it, you don't do it, it's left to you, but not a great important thing. Uh, I'll do a progesterone level, it should be less than one. And LH, as Mohan Kamath said, that LH should be less than 17. Once it, LH goes beyond 17, it, the trigger has started. LH has started surging. So that's why the level should be less than 17. If that is so, I'll do this in the morning. By afternoon, four hours, I'll get all the reports. If everything is fine, I'll just give HCG here. And after giving HCG, then I will do an embryo transfer. And how, how the, that calculation, I'll have another slide to show you. So this is the way I do my natural cycle or modified natural cycle embryo transfer. I've seen some people doing only the progesterone level. They wouldn't even bother doing LH. Like Mohan Kamath sir doesn't do LH. He just go by urinary LH, uh, which could be positive after 12 hours. One would do just the progesterone level. If the progesterone is less than one, you can just go ahead. Because of ERA test and a lot of marketing by these commercial companies, that window of implantation is getting fixed in our brain. But remember, we see ectopic pregnancies. Where is the window of implantation? And we see it very commonly. Right? And it can grow. You intervene not to grow. So don't get very much window of implantation sensitive. Uh, it is a 12 hours flexible here and there, and you still get pregnancies. What about true natural cycle? Little difficult to practice, I feel, because a lot of our clients come from distances and you can't make them come again and again. Again, the same thing, chill Ramdev Baba, et cetera. And you may have to call them on every day, do a scan, look at the endometrium and dominant follicle beyond 16, and you will be doing LHE2 progesterone. The, the, this is the protocol which has been recommended by Barbara Lawrence and Human Katemi. And they said it's time to go back to natural cycle. In their protocol, they say they do these levels. So it becomes a little cumbersome to do these levels every day and you know, answer all the questions to the patient. And they say that when on the day of LH surge, as the LH surge starts, there is no progesterone, the estrogen is high. On the next day of LH surge, the progesterone is not yet there, but the estrogen has dropped and the LH is going up. And the next day, the, uh, your progesterone starts rising up. So this drop in estrogen is, is the thing which you pick up and that's the surging day. That's how they interpret it. But the problem is only 30% of the patients will have a drop in estrogen. And again, I told you yesterday in my first lecture that LH, natural LH surge will be different from patient to patient, where every 30% of the patients will have different kinds of natural LH surges, and which may not be very uh, satisfactory for our embryo transfers. And that's why we prefer doing modified natural cycles. An Anil, about you? Natural cycles, okay. We always differ. So this is what we go with as you plan your fresh transfers and HRT, uh, when you start progesterone, when you transfer the cleavage stage and when you do the blastosis. In the true natural cycle, you know, we notice the LH surge. Many times it could be a retrospective diagnosis and then you, then you go back on the fifth day. When you give HCG, that's your day of trigger. The OP will come here. So on the fifth day of HCG, in a modified natural cycle, you will do a cleavage stage. On the seventh day, you will be doing a blastosis transfer. But again, we should be going to ovulatory-based FET cycles because they achieve more pregnancies. Because uh, with HRT-based cycle, there is lack of corpus luteum. There is no corpus luteum there. Your pregnancy outcomes will suffer. And high amount of placental ischemias and IUGRs and pregnancy uh, preeclampsia have been noted. So typically, ovulatory-based cycle will use letrozole for five days. You can use five milligram letrozole for five days. Scan on day nine. Ovitril, you can give when the follicle is 18 millimeter with seven millimeter or more FET endometrial thickness. And this is a stimulation FET. Uh, many times in a milder case of polycystic ovary, I wouldn't stimulate very hard, but I, I, may, I may use the protocol suggested by BN Chakravarti of giving just two HMG doses and two day two and day six. So I try and convert uh, many of PCOs which are inducible into a ovulatory based FET so as to get little more pregnancy rates and not so HRT cycle uh, cycles are much lesser in our unit. We more go more go towards ovulatory based stimulated FET cycles. Uh, what about extended letrozole therapy? Again, it's becoming very famous in India. 
it's very much on youtube not much on the journals but very much on youtube about extended letrozole therapies now we have had phone calls from a lot of gynecologists that have practiced extended letrozole therapies and they land up getting a uh, thin endometrium and i really don't know whether it works well uh, so be wary about it giving the letrozole five to seven days is all welcome, but extending it further rather than use HMG, take the endometrial, uh, your stimulation well and form a follicle better. So if you look at the results of this trial, when you do letrozole FETs, your pregnancy rates are better than the artificial FET cycle. If the pregnancy rates are better with letrozole FET, why not do that? So it is not only the role of corpus luteum, it's not only an ovulatory cycle, very mimicking the nature, letrozole itself improves this L-selectin and integrin levels. And a lot of papers have been published later of letrozole uh, in FET cycles. And it all says that letrozole is basically responsible for increasing the integrin and selectin level. The gene expression is better and hence the pregnancy rates are better. Uh, so injection of GnRH agonist, this is, this is what, I, uh, this are to, what I told you. When you downregulate, you could have a little high E2. So you can combine even down regulation with letrozole to keep the E2 is low and you will have better results. We discussed it in the morning. This is an interesting paper. Uh, this is a very recent publication which I saw on RBM online. And this is of timing of progesterone luteal support in natural triprozole embryo transfer. He really went back to the basic papers which have been published. He says that luteal phase defect is pretty common thing. Luteal phase defect could be because of obesity, stress, eating disorder, endometriosis, polycystic ovary and thyroid disorders. So one of the reasons of these luteal phase defect is also progesterone resistance. So if you have any one of them, there is nothing wrong in going a little more on progesterone. Like if you're giving diprogesterone, nothing wrong in going 40 milligrams of diprogesterone. Okay. And, and they say that in spite of all these guidelines which have been published, there is no guideline regarding natural cycle or modified natural cycle FET being performed by ASHRAE or somebody. We have lack of guidelines. We go by the physiology and what we understand of the basics. So the basics tell us there's a steep increase in serum progesterone level, which starts 36 hours after the onset of LH surge. So there's an LH natural starts. The progesterone levels are still not very high. Once there is ovulation in the next two to four hours, there is sudden rise of progesterone because there is a sudden luteinization and the progesterone rise takes place. So we need to match our natural cycles as per this. So follicle ruptures about 20.3 hours after the urinary LH positiveness is there and progesterone rises one to two hours after the follicle rupture. And progesterone support in natural cycle should start 36 hours after the onset of LH surge measured in the morning because LH surge generally takes place in the morning, early morning. 36 hours after the HCG trigger if you're giving a modified natural cycle and 24 hours after the urine positiveness. So depending upon what criteria you're using, to measure your LH surge, you can start additional progesterone support. And that can be a simple vaginal progesterone or diprogesterone, whatever you want to use. And this is what has been suggested. That the onset of LH surge, a morning test is there, the urine positiveness come, will come beyond 12 hours. Again, the LH surge will be over in some time. So the day one, or if you're given HCG, after about 36 hours is your day one, and then you start calculating. Then this is the time, day one, when the ovulation takes place, is the time you start your progesterone support and you're matching it. Now, why they have been so insistent? Why this, they say, is giving more pregnancies? Basically, when you give HCG, and if you start progesterone on that very day, HCG itself takes the progesterone levels very high. So the window of implantation can shift a bit early. And that's why HCG triggered modified natural cycle could be having a little lesser pregnancy rate than the true natural cycle. It's one paper published by Barbara Lawrence and Human Fatemi. So Woody sir and everybody would love to go for natural cycle. The problem with me, my practice is about 50% of my clients come from distances and I can't make them stay in Kolhapur or Pune and continue with the whole thing. So they can't, logistically it becomes a little difficult to me and we can't rely on the laboratories outside to give us the same uh, proper reports. And that, that's what makes the whole thing difficult. So I prefer doing modified natural more than the natural cycle FETs. What about ure uterine peristalsis? I would request you to go through this paper. It's a beautiful paper, real beautiful paper on uterine peristalsis, freely available on internet, really gives you a complete overview of uterine peristalsis. This is my question to all of you. 
can atosiban stop junctional zone peristalsis and what i have learned from literature and what my fellows have updated me is that junctional zone also have oxytocin receptors and probably by giving atosiban you could be stabilizing them and hence the pregnancy rates will improve but the literature or the meta analysis which has been published said that it doesn't work in patients of recurrent implantation failure so i sincerely doubt whether we should put such a thing in practice at this juncture i am not putting this in my practice at all and it is the junctional zone which matters the most to us and i feel that can be stabilized by using just an intramuscular progesteron injection and that will stabilize it further so ultimately when it comes to luteal support i would recommend a vaginal progesteron with subcutaneous progesteron or a vaginal progesteron with an adequate dose of didrogesteron as my standard luteal support to everybody whether it let it be an fet cycle or any other cycle or if the patient wants progesteron free luteal support i will do a modified natural cycle give hcg do a transfer on the day of transfer again give one more 5000 iu of hcg and that should suffice as a uh, progesteron support so it's always a shared decision making in modern medicine value based decisions are taken clinician does not decide the protocol but shares pros and cons and costs and ease of treatment with the couple and we seek a merger of our view the patient's view and evidence published so as to give an optimum care to our patients thank you so much yes sir starting progesterone and if the level is more than one do you See, cancel number one if you are giving a uh, down regulate you are doing down regulated hrt cycle am i right there madam down regulated even uh, not down hrt cycles i am talking if you are down regulated hrt cycle there is no need to do progesterone levels at all the fact that you are down regulated is low only but if we are not down regulating uh, if you are not down regulating look at the ovary if the patient the patient will get menses only because luteo follicular transition takes place and the progesterone levels drop you look at the ovary if the ovary doesn't have a single follicle beyond 14 mm there is no need there is no reason why the progesterone yes, would be high because you showed in the slides that why no only if it is high if you see a follicle there i would yes. otherwise i wouldn't and so second question how long do you continue uh, injectable progesterone once the beta hcg has come positive the first opportunity right i stop it <laughs> so okay when... really the first opportunity so i i, I may go to a gestational sac and the moment the fetal heart activity starts i just stop it i go to proliton depo once a week i want to make my patient happy and comfortable rather than pushing in injections but you continue it till 6 uh, till no everybody in india continues luteal support till 10 to 12 weeks but the injectable sir that's what i so it will go till about maybe another 15 days beyond once the beta hcg is positive another 15 days in 15 days time you see a heart activity and i'll stop it up. and convert to pro, uh, proliton depo my rest of the progesterone is acting and now whatever progesterone will be secreted from the developing chorionic tissue will be adequate madam okay sir uh, sachin uh, one question in your slide you mentioned when there is a case of adenomyosis or endometriosis <clears throat> you go for uh, ultra long uh, and then there is it mentioned then you have periods and then you start your proganova Yeah. Why, yeah why why can't you start your program no, right away perfect question so thank you oh. so much i forgot this point actually oh. many a times when you do two or three ultra long injections you won't get periods then i don't won't get, I, i just yeah, do no a periods. scan i just yes. do a scan endometrium is thin the oh. ovary is obviously quiet correct. i do a estrogen level generally the estrogen level will be less than 20 picogram progesterone will always be yeah low. and then i'll start proganova yeah no, because i don't wait for periods really If your slide mentioned yeah, menses. Yeah, I mentioned the whole. Yeah, I have. I that's my mistake. I no, no, no. Uh, okay. I should have said he, uh, it could go that way. Well. Okay. Thanks. Uh, you ask me some question. Is there any contraindication? Huh? What is the contraindication? It asks me there is any contraindication. Is there a contraindication? What is it? Yeah. So, Rashmi, you need to forward that study to me. I'm not read. I'm not read that study. Yeah, it has got high androgen density. Exactly. That's what yeah. I was trying high? to say. It's androgenic, actually. So it is. It is supposed to be used only beyond uh, 14 weeks. Yeah, after 20 weeks. Of Thank you. I'm not come across any study like this. I'm no, so sorry. No, it is highly my, androgenic. My, yeah. In case if the fetus is. Oh. my um, lack of knowledge i'm very sorry for this i really so we do not use it in the first trimester of uh, I, i'll take that point but i don't use it <laughs> uh, 
proliton depot mm -hmm. on a day of transfer? No, 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 I don't do that. But there are studies published. So if the ethical committees are giving sanction to that, I, I sincerely <laughs> would like to know what. There are studies published that way. Sir, so, because why? Why we could? Because then, then 17, then 17 the... hydroxy progesterone is secreted by corpus luteum. The corpus luteum secretes what? It secretes progesterone. It secretes 17 hydroxy progesterone. It secretes estrogen. Then when, when so that's a physiological a thing. Depot. When huh? you start a proliton depot, I, can you? Yes, you can. But when you start, when you start. So once the heart activity comes. But I was not aware about this paper. But because sometimes uh, in my practice, I give proliton depot on day of uh, transfer as well as well as uh, four weeks, four days apart. But what is the problem with that? When the patient comes negative. The, because of that, it is a uh, depot preparation. So it gives very lingering effect. To the I, I'll tell you something, sir. I'll tell you something, months. sir. In our general practice, we should go a little consensus based also. Because as doctors, we are very competitive with each other. Our patients are also very competitive and they find out things. So as we are little consensus based, it becomes a happy practice. You know, because if you it go a little be. away from the consensus, unless it, you, can, you are able to counsel the patient, strongly with the good evidence then it holds true Other, that's why I generally i'm not like atosiban is something which is not coming in my pen only one of the reasons is it is not yet, yet even a consensus is not great evidence being published there so i've seen trials yeah. where people have given pyroxicam people have given endomethacine and heparin to pani jaisa hai sir hrt cycle or endomethacine in a, sir in hrt cycle better to down regulate or uh, we can do without down regulating. Generally, we do without down regulation. Uh, we will down regulate, and only if there is a reason to down regulate, like endometriosis or adenomyosis. Otherwise, we don't down regulate. Sir, sir, what is your typical typical luteal phase support after AFT? Uh, vaginal progesterone and dufasterone combination. And injectable? Injectable, I go with the progesterone levels. If the progesterone levels are low, then I add injections. Otherwise, I don't. Otherwise. Then you do progesterone level uh, for on the day in the morning. The patient comes to me at about nine o'clock. We do progesterone levels. The reports are there in two hours, and then uh, uh, we do embryo transfers. But uh, what I do as soon as the patient. So what is the limit of progesterone level? 10. It's ten. If it is less than ten, then you will I, add. I give an intramuscular, and then I add subcutaneous progesterone every day from there. Subcutaneous or intramuscular? Ten. Never ten. intramuscular. Always subcutaneous. You stop that intramuscular. So how many times do you measure serum progesterone in your uh, cycle? Like. Only once? The progesterone level, you're measuring it only on the day of the transfer? Huh. Once? And either on the day of transfer or on the previous transfer? Sir, in... The patching effect is only push everybody here and it's going to stick it. Make them aminovate and then start on one time. But still you can't batch it because everybody may not develop it. The patching effect is coming. Sir, in modified natural cycle, uh, there are two reports like LH less than 17, that means surge not initiated. Uh, when to add progesterone, sir? After 24 hours or 36 hours? Yes, sir, uh, one scenario LH is less than 17, that means LH surge not initiated and we had given the trigger. And another scenario LH more than 17, that means surge is initiated. Our day of transfer will vary now. When to add progesterone? Yeah, actually, see, uh, the progesterone, uh, when you do uh, these kinds of things, uh, okay. generally the literature is saying you add the progesterone the next day of HCG. After one. 24 hours of HCG. HCG. Number one. Number two, there was only one paper which published, which says the, the LH level is beyond 20. You do embryo transfer on day four of HCG. And if it is less than 20, do on day five. We did a few cases, we didn't succeed. So if it is beyond 17, we cancel the cycle. Okay. Yeah, very interesting question. So these studies are basically come from Peter Humadan, uh, wherein he has given 1500 IU. They were all GNR Chaponus trigger with fresh embryo transfer. So 1500 and another 1500 on the day six of OPU or something on the day of embryo transfer, etc. And that was enough in those studies. But in FET cycle, I would give my HCG trigger, which is the modified natural, and maybe an HCG again on the day of uh, embryo transfer. I'll give one more 5,000 IU. There are studies published using 250 IU every day. You can give, or you can give even alternately. So both studies are published that way. Now this orbital pen is available. So one click is equal to 250 IU of HCG. So you can give it every day of that. One click you can give. And one pen is hardly 6,000 rupees, which lasts for 25 years. So I think that. Anil, you want to say?
स्क्रीन पे so uh, in past years the long agonies was one of the favorite protocol because it it was doctor friendly also and it was having more advantages when it comes to synchronization and oocyte response and oocyte yield but the antagonist had taken over in this last decade and the antagonist protocol is one of our favorite protocol which we all are very well versed with and we are it's a routine practice to any patient put for in the antagonist protocol so whether we can add the advantage of long agonist protocol and at the same time we are doing antagonist protocol so the stop agonist protocol is nothing but the combination of long agonist protocol and antagonist protocol what advantage we are taking uh, through this stop agonist protocol so directly coming to the protocol there is on day 21 of the cycle before the menses like 7 days prior to the menses or day 21 of cycle you start with luteal uh, with uh, agonist 0.5 mg per day it was a lupride lupride agonist 0.5 mg per day and then continue till the time patient get menses when the patient get menses that time confirm down regulation on the sonography the ovaries will be quiet and you, you we can confirm down regulation with estrogen estrogen is less than 50 picogram and lh less than 5 once the down regulation is confirmed stop agonist and start with high dose of hmg and that high dose of hmg you continue for 5 days after 5 days uh, do ultrasound you can add fix anta or flexible anta depending on the oocyte response for flexible anta when the e2 is more than 400 and the follicle size is beyond 13 mm that's where the anta will start and the hmg till an anta will continue till the time of trigger so i'm going through this lecture about physiology of the protocol advantage disadvantage and when to use and when not to use let me again go through this slide uh, and i'll explain the physiology better here explain the physiology in this slide better so what we are achieving with stop agonist protocol we are giving a short term agonist and that short term agonist in initial it will having a flare effect so when we are giving at day 21 the initial flare effect will generate will recruit few more follicles so we are uh, actually introducing a new follicular wave and the down regulation effect of this agonist after 2 to 3 days will cause atresia of the follicles which are fsh responsive which was from last response and those are the follicles between 10 to 12 mm so that atresia will occur and when the patient is having menses that time we are confirming with uh, with down regulation so we are confirming down regulation we are doing uh, as i mentioned that e2 level and lh level so at that particular time on the scan there will be a quiet ovaries and this is the point where we have achieved the synchrony so because we have generated one wave and it is a new follicular wave and now when we are riding this follicular wave we will achieve synchrony so when we start Uh, HMG doses at this particular point. We stop agonists and we start uh, uh, HMG doses. And under the effect of gonadotropins, the follicle growth will occur. Sometimes the stimulation may take longer because we are actually taking like from the very uh, small sizes of the follicle and we are chasing the ovulatory sites. So we'll continue and we'll be adding anta. The uh, main purpose of anti adding anta is not to have LH rise and premature luteinization. so when the follicle is more than uh, more than three follicles are there of more than 18 mm that is the time when we uh, decide about trigger criteria and we can give agonist as well as we can give dual trigger or hcg as a trigger so what we are achieving in this short term agonist protocol that is a gonadotropic specific hypophysectomy what does i mean by that 
So in spite of this down regulation with short term agonists, there is a continuous recruitment of primordial follicle, which continues with new follicular wave and few new two to five millimeter follicles are available. As yesterday I mentioned in the physiology, like as we learned that we have the follicles after uh, like, you know, the, the follicular waves will be there and the two to five millimeter follicular wave, that is the where the AMH will start getting expressed and we can write that wave further with HMD stimulation. Sorry. What is the difference between this short term, uh, short stop agonist protocol and antagonist protocol? So in stop agonist protocol, we are achieving more synchronization. So the oocyte yield will be better in this patient. And in antagonist protocol, as the FSH has started before, so the luteal follicular phase transition has started early, like before the menses. So few of the follicles could be of larger size and few of will be on, on the lesser side. And we are having a synchrony in antagonist protocol. So uh, in this particular study, when they compared agonist, uh, like, you know, uh, oocyte response in agonist versus antagonist protocol in advanced age patients. So what they found out is the oocyte response in a patient with, uh, uh, where, when they use agonist protocol was in, like, the oocyte yield was more. So there are more number of mature oocytes retrieved in this particular group. And in case of antagonist, the uh, oocyte response was on the lower side. So the coefficient correlation was on the positive side and here in it was on the negative side. So there is more synchronization in agonist and less synchronization in anta with less follicles. So in which patients this stop agonist protocol could be beneficial? So patients with advanced maternal age because they are starting their luteal follicular transition early. And at that same point, we are uh, starting our agonist. So we are generating one follicular wave, we are causing atresia uh, from the FSH responsive follicles, and we are achieving synchronization. And in this patient, every egg is in, important to form an embryo and give more success. So this is very useful in patients with advanced maternal age. In long agonist protocol, it directly acts on the ovary, suppressing the follicles and steroidogenesis. Uh, so it wears off the agonist stop protocol, thus like this all will be wearing off with the agonist stop protocol and thus improving the response. In low responders with normal FSH, increased number of oocytes with decreased consumption of HMG will be achieved in this protocol. Uh, Anigudi sir already uh, quoted this paper uh, in his last lecture. So this is about the short term impact of pituitary suppression on uh, like, you know, enteral follicular count. And they suppressed with estradiol, GnRH agonists, OC pills, and combined either with OC pills or GnRH agonists. Herein, they have taken the mean age between 36 to 38. And these are the patients which we are commonly seeing in our practice. So what they found out is like there is baseline decline, baseline decline in the AFC. So AFC, when it was counted prior and after, the, uh, after giving agonists, there was significant difference and there was drop in the AFC. But Let's concentrate here. The oocyte retrieval rate was more, though the AFC was on the lowest side. So why this confusion is there? And like, let me explain with this slide too. So to substantiate my previous slide, when we are giving agonist, so after that, the, uh, we'll see that this paper has beautifully explained about the hormone response after agonist. So FSH level decreases, AFC decreases, but AMH increases. So when they did, monitoring on after day seven, day 14 and day 30, this, uh, like, you know, the, there was a paradoxical increase in the AMH in this particular study. So what it conveys us, though there is apparent decline in the AFC, the AMH is started getting expressed. And why it is so, the new follicles, which are grown due to continuous recruitment are below USG resolution. And that is why it's an apparent decline in AFC. So actually, it is not apparent. Uh, there is no decline in the AFC, but on the USG, it's very difficult to catch up. So many papers of this top agonist protocol was before 2005, and they all conveyed that agonists suppress premature LH surge, reduce cycle cancellations, and improves oocyte number. What was the different uh, protocol? Uh, like you know, what are the I had quoted the protocol, and the difference between this and that protocol was they continued the agonist till five days of HMG. So as I mentioned in my last slide that we are stopping agonists and then we are starting with HMG stimulation. But wherein this paper, they continued 
till five days of HMG and they just stop agonists and continue HMG, but they didn't add anta and the trigger was given. So uh, the theory behind was that like the agonist will uh, keep the LH low for next seven to 10 days. And that is why they didn't add anta. But in our patient, like uh, when we are st stopping, uh, we have achieved a synchrony. Now the effect of uh, like uh, the uh, response of agonists would have gone and uh, like when we have to ride that wave, so we are directly starting with the HMG stimulation. So we are actually concerned that few of our patient may escape through this LHP. So we are adding ANTA in our protocol, which is not there in this. So what they observed that HMG administered with reduced concentration of agonist improved the oocyte number. And there were less cycle cancellation, but with this protocol also, they got almost premature LH surge of 28%. Oocytes. So uh, it's better that stop your agonist on day two, just continue HMG and ANTA because some of the patients can escape. With the stop agonist protocol, what, what is the caution? So LH level is very, very important when you are starting HMG stimulation, a must step to look forward. In a subgroup of patients, when we are giving a short term agonist, the day two LH will be less than 1.2 MIO. And uh, these will the, who will be this subgroup? These are like patients with receptor polymorphism, long-term agonists, and patients with combination of agonists and OC pills. What is our fear here? Then we are starting with low LH pool, and we may have like, empty follicular syndrome or low oocyte yield at the end of pickup. So how to tackle this situation? When the LH is less than 1.2 and the uh, start of stimulation, so uh, if at a, when, when we give proganova, there is rise in estradiol level and the positive feedback me mechanism, the pituitary will stimulate LH rise without progesterone rise as there is no developing follicle. So uh, when we, uh, I'm saying you confirm your down regulation on day two with E2 and LH level, concentrate on LH level when it is less than 1.2, better give proganova four to six milligram per day for five to seven days and then repeat LH. And when it is more than two, then start your stimulation. What are the disadvantages? Obviously, it's a long duration because patient has to start injection on day 21 of cycle. And many a times we have to go with the high dose because we are actually uh, like very from solical, we are taking them to pre-ovulatory. The subgroup with over suppression, uh, these are like severe uh, DOR patients where AMH is very low, FSH is already high and very low FC count. In these patients, this protocol may not work. What is the advantage of this protocol that we are having flexibility of giving agonist trigger. So if, if at all we are using it in case of hyper LS PCOS, in those patients it is going to be beneficial. When to use normal responders because it is giving a better cumulative live birth rate, diminish OIN reserve, Posidon 1, 2, 3. And as I mentioned that hyper LS PCOS where agonist trigger can be given and we'll get better oocyte yield. So uh, Rolla Ayrito in his uh, 2020 publication, a proof of concept paper where the protocol was for poor responder. And what he has done after the GNRH agonist at, on the day of 21 of cycle he has started, then letrozole was added from the day of menses for five days. And then the HMG stimulation and antagon was the same as top agonist protocol. Why, what additional benefit of this adding letrozole was, this letrozole is increasing intra-ovarian intra androgens and no preantral and follicles will uh, increase. So they are like, you know, we are increasing the intra androgens. So we are making more substrate available and there will be a good follicular push. Thank you. Hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Ovulating cycle, or uh, you put the okay, okay. Again, regarding uh, any any time stimulation, like you you said in previous, you know, especially in our donors, when we should not keep on anything. Any time they come, you start the stimulation. What is your experience about this? Since how long you are doing this? See, at this juncture, uh, we are recruiting donors from our own agencies, and we are getting donors from outside as well. When we are recruiting from our own agencies, uh, it is a random start, and we are pretty happy about it. You know, uh, I, I don't see much of a difference anyway, because donors is a fairly normal responder population. So very difficult to make a difference between. And even if, let's say, one, one donor gives you three eggs less and one gives three more, I don't think that would be something to blame to the pre-treatment they received or not. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to do an analysis that way. We go with the next one. Uh, so the PPS protocol introduced by Ch uh, Chinese research group four to five years back, and now many of us are practicing this PPS protocol. So from day two of menses, the HMG like gonadotropins will be started with the patient characteristic like two twenty five to four fifty, and the medrodzi progesterone acetate is added from day two onwards till the time of trigger, and HCG or agonist trigger is given. So that is of uh, whether we can have flexi start of uh, like you know, progesterone when it comes to PPOS. So on day two of menses, just start with HMD doses, and after five days, uh, have an evaluation when the follicle is more than 14 millimeter and E2 is beyond 400 picogram. That uh, that time also you can add as a flexible start. So then continue as we are adding an antagonist protocol. Six days uh, on the day six of stimulation, we are adding uh, antagonist. In the same way, we can add a metabolic progesterone on day six of the stimulation, and then continue both and give a trigger. Then let's understand the physiology behind this progesterone prime ovulation. What happens in normal menstrual cycle and what happens when it's an exogenous progesterone effect? So in normal menstrual cycle, in early mid follicular phase, initially the increase in E2, there will be FSH will be on the rise and the follicle will start growing and that will increase the E2 level. That increase E2 level will increase the GnRH pulse frequency and increase progesterone receptor. They, after that, there is a decline in FSH and the LH peak will start. What happens in late follicular phase that this increasing E2 uh, and uh, LH further, the GnRH frequency uh, will increase and that will give LH surge. That is how a normal menstrual cycle will behave. When a patient is on progesterone from the day uh, of menses, from the start day of menses, what happens? So in early and mid follicular phase, Already there is like the follicle has started building E2, but we are introducing progesterone at that particular point. So what ha happens over here that there is decrease in GnRH pulse frequency and there is decrease FSH and LH secretion. So this progesterone, when we are added initially, it's not allowing the LH rise. And uh, because of that, there is stable Gen GnRH frequency is there and there is no spontaneous LH surge. So that is the physiology behind uh, progesterone prime ovulation. So to summarize, in the estrogen prime situation, progesterone is synergistic to, synergistic to LH surge. So as I mentioned, in normal menstrual cycle, uh, when there is high E2 and LH, when we add progesterone, it will be a LH surge. But in low estrogen situation, when we are starting on day one of day two of menses, the progesterone is having antagonist, antagonistic action on LH surge. So in PPOS, progesterone is started on day two, low estrogen environment. That is how it inhibits LH surge. So there are various papers where they have uh, done combination with 
many of the progestins and they saw the outcome in compared to ditrogestron, metrogestron, so and so forth. And in this particular study, what they have observed that the transformation dose, like from being a proliferative to secretory dose, is different, and the ovulation inhibition dose to prevent LSR is different, and which is higher than the transformation dose. So in this, uh, the particular studies they have followed these doses in their studies, and when they compared the progestin with different combination, uh, they have, like you know there is no statistically significant different difference when it comes to pregnancy rate or ART outcome. So in PPOS, how the hormone response will be? So it, obviously the FSH with the gonadotropin stimulation will be uh, on the high till the day of trigger. The LH will be suppressed by progesterone. So it will be a decline train and after trigger it will rise. And in E2, it's the same physiology where the FSH will push the E2 up. And uh, in case of progesterone, because we are giving it continuously, after trigger day, again, there will be a progesterone rise. Uh, here the caution is like where uh, when the Hong et al presented the PPS uh, introduced this PPS protocol in a discussion he did mention that when they started patient on the uh, PPS protocol and they gave agonist trigger 0.1 milligram uh, agonist trigger was given so in few patients the LH surge was not adequate that LH rise was not adequate and there was low oocyte yield. So then again, they analyzed and they went with dual trigger. So they added 0.1 milligram of agonist and 1000 IU of HCG. And what he uh, concluded that adding this HCG was beneficial and it was like, you know, more number of oocytes were retrieved in those patients. So the cost, uh, like here, I want to take you to this slide where after the trigger, the LH has not reached up to 40 IU. And as we know, like for ovulation, it should reach 60 to 80 IU. So it has not reached. So that is why it's inadequate uh, for L LH peak. And that is that may be the reason, like, you no, know, they got oocyte yield, which was on the laser side. So LH level decreased in uh, PPOS study continuously, even after Chennai's agonist trigger. Hence, use dual trigger uh, with combination of HCG 2000 IU and agonist. Uh, then when I'm saying uh, we will be having low oocyte yield uh, and that's why we have to add uh, HCG, the con our concern then PPOS in PCOS patient because obviously there will be a hyper stimulation and then uh, we don't want, we want to prevent OHSS so we'll be scared to give dual trigger. So since LH rise is low after agonist trigger that is 40 MIO as I already mentioned. So in PPOS in PCOS protocol in PCOS patients Less than 15 follicles, more than 11 millimeter, add 1000 IU HCG with agonist. But if it's a different story, where is more than 15 follicles of more than 11 millimeter, we don't want to put patient for the risk of OHSS, and then we can choose agonist trigger. So, uh, in this paper, they have beautifully explained that whether we're having flexibility of PPS protocol in different menstrual cycles. So in late follicular protocol, what they did is, from day one to day seven, they didn't add anything. On uh, after this, on day seven, they gave decapeptyl 0.1 milligram, and HMG was started with 2, 225 IU. Uh, and the starting uh, day of HMG, they confirmed that dominant follicle is beyond 10 millimeter, and E2 is beyond 75 milligram. And immediately, this was followed by metrosiprostol 10 milligram and clomid 25 milligram. And the whole they co continued till the time of trigger. And they found that the conventional PPOS protocol and this late follicular protocol, there were no difference when it comes to uh, clinical pregnancy rate or ongoing pregnancy rate. So there are various studies when been published, like you know, comparing the PPOS protocol and antagonist protocol, PPOS protocol versus agonist protocol. So in patients with PCOS, when this particular study mentioned that it was done uh, uh, like you know, in antagonist versus PPOS protocol in PCOS patient. The stimulation outcomes inferior in PPOS, but the pregnancy outcome in PPOS and ANTA group doesn't differ significantly. So if at all we see carefully over here, the clinical pregnancy rate per transfer but not suddenly significant. So that is giving a message that we can use uh, PCO, uh, in PPOS protocol in PCOS patient with the caution with the trigger. So uh, then uh, the antagonist versus PPS protocol in low prognosis patient, wherein this paper uh, like conclude that CLBR in antagonist protocol group is higher compared to PPS protocol because of more oocyte 
yield obtained in anta group more m2 more fertilization in anta group freeze thaw in ppos increases the time to pregnancy interval so uh, in uh, there was only like there are only three to four studies where it was been uh, like you know uh, in low prognosis patient the ppos was tried and they are saying ki antagonist is more favorable compared to ppos so then ppos in endometriosis patient many of us like you know we are putting patient uh, and it's a always a beneficial we will think it's a beneficial protocol for endometrial patient because progesterone uh, will be helpful for these patients so the three groups they compared one is ppos one is ultra long agonist with conventional protocol and antagonist protocol and when they compared the outcome in PPOS ultra long uh, uh, general agonist protocol and general antagonist protocol in endometriosis patient, they found that ultra long general agonist protocol gave better result followed by antagonist protocol followed by PPOS protocol. So well in this study, the PPOS protocol didn't work well when it endometriosis patient. Many of us, are, many of our patients are on diagnosis uh, like as a medical therapy in endometriosis. So this, uh, this patient will be taking Dinoges months and months. And when we are expecting, like we want to do a PPOS protocol in, that, in such patients, what we'll do, like we'll stop the Dinoges and then we wait for mindset, then start the protocol. But when the patient is already on Dinoges, after, the stop, after stopping the Dinoges, she may have symptoms and we'll have to wait till the time she get menses then again, the time to pregnancy interval also increase. So what we can do, the patient uh, who are on Dinoges, there is no need of stopping this protocol, uh, stop Dinoges. We can actually start, uh, we, we can confirm that whether E2 level is less than 50 milligram, uh, 50 picogram, and LH is less than five. And in this patient, without giving a withdrawal, we can start HMG stimulation. So it will behave same as a, our conventional PPOS protocol. And this is a new strategy in endometriosis patient conveyed by this paper. So how it goes about. So patient is already on Dinoges, uh, which is like two milligram per day the patient is on. And we have confirmed with the hormonal evaluation and starting our gonadotropins with dose of 225 IU. And we'll continue till the time of trigger. And this is a conventional uh, protocol of PPOS, which is mentioned. So what they found out is in Dinoges group, there is more number of mature oocytes compared to didrogestone group. And when it comes to cancellation, the cancellation were lesser in Dinoges compared to didrogestone, but live birth rate uh, didn't differ significantly between these two groups. So if the patient who, uh, who are on, uh, like an you know, endometriotic patient who are on Dinoges, just do a hormone evasion and immediately start with the HMG rather than doing all the other jugglers. Now the concern is whether the progesterone will be having bad effect on the oocyte quality because many people, papers published are saying ki when you are having a rise in the progesterone exponentially that affects the oocyte quality and embryo quality. So when the PPOS protocol was uh, like, you know, studied in this, in this particular study, the euploidy rates after, uh, of blastosis in patients with uh, GNRH agonist pro uh, protocol, like conven conventional ORN uh, stimulation protocol and PPOS, what they found out is the euploid blastosis per injected M2 oocytes were not different. They were equally like, you know, similar, like 21%, 21% in each group. So PPO should be proposed to all, but those who are like, you know, not requiring fresh embryo transfer, because obviously in PPOS protocol, I forgot to mention, it's a freeze all policy. We have to freeze all, all and then only the embryo, frozen embryo transfer will be done. Now coming to the outcomes in regards to PPOS. So neonatal outcomes and risk of congenital malformations were similar between PPOS and other conventional uh, generic agonist short protocol. So there's no difference. So we can actually imply in our practice. And whom to use, like egg donors, because then we can, uh, like, you know, we are making them injection free, it, it, adding anti and adding HMD, there are more number of injections. So uh, these people will be beneficial. In endometriosis patient, as I said, the, if the patient is already on, already on Dinoges, just start with the HMG stimulation. The, in patients with oncofertility, where multiple stimulations are needed, in that also we can consider the PPOS protocol. And patient, we have already decided if the, the patient is going for freeze all, maybe because of the factors like adenomyosis or endometriosis, where we want to go for down regulation after OM pickup. In those patients, PPOS is advisable. And patients in which we are advising PGTA, because in PGTA, we are doing, doing all freeze all uh, cycles. So in these patients also, it will be beneficial. So only the caution when we are using in PCOS, the agonist trigger and the dual trigger has to be V. 
so this in Ashre meeting, uh, this annual uh, just recently happened, and uh, from India, the Isha Gambhir has uh, quoted this study. Uh, she actually published this study, and uh, it was between uh, PPOS versus uh, clomiphene prime orient stimulation in patients with high responders. So, what was the protocol? From day two, the HMG stimulation was started, and clomiphene citrate was added from day eight. And what was the uh, physiology behind that? Like when we are adding such a high level of chromophane citrate, that is decreasing the LH rise. And then it will continue to trigger and the trigger was given. So uh, their conclusion was good LH suppression and comparable results in oocyte uh, retrieved and number of embryo form. But uh, like, you know, they are yet to continue the study and follow till the live birth rate. So we are not having the ART outcome in these cases. But it is a similar protocol which we can follow uh, in, in case of PPOS. We can follow this protocol too. Thank you. In this particular study, they did high responders that done. I didn't question. It was for high responders only. Yeah. So as yeah. our an antagonist protocol, we are trying to like you know, LH rise. Do studies, they would not choose the outliers. Very difficult to put them into the practice, you know. Well, thank you, Sharif. Thank you so much. I'm just going to give you a small glimpse of uh, what in the question answer sessions and what different protocols we discuss. I'm just going to run you through a small thing and then we go to the lecture on embryology for clinicians. And therein I'm going to tell you the importance of PGTA and what is the missing link, what is not told to us by the PGTA story. So I've not made any title for this particular presentation. And this is what I told you. I'm just putting a small summary of what all has been conveyed to you that we have an asynchronous uh, follicle growth. Either you can synchronize here or you synchronize here and depends upon how you take your calls. Uh, this is again the same thing. And this is your protocols for oncofertility, social egg freezing, endometriosis and poor ovary disease and PGTA. When you want to do your dual stimulations, you will do a HMG, ANTA, trigger, trigger is generally your agonist trigger. Then after two days, you can start your next stimulation and you may add anta or may not add anta in that part because you're in the luteal phase uh ubaldi et al when they did dual stimulation they have used a cg trigger and they waited for five days one for the hcg to wash away and also to know how many blastoses they have formed so that they can take a call suppose you have three blastoses formed in the very first stimulation probably you don't need to go for the next stimulation cycle this is a stop agonist protocol which dr sharu just discussed with you that you go luteal agonist and then you wait from the day two of the menses, you start your stimulation, antagonist to be added later. You can have a flexi anta or a fixed anta, and you're free to give any kind of trigger. Either you can give an HCG agonist dual trigger, you're free to use it. And she clearly told you the advantages of synchronization, what you achieve in this particular protocol. This is a long agonist protocol, not one of those favorites today for all of us, and but this has been a favorite for a long time. And wherein you start uh, with Lupride, starting on day 21, and you do confirm your down regulation on day one or day two, that the LH is less than five, E2 less than 60 picogram, endometrium less than six millimeters. Then you start your HMG in whatever dose you're decided upon on our ovarian reserve factors, age and BMI, and continue loop right on half the dose till the day of trigger. Uh, uh, if the E2 levels after five days of stimulation is beyond 500, you expect OHSS. And those days we were worried about doing posting or not because we are forced to give an HCG trigger here. And so PCOS is difficult to use. And again, in patients who have very poor reserve, you could be suppressing the uh, pituitary ovarian axis quite badly. So the different one of the major differences is also that 
in an antagonist protocol, you allow the follicles or the pituitary ovarian axis to use its own ovarian reserve and perform to its best. While when you suppress it, the ovary may not perform its to, to its best. This is an ultra long protocol, wherein this was a famous protocol for endometriosis patient, endometrioma, where you give about uh, Lupret depot can be given uh, about three to seven days uh, in the fo early follicular phase of the preceding cycle. And she may get menses, may not get menses. And then you continue the stimulation. You don't have, have to add a loop right because the action of uh, LH rise doesn't occur and that action is preserved. And then you can add a CG later. And this is your typical antagonist protocol, which you people are doing day in and day out. I'm sure there's nothing for me to pen down or to explain you. But for a flexi start of antagonist, some of you could be doing a flexi antagonist. We were in you, if the E2 is beyond 200 picograms, a follicle beyond 12 millimeters, you can start antagonist. Otherwise, a fixed dose and a fixed day antagonist is something which we commonly practice in our practice. A PPOS is this, which you have just seen the slides of a continuous PPOS uh, being used during the stimulation and HCG antagonist. And uh, I think this dinogest thing is really very beautiful. Uh, that is, that will decrease the time to pregnancy for women who are on dinogest therapy during the course of endometriosis. I think that will be of great benefit. Or you can have a flexi PPOS as Dr. Sharyu has just demonstrated that you can add it resistone after the five days of stimulation. Can you add clomiphene in a stimulation? Yes, you can do a clomiphene, CPOS, clomiphene prime ovarian stimulation. We will start 100 milligrams of clomiphene starting on day one and continue that. And you add HMG 150 to 450 IU. This is a good protocol for Posidon 4 because as Dr. Gudi has extensively gone into clomiphene has told you, that makes a difference, gives a nice good thirst of FSH, gives you good LH values. And also that clomiphene in the later part will not allow the premature LH surge to take place. So this is also a fantastic protocol to use in practice. What about letrozole priming? So this is these are called androgen priming protocols, wherein it is a dual stimulation, but in the follicular phase, you're using letrozole. And in the luteal phase is actual antagonist cycle you're doing. In the follicular phase, you're using letrozole. So that increases the intra-ovarian androgens making, and this will be used for somebody who is posidon 3 or posidon 4, where you obtain less number of follicles. He's a predicted poor responder. And then you can use an HMG stimulation later in the luteal phase and go ahead and androgen priming can work. People have done androgen priming in different ways. Letrozole is one simple way to do it. And another way could be using a low dose HCG. You can use an ovitreal pen, you know, uh, one click a day in the whole of the follicular phase. And then you can do uh, further stimulation. There are nice papers which have been presented on when the first IVF cycle has gone through and you're not, not obtained a single egg or you're not able to do a single embryo transfer, in such a situation, you can give an LH or HCG primed ovarian stimulation. So on day two itself, you start recombinant LH, maybe 150 IU for a period of seven days or HCG one click a day for seven days and then start your antagonist cycle. And that also can work better. But these are some outlier extreme situations which we are talking about. Okay. So that is, this is just a simple picturistic overview to all of you. Firstly, before I, uh, start this lecture, I am sincerely thankful to all of you on behalf of fertility courses and Jahangir and Solanda IVF that you registered in such large numbers and you have stayed back for such a long time and really inspires uh, Dr. Gudi, me and Sharyu. Uh, and we would definitely like all of you to participate on our meetings, not just be a delegate and that would be lovely. Uh, so uh, we are definitely launching uh, or maybe taking the fertility courses a little more wider in India and uh, Definitely, we would like you people to participate and subscribe to that. And uh, we can teach each other or learn from each other's experiences. And that will be a great learning together. Uh, because literature is so huge, nobody can uh, read each and every article and assess it because somebody will be interested in male infertility. Somebody is interested in androgen priming. And people will have different interests. But it's better to come together, discuss it out, and know more about it. Because what you learn can benefit my patient and what I learn can benefit your patient. So it's it's a shared learning which process we need to establish. And fertility courses has been on forefront on establishing this shared learning process. And uh, Sunanda IVF Academy is a very small part of it. And I would request Dr. Goody also to uh, put it up as fast as possible and as go as wide as possible. 
from the propagation of knowledge and exchange of knowledge. We're taking you through the uh, embryology, uh, what we need to know as a clinician. I'm not an embryologist, definitely, and my knowledge has some uh, lacuna, but I'll be telling you about uh, what the hidden things which you should know in this practice. Uh, generally, all your embryologists will be following the Istanbul consensus of the embryo assessment and all the embryo assessment and the grading will be done as per the Istanbul consensus. I'm not going to go into details of this. It's all there on the net and your embryologists are doing it. You, it's just that as a background knowledge, as a clinician, you should be very well aware about what is the Istanbul consensus and how embryos are graded. And this is about the grading of the cleavage stage embryos, which is graded as good, fair and poor, grade one, two, three, and all the characteristics have been mentioned on the slide and you can just go through. Uh, this is about the day four embryos, and this is about the blastocyst, where uh, uh, you are uh, knowing the stage of development, then you grade the ICM, and you also grade the tophoectoderm, and then you take a call, which blastocyst is better. And you know this diagram is just telling you which are the bad blastocysts, the red ones, and which are the good blastocysts, which can give you more number of pregnancies. So qualitative morphology of blastocyst is very, very important. You will be doing a blastocyst development stage, inner cell mass scoring, and trophoectoderm scoring, and it will be a combined scoring system which you'll exhibit and tell your clients in reporting of the embryology notes when you give it to your patients. What about PGTA and what information we need to know more about PGTA? And Mohan in the morning really put forth a beautiful paper on STAR study. And before STAR study ever came, let's look in the history of PGTA. It all started about two decades back and started with fish, PCR fish technology. So taking a biopsy, or we call it PGTA1, wherein it was uh, taking a biopsy of a cleavage stage embryo. So we were really uh, biopsying a blastomere on a siliconized slide that we implanted and we sent for a fish technology. And as the technology in genetics improved, we came out with RACGS and next came the RACGS. And now we are using NGS. The difference between the fish, RACGS and NGS is that with NGS, we are able to make more mosaic embryos. We are able to recognize mosaic with RACGS and fish was only telling you about aneuploidies. And with every increase or increment or a better of technology, the genetists and the embryologists said, well, this is good, this is good. But nowhere PGTA has ever increased the pregnancy rates as far the evidence goes compared to a morphological selected embryo. So there's a nice paper you put on Google called the emperor stands naked. Don't think of Donald Trump there in the hall there. It is emperor stands naked is about the PGTA. They've tried to prove that it, it does the best, but the pregnancy rates have been kept lower than the morphological assessment. So obviously we have a lot of aneuploidy embryos. And as the age goes ahead, the number of aneuploidy embryos go up. And this is all this, this particular graph is very well known to all of us. And uh, this is one paper on reproducibility of the trophoectoderm biopsies, the chaos behind the pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy by Rollo Oribito, and reproducibility of trophoectoderm biopsies are uploid aneuploid mosaic embryos using independently verified next generation sequencing. So this is a paper published by Nidhi Sachdev, and this is some criticism put up by the Rollo Oribito onto that particular paper. So look at uh, this paper first, look at the materials and method. The age is 39.5. The mean age of this population study is 39.5. Number of eggs retrieved is 16. Do you have these women in India? Where are they? Really, where are they? You know, so uh, probably this is a completely ethnically different population which a study has been conducted. Uh, it may not apply as it is, but some information would be very vital to all of us. And number of blast six blastosis. The 39 year old, oh, I'll celebrate for three days. Well, look at this, what they have done is, it all depends upon which part of the trophoectoderm are you biopsying. You could be biopsying a normal part of the trophoectoderm and say, well, it's a euploid embryo, but there could be an aneuploid cells in the inner cell mass and you're not biopsying the inner cell mass. So it's a false negative. You could be biopsying that part of the trophoectoderm, which is aneuploid, and you report it as aneuploid embryo because you're just taking five cells, putting it as aneuploid embryo, but again, the inner small cell mass is euploid, and this probably is a euploid embryo, and that's your false positive. So they used, in Sachide et al, in 2019, they put a paper, they used only the donated embryos for research, which is not actually the real world scenario. The best embryos will go inside, and those who have achieved pregnancy, the remaining embryos probably will be donated for research. So that's not a real world scenario, but there's no other scenario where you can do this particular trial. And wherein they had about 32 embryos, 
and they do multiple trophoectoderm biopsies from various places and they report they put NGS studies to it and they said is there a concordance in the same embryo if we take two biopsies at two different levels of trophoectoderm is there a concordance when you say when you declare an aneuploid embryo to somebody you feel the whole thing is aneuploid am I right there but the true stator is different only six times they had a concordance the rest of the times there was no concordance at all in an aneuploid embryo and a good embryo. So aneuploid discordant results that showed high level of mosaicism or complementary aneuploidy were considered as clinically concordant. So suppose you have an aneuploid and some at other biopsy taken is also beyond 40% mosaic. They were saying concordance. That was the definition they used. But even that was seen only in six embryos out of 32. And no, I'm not going to go through this paper. I'm not going to go through this. So this is a paper of live birth rate per cycle with or without PGTA. Uh, when it comes under the age of 35, there's hardly any difference. And as the age advances, obviously the euploid embryos will give you more pregnancies, but getting a euploid embryo itself is a big tussle. Dr. Gudi has really gone in details about how many number of uh, oocytes are needed to have one euploid embryo. And that itself is a big task there. The question is now, do human embryos have an ability of self-correction? As we understand biology, if a cell is aneuploid, it will just go away. It will not proliferate further. If it is a euploid cell, it is the one which will proliferate and give a good embryo. So having few aneuploid cells, as the embryo grows, probably the aneuploid cells will just disappear and the embryo will grow into a healthy baby. Let's talk about this. So oocyte meiosis is non -dis -dis it's not dysfunction, non-disjunction results in chromosome separation into sister chromatids and appears in the whole chromosome. That is an aneuploid embryo. Mitotic errors occur at post-zygotic cell division contributing to aneuploidy again. And mosaic embryos are 50% and they demonstrate increased cell proliferation and cell death as well. So whenever you have a lot of mosaic things, it will just have proliferation, it will just cell will die away and the normal cells will continue. The self-correction is due to increased cell death of aneuploidic cells. So mosaic embryos can self-correct with apoptosis of the abnormal cells. So we do transfer less than 40% mosaic to our patient because they can grow into a healthy baby. And this is a beautiful study. What they did is they did biopsies of cleavage stage embryo, but after the biopsy, these cleavage stage embryos were cultured further and they allowed the blastocyst to form and hatch. And they went again into the debris left there in the zona pellucida after the hatching of the blastocyst and they found that all the aneuploid shit was left there and a healthy blastocyst had hatched out so the mother nature is really great and we are trying to overcome it by thinking that we are naming an embryo an aneuploid and euploid and mosaic and deciding the future of that embryo the mother nature itself decides the future of that embryo what about non-invasive PGTA. Uh, they do have fall, zero false negative rates, so, but blastocysts. As the blastocysts grow, it will expel cell debris in the culture media, which may be discordant leading to false positive reports as well. And that can make non-invasive PGTA also not reliable. So we need large studies, maybe lakhs and lakhs of embryos have to go through all these tests and a concordance has to be established for us to confidently tell our patient, spend some more money and it guarantees you a better pregnancy. The studies are just on few thousand embryos and we probably are overacting on that and practicing and recommending our patients. So Huang reported that DNA leakage from a euploid embryo could be more than a mosaic. Otherwise, how will a non-invasive PGTA report a euploid embryo? So you see the difference? So depending upon how much is the presence of mosaic cell, they will determine what NIPGTA is telling you. This is, a, uh, this is the STAR study, which Dr. Mohan Kamath quoted in the morning, that this was about single embryo transfer of a euploid embryo versus morphologically selected embryo. And they wanted to know the results. And less than 35 years, there is no importance. But beyond 35 years, uh, they said that doing a euploid embryo transfer will have a better pregnancy rate. But the way the study is conducted, uh, Dr. Mohan in the morning said, it is not, it's, it's the whole thing is different. This is the, the, the inference is no difference in ongoing pregnancy rate in PGTA and non-PGTA group, but for the age of 35 to 40. The 
Rollo Orivito on his paper, I would again suggest, I'm a fan of Rollo Orivito, you can say. He writes beautiful, clinically, very relevant papers and inferences. And he dissected the STAR study. And he said, he went on to the historical aspects in the PGS1 is 1.0 is cleavage stage, PGS 2.0 is trophoectodon biopsy, and 3.0 is mosaic embryo detection by NGS, which we practice today. He reanalyzed the STAR study and said randomization was done after getting two blastocysts. So intention to treat randomization is not there. So there may be a lot of women who just entered the treatment, they selected, but they did not reach blastosis. Hence, they were not randomized at all. But that is still a denominator. You started the trial with them. How can you publish it? You started the trial with two blastocysts. Then you are doing it only for the good prognosis patients. Okay. So randomization was done after getting two blastocysts, which can be biopsied and vitrified. Women producing two blasts have a better prognosis than those producing one blastocyst or not producing none blastocyst. So total women were 984, 661 were randomized into group one and control group 330 and 331. Amongst the 323 of 984, which are excluded, 167 failed to obtain two blastocysts. From the intent to treat analysis, they should not have been excluded. Half of them should be added to the denominator in the study group and control group. So your denominator goes up by 83 patients on either side. Again, 42 women developed blast, but they were not euploid, hence they were excluded. Again, that adds to the denominator. So again, 21, 21 increase in the denominator on either side. And six in the study and four in the control group, the embryo did not survive thawing. No, that's not a mistake in the sense uh, that should have been a denominator, but they excluded that also from the denominator. So the whole STAR study has been constructed on a false denominator. They excluded, which is not favoring their inference. And let's add all these denominators. So the revised denominator calculation in a control group, it's 313 plus 83 plus 4, 400. Study group, it is 405. Now, now you calculate the recalculate the ongoing pregnancy rate is 33.8% in the study group, that is PGTA group, and 35.8% in morphologically selected blastocysts. So what is statistically what is being told to you and what the truth are two different things. And on this such background, we can't be telling our clients, spend money. I'm going to give you good. I'm going to make it good. You just look in your lab. See to it that you're getting good number of blastocysts. Your lab is functioning to a good competency level. Your vitrification thought cycles are being done perfect. And that will give you more pregnancies rather than shifting to PGTA in your practice. But again, I, I do agree with Anil's opinion. It's a value-based decision. You have to share all this decision and then talk to your patients and then the client, because it's a desire you're treating, they can take a call themselves. So when you analyze 35 to 40 year age group, again, PGTA group was 31.6 ongoing pregnancy rates and control group still had about 28% ongoing pregnancy rate. Going ahead, can oocyte diameter predict embryo quality and time-lapse morphology is making this new parameter available to us of whether it will form a blastocyst from the mean oocyte diameter. And about 105 to 118 micron diameter of the oocyte has the best prognosis, but only the people who have time lapse will be able to opine on this. I don't have a time lapse, so I really don't know much about this. But this is very important because your oocyte freezing, the social egg freezing group, the client is going to keep asking you, is my egg good? Is my egg good? But we are not, neither you're forming an embryo nor a blastocyst. The, on what ground are you going to tell her your egg is good? So this is a new parameter here in your oncofertility cases or social egg freezing cases, you can tell them, well, your oocyte diameter on my incubator is saying this and this. Well, I feel your egg is good. It's more potent and can give uh, more competence. What about the follicle size and the oocyte development as a function of final oocyte maturation? This is very relevant to us. So the best time to trigger is when the main herd of your follicular development is between 16 to 22 millimeters. If the main herd is less than 16 millimeter, wait a while and trigger later. So when the follicles were beyond 16 millimeter, 76.3% of them got eggs. 13 to 16, 70%, less than 13 millimeters, still they got 55% milli, eggs were obtained. So take it all, unless you're going for a dual stimulation, then you can leave a few less than 12 millimeters. Otherwise, take it all, aspirate all. Compared to HCG, agonist and dual trigger, oocyte recovery, and the top quality embryos were almost the same. This is another question. Do follicles of obese patient yield competent oocytes and embryos? 
and they evaluated the competency of oocyte and embryos and obtained from beyond 15 millimeter follicles in obese women. And in if obese women normally recruit follicles beyond 15 millimeters and healthy oocyte and top quality embryos are the same. So if you go to Richard Legros studies published on weight control in polycystic ovaries, and they said the weight control group took a longer time to reach pregnancy. So using gonadotrophins in your IUI cycle, so using a good amount of stimulation and doing IVF in obese will override the ill effects of obesity on the oocyte and you will still get your pregnancies and your quality embryos will be still good there. What do you mean by normal oocyte morphology? You have three pickups today, you have aspirated 40 eggs and the embryologist makes a small face and tells you, dark dikta hai. You know, or aisa dikta hai, aisa dikta hai. To hell with them. Okay? Let's understand what oocyte morphology is telling us. So a normal oocyte, what is a normal oocyte morphology? It should have a normal homogeneous cytoplasm. No inclusion of refractory body should be there. There should be a small perivital in space, non-fragmented polar body and colorless zona pellucida. <coughs> then what is oocyte dysmorphism? Oocyte dysmorphism could be of two types. Intracytoplasmic, there'll be granules, vacuoles and inclusions. <coughs> there could be extracytoplasmic, the anomalies of the oocyte shape, zona, there could be a larger perivital in space or larger polar bodies. Irregular zona is a phenotype defect due to varied secretion of glycoprotein matrix. So it's not something very bad. Increased perivital in space with granules is a sign of overmature oocytes. So you have in the herd, you have some follicles which are 20, 22 millimeters. They could have something like this. Uh, and the oocyte gets shrunk compared to the zona, but there is no specific prognosis. So, you know, people keep asking about what will happen to my 22 millimeter follicle. Nothing. You will still get a mature oocyte. You will still get a blastocyst out of it. You need not worry about it. Large polar body is significant because that is that is polar body is nothing but a nucleus without cytoplasm. It is the same oocyte otherwise. So a large polar body is significant. That suggests definitely a genetic abnormality or multinucleated blast would be there. So this is your large polar body and this is your granular increased granularity in the perivital in space, what you see. Slight heterogeneous cytoplasm, thoda dark dikna bikna is a normal variation, don't worry about it. Small vacuoles, transparent are normal. Large more than 14 microns or granular vacuoles represent female genetic issues. They could be a high miscarriage rate, but still your embryo formation rates would be good in this particular group. Problem is this, the presence of a smooth endoplasmic reticulum in the oocyte, which is seen in the SER picture there, what you see in the corner, in the center, uh, that is the one which has the worst prognosis and that has reduced fertilization rate, clinical pregnancy rate and early fetal demise. And the granules are seen like this and vacuoles are seen like this. You commonly will see vacuoles, but don't worry about it. Just inject them and they will still give you good embryos and good prognosis. Dark cytoplasm, granular cytoplasm are normal. Dark zonopenusula may have lower fertilization. Now, that is what the information from oocyte morphology, from the prognostic point, we as a clinician, we should get. And we should not take opinions of our embryologists on a solid knowledge. You should form your own opinion. This is another question we need to an answer in our practice is, uh, in patients of recurrent pregnancy loss, should we offer in vitro fertilization? So, Whatever studies have been done, they say that the live birth rate spontaneous or spontaneous pregnancies, IO, IVF, was the same in RPL patients. And time to conception is faster in spontaneous conception than in IVF conception. Just because the couple is frustrated of facing more and more pregnancies and looking towards, as a hope, towards an IVF pregnancy, believe me, it's a wrong way to go. Just waiting on them will be a better, spontaneous pregnancy will be better and a healthy pregnancy will be better. So PGTA in RPL, the time to pregnancy is high in the PGTA group as the evidence goes. So don't be overzealous in advising IUVF and IUIs and many treatments. You will take RPL patients for a treatment only when she is a secondary infertility. That means after two years of the last abortion. And then, well, it may make a difference. This cannot, so IRT without secondary infertility cannot be supported in our RPL patient. That is what the evidence stands today. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is our last presentation. Any questions, queries, you're most welcome.
any suggestions to improvise our course are very, very welcome from all of you. You can email it to us or just put it on our YouTube channel, wherever, and your comments will go a long way to benefit everybody. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you very much. Have a safe journey home. Have a cup of tea with us now and then have a safe journey home. A lot of many happy pregnancies to all of you. In the sense to your patients. We only want to entertain any suggestions of arranging big banquets and gala dinners and fashion shows.